Elite League, and I am so excited to figure out who is going to be advancing to the Grand Finals. We only have two series for you guys today. We'll talk about them in a little bit, but first I want to introduce my panel. You've seen them for the last two days here at the playoffs of Elite League, but it's going to be Danok and Winter joining me here. Danok, you know, I like to, to flip-flop. So, Danok, how are you today for our final day of Elite League? I'm good. We're warmed up. Our voices are ready. We did a little bit of word games in the preparation <laughs> for this, so brains are also kind of active as well. Shout out to Dota Doll. You know, if anyone wants mm -hmm. a brain warm up before you're about to go into a game of Dota, that one's a good one. Uh, Winter, you didn't really join us though, but I'm sure you would have been able to guess all of them on the first shot. What? I did. I, I joined like for 30% of the, the game. <laughs> 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 it's pretty much the same, you know, but hopefully our teams are ready for 100% participation because they're going to need to bring everything that they possibly can to be able to make it to the finals and potentially walk away as the winner of Elite League. Uh, it has been a long tournament and it has been filled with some fantastic Dota. There's been three different stages of this tournament. We started off with 16 teams down there in Swiss stage a number of weeks ago. The top eight from there advanced onto group stage where they were met with eight other teams that were directly invited split into two groups and then we had the top two from each group going into the upper bracket and then the third and fourth of the two groups going down into the lower bracket which is where we came in this is where we started off our playoffs journey and it has taken us three days well two days uh, this being our third day now uh, to see our playoffs bracket shape up all the way on day number one with gaming gladiators and knocking out g2 ig psg quest knocking out tundra and then our upper bracket matches were played where team falcons and azure moved on and then day number two we saw three teams go home that was liquid knocking out gaming gladiators extreme advancing over psg quest and then Yet it, later in the day, they advanced over Team Liquid and Falcons. They're just making that nice, clean upper bracket run for themselves, Dano. They have. I mean, they've only dropped four games across the, I want to say, 18 games that they've played so far. And, and wow. that's only against three teams. OG 2 owed them. They're not here. Uh, they were still knocked <laughs> out in the uh, the round robin stage. But the other two were to two other teams that also got knocked out in Spirit and Heroic. So they are just mm -hmm. on an absolute tear against everyone. It just doesn't even seem close, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to see how uh, teams form against each other and then they come up against Falcons and you're like, oh, okay, maybe it was an off day for them. That's what we're kind of hoping, you know. We love to see competitive games winter. And, uh, what do you think was the most competitive series that we had in the playoffs bracket so far? Huh, probably the Liquid Extreme Gaming one, I think so far. That's the yeah. Day. Did you the... did you watch it back? Because I did not stay up to watch all of it. Okay, I, I can't lie about that one. No, I watched some highlights. Uh, I really like uh, that uh, extreme gaming. They are really adamant about their clings carry. <laughs> That's my favorite just part of China in general, right? It, China yeah. just loves the clings carry or flex to the phosphor. Uh, well, let's have a look at our schedule today because we talked about everything that's happened so far to lead up to our final day to bring us to our top three teams. It is uh, Extreme Gaming, Azure, and Falcons. They're our top three. And so we're going to be seeing Extreme Gaming up against Azure to see who will be going to the finals there. It's going to be a, a tough battle between them and kind of sad, Danog, to be knocking out another team from your region. Sure, but it also... It guarantees that East v West rivalry for the grand final, right? Which is what a lot of people have been doing. I mean, up until, what was it, TI8, I think? It had just gone back and forth, back and forth consistently. And it was OG that kind of broke the spell. And ever since then, it, it kind of has been China a little bit more on the back foot. <laughs> Look at these retired things coming over here from their last teams, right? Like, that's just how long they were out the scene. But, uh, you know, clearly coming back with a vengeance were Bark, aka Faith Beyond, and Ori. They've been doing a fantastic job. I've been most impressed by XXS and DY, just their, not resurgence into the scene, but just really showing and stamping their foot down and saying, hey, we are two of the best players in the world. Yeah, I also like this graphic because, you know, we kind of talk about potential curses that exist in Dota, but I feel like this is the inverse. It's the, the Azuri blessing. Just everyone that had been on that team previously, everyone currently on this team, making it to the top three. Mm -hmm. uh, I like it. I like seeing that even when players split apart winter, they're still able to find success on uh, their respective new teams. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it just takes that uh, 
that magical spark, you know, with a new team, new environment. Even though they had like a success with their previous teammates, but it's really easy to recreate the a similar environment because when you've already been in a successful team, you know what are the important things to do to make the team successful. So you just have to carry it on to the next team, and as long as your teammates are more than willing to accept uh, some of your ideas, I think it's easy to create another top team again. Would you say that that is one of the strengths that Extreme Gaming has for themselves and why they've been able to make it so far and, and still be such a dominant team despite finding themselves in the, the lower bracket finals? Mm, I think they are really flexible in terms of like comparing to the China team tradition. The China team tradition is like they just like to do their own thing. They don't care what's the matter. They like their team fight. They overdraft for team fight. They don't care about the lanes and Right now, you see the teams like evolving. Extreme Gaming, they when they lost to Falcons, they kind of got destroyed as well on the lanes. And hopefully, they have already learned their lesson. And it's, AR is also another Chinese team that has uh, trouble, you know, when playing against Falcons in the lanes. And everybody needs mm -hmm. to be able to find the small little things to improve in the lanes to be able to challenge Falcon right now. Yeah, it's tough. It feels like they're in a little bit of a league of their own. But, you know, these players, these teams, Dano, they'd have to be familiar with each other between Azure and Extreme Gaming. Does it uh, create a, its own meta? Is there going to be heroes that we haven't really seen the limelight beyond come out and, and be mm. in the spotlight for the series? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it even has to do with, like, the fact that these guys obviously know each other really well, right? I think mm -hmm. it's just that they do have their own, like, a little bit unique playstyles. Remember when we were going over the Dark Willow pick for Team Liquid, it was basically only Jin Q other than them that had played it in sure. multiple games. And uh, it's a similar sort of thing with XM and his hero pool. Like, uh, the big reason why he was kind of out of the scene for a while, or at least not at the very top of the China scene, is that... He's a really good player, not so much at these spirit heroes though, right? But we're not really seeing too many spirit heroes really be hotly contested and those mm -hmm. top tier mid heroes. Whereas, you know, you think the Zeus, the Sniper, he picked uh, Viper, even made Bloodseeker work against Team Liquid in that uh, that match to be able to get them here. Like these are the sorts of things, just that little bit of an unorthodox style that might just give them that little bit of an edge. Can I say like, you talk about the Dark Willow, but I feel like we kind of need to bring some numbers around it for people to actually fully understand. So. Dark Willow had only been picked 11 times and Jinq had been six of them. So like when we say it really isn't having the limelight show on it, this is just an example of this hero, but over half of them are from one player and and, and it... look, I don't remember the win rate of it, but I'm sure he has confidence in it no matter what. It, it does uh, excite me for what could potentially come out between these two teams. But is there something that Azure has strength over XG Winter? Uh, both teams clearly understand each other really well, but I feel like whoever is willing to play fast is going to have an advantage. Because Chinese teams, they always generally like to take things slow, you know, they're with their team fight. That's why they like uh, Dark Willow on position four. And you know, compared to some of the other teams like uh, Falcon, for example, they like to maybe sometimes have like a Earth Spirit on four, which is much, way more aggressive than like uh, something you can do with a Dark Willow. So I think uh, because both teams really understand each other. And maybe somebody will try to take a risk, right? I think in the first game itself, it's always the best time to try and take take a risk because both teams mm -hmm. plays very slow, very methodical Dota. And in the first game, you can try something new and to try and surprise your opponents to you know get a cheap win. You know, I think that's at least for me, that's my plan. You know, going into a best of three like this uh, when both teams really understand each other. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that. Sorry, Dano, did you want to add on? Oh, I just want to say I I, I feel like Extreme Gaming probably have that very recent confidence boost because they did come up against Liquid, right? One of these teams that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily rely on quite as much teamfight. They're much more of that early in-your-face style. And they beat them in 33 minutes in the first game of their best of three. Then they lost in 28. And then they played a little bit more general extreme gaming China Dota style, more centered around that teamfight in game number three. So they've got the potential for it. But then again, yeah. you've got Azure who, you know, one of their most recent series is against Falcons, right? Where they just got absolutely crushed and uh you know it, it wasn't really you know convincing too many of their results right but at yeah. least it gives them that recent viewpoint to be able to take i do like what you said about it potentially being xg that uh goes for the faster 
line up for themselves or, or try and draft that way because you know you're speaking of, of that upper bracket when they had to go up against Falcons um, in their second game despite losing it they were still pushing high ground at 16 and a half minutes like I want to keep coming back to this because that's a phenomenal feat in sort of any game especially at a pro level sure they weren't able to close it out but I think you take away a lot from being able to push that early and then again also not being able to close it out so we'll see what they're going to be able to draft for themselves get their hands on and if it is going to be a lot of just these stereotypical bands of the the chen the disruptor and the io i think the io and the zeus are where i'm putting my eyes towards a little bit more in, in this lineup or in this drafting phase winter yeah i mean the draft is one thing you know but the other thing is like the mental side of things like who has the more the more belief in the team, the more confidence. Because when, whenever you're playing all these inter-regional matches, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, the mindset is super, super important. Like you need to be able to believe that you, even though you have uh, a bad record against that team, or that you know they they know a lot of your secrets, you need to have a lot of uh, belief in the team when you're making moves in the game. You you have to be able to make it quickly, uh, be confident with it. Like you mentioned, the high ground push, like 16, 17 minute high ground push. It's not easy to make calls like this in a game, and you you really have to believe in everyone on the team and when somebody says something like this you just have to go yeah. hmm. just in terms of their recent results against each other as well the last time these guys played against each other was back in february i think um both at beth boom as well as games of the future and it's like a three to two um record i think slightly in favor of extreme gaming there so it's uh you know they've got that slight edge they've also got that slightly more recent gameplay that they're going to be able to to go off in in terms of a, a victorious sense but i really do feel like this is just going to come down to team fight v team fight yes one team might try and push the tempo a little bit further but at least in terms of what gives these two teams comfort it's both of them are right around that 42 to 44 minute mark for the average time of their game so they're very similar across the board that is a uh, quite a lengthy game time <laughs> i want to say you know that that means there's been a lot of games that have gone quite over that one as well um io and zeus is what i said i was wow. keeping my eyes on and they decided that they're actually just going to straight up exchange what feels like these unbeatable picks between sniper and zeus here and you, you come out with the winter there with the wow there winter yeah i both teams just like <laughs> Not really caring about uh, anything. Just want to get the the most efficient Five heroes. But I I do feel like Zeus has the upper hand, even though it's like the the second one. The second one chose. But I I, I feel like in the game where was it uh who was it that did the global strat against the the sniper? I can't remember which game where the Zeus was able to actually uh, do better than the sniper in the game because you can always find the sniper with your your ulti. And in that game, the Zeus actually went uh, a magic build instead of like a uh, the the right click build. So he went. Like Octarine, I think, with uh, the Nimbus, so you can always find the Sniper. That just sounds so frustratingly annoying, and I hope we get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, that's the, be that's the beauty of uh, Dota, right? Like, uh, one, this one here right now, you, everybody goes like the, the physical right-click build, but there's always going to be that one particular game that the magic build is going to be good, and you have to figure out which game it is. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think like a team would go like legit a full global strat, like pick up an IO Marcy for the off lane, then go Nature's Prophet five Spectre one or something like that, and just yes. make this sniper's life a complete living hell? I mean, Spectre is always a counter to sniper, you know, so I wouldn't be uh, totally opposed to that. But the hero, you need to figure out how to get kills on the hero because he's gonna have a, a shitty laning phase. He's gonna get bullied, and the only way back for him into the game is uh, his kills, right? So you have to give him that. And you have to have the right lane set up for for the hero. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little tired of this ho ho ha ha hero. You know, I just <laughs> want to see him. Why uh, are you tired? Why? It's only been what two weeks? Yeah, but he's so oppressive. You know, it's so annoying. I mean, it feels like the sort of hero that FY would honestly be fine to just play in the four role as well, right? Like if they really feel like it's been hard counted, they just say, okay, it's not mid, GG. Yeah, okay, that, that, that brings up a really good question, right? And I'm not saying specifically for this sniper, but do you not feel that the definition of an imbalanced hero should be that it could go on any position, like anyone can play it, and it feels like it's always going to win, or it feels like it always has massive impact? I feel like that should be the definition of imbalanced. Sure. I mean, that's where Death Prophet was in China for quite some time. You know, they would play it 2, 3, 4, 5, and it would work in pretty much every role. That's why Dragon Knight is so highly contested these days. Pangalia, we've seen people make it work across 2, 3, 
back in the day it was a support too so yeah i, I think that's a, a big thing also just like there never being a bad game for the hero like here we go batrider i feel like there is almost never a bad batrider game so why not just pick it right it just provides you so much it, it gives you that extra little pick off that you need it gives you some late game in terms of bkb piercing disable you can influence lanes there's it's it's so good it's so many different things yeah, Bat Rider and Disruptor at the moment, I think those are probably the two best, uh, and Shadow Demon, three best supports and in the Chen. game uh, at the moment. Yeah, Chen. I always forget Chen because he feels like uh, he's just that jungling hero that is not mm. present in the game. And then he comes out of the jungle, okay guys, I have mech, I have Time mats, to win the I game. Have, I have drums, <laughs> just follow I'm me. I'm ready! <laughs> and the, the enemy just sees the Chen come out like a, like a core hero with his items and ends the game. Do like this support duo between the bat rider and the lion right like they ah. kind of do different things pick off into finger of death you can guarantee kills with just a couple of heroes it also means that you're like if you are able to find the zeus he's actually gonna die as opposed to you know just leaping away and you know jumping up and hitting a coin block or something like that with a taunt maybe lion i guess this game i feel like lion is gonna have a, a hard time sure if lion is position five then it's gonna be really hard because you're getting uh, a blowdown from far range by the Elder Titan Spirit and it's a Zeus spell. So I feel like you're gonna have a hard time for Zeus. For Bat Rider as well, I think in general, uh, playing all oh, this dagger hero against Zeus is always going to uh, have uh, your challenges. But Bat Rider, like you already said, you know, he's a very stable support hero right now. He does provide you with a very good laning phase and usually he gets his uh, dagger on a very, very nice timing. And you can kind of set up for kills very easily in the early stage, even without a dagger. That's why this hero has so much value in the game at the moment he's just so stable so i'm just going to touch on a point that you've made a few times winter about this this trio that you need to have on the like mid-ish part of the game right a couple of supports and one core whether it be the uh, the mid lane or the off lane so with it being a sniper obviously one of those heroes that kind of just plants his flag and farms he's not going to be the one making a lot of these rotations do you think that it's going to need uh, like a position three that's going to build the blink dagger just to provide that extra layer of initiation or do you think you can sit back and wait for the bat rider to get into it itself i think they should actually have a position three that's uh gonna buy all the team items like the pipe Mm. Uh, the Mac, the Crimson God, whatever you know, whatever is good that game, and you let your Bat and Lion just be the uh, initiators with the probably both of them. Maybe you're gonna have to get daggers on those two heroes. Mm -hmm. I think that would actually be re ideal for you. Like when you were talking about uh, like roaming mid heroes plus the two supports, but the difference with uh, those uh, type of heroes when you compare to them with the Sniper and the Zeus is those two heroes, even though they don't have direct way of initiating for your supports, but because they do so much from long range, right? you can always use Shrapnel to control an area and it makes it very difficult for the opposing mid hero to just come in and and con uh, contest the run. And yesterday also, I also brought up a point about those two, this sniper and Zeus, they are really good at chipping down the enemy mid hero, right? Mm. So whenever you control the, even the water runes, if you are able to deny them water runes, and usually they will have very little resource to contest for the actual power runes because they are always like half health, sixty percent health, and they don't feel like they can actually contest those runes. You know, I think that's the biggest advantage of having the sniper or the Zeus at the moment in your mid lane. But that was a sniper against an earth spirit, right? It's a very different story if you're against a Zeus, where you're actually yeah, able correct. to somewhat keep your range and you know, put the harass back the other way, as well as, you know, just having a couple of these other uh, supports that they're playing with on Extreme Gaming, right? Like an Elder Titan with the Stomp, Sniper really doesn't have too much in the terms of mobility, at, le at least until he gets the Concussive Grenade, and then of course you've got Slows and Stuns coming through from Grimstroke as well, so, you know, both, both mid laners are kind of in a little bit of danger if they don't really keep their range, right? This Grimstroke, I... Can't believe it actually slipped my mind considering how impactful it was the other day. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was XG that we were watching who picked it up for themselves. And I think I remember Gareth telling us that it did the second most second. damage yep. in the game. After he got his eyes, he could do the, the dark portrait. So mm -hmm. if they are going to make it all the way to this late game, which it feels like, you know, that that's what they're very... Um, comfortable with, then Casual this Grimstroke race. is going to be a Come massive down. issue. That ultimate and silence is already tough enough, and then the Dark Portrait now, it's like everyone's in for, for a rough one winter, not just the mid laner and the, and the supports anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that game it was a little bit different because he was up against a Morphling. Morphling is one of those heroes True. that because he has a lot of stats, right? So your Dark Portrait Ten always seconds. feels Remaining. super good against uh, that particular hero. And uh, this game, I, I feel like because they have a Grim plus Elder Titan support duo, 
the support duo are very very passive they don't really have a, a, a any easy means of like initiating uh, if you compare it to the bat and lion which they can kind of you know start the fight with impale or your lasso when you have dagger it's a lot easier for them to do that you're solely relying on slada right now if you're extreme gaming and mm -hmm. maybe whatever last pick uh, you're gonna get you know which i assume usually the carry hero is not gonna be like a, an initiating hero maybe a monkey king you know i think maybe yeah if you go monkey king maybe you can do that uh, but I mean, apart from Monkey King, there's also maybe a Sven. So those are the only few heroes that can kind of initiate for a team. And I feel like that's what's lacking right now in that draft. And whereas for AR, it's uh, like I said, they just need like a, a frontline hero, ideally, that builds an aura item so everybody can stay alive. Because if the Slada blinks in and he doesn't immediately kill the hero with the, the ink, so I think the sniper and the troll are going to reign supreme later. Mm. And you've also got to consider like the Thunder God's Wrath might change things also just the Elder Titan spirit as well on top of things with that natural order might help a little bit one other thing that extreme gaming just don't have in addition to that front line that you were saying is they don't really have tower push at all you know like nothing is going mm -hmm. to really open up the map for them right now so they're kind of behind the eight ball here with their last overall pick they do have the luxury of having that last pick overall and i mean this is oh. the perfect sort of aura here that you want to want to have right yeah. you've already got atrophy aura you've got pit of malice to slow things down a little bit you've got a counter to somewhat global potential with the uh, the fiend's gate and yeah you can just build into all those tanky items i mean one more thing to add for the troll like it's a really good uh, hero against the slada and the Grim Show because you can buy X and dispel the Ink Swell buff. And you can dispel Ooh. and you can remove the corrosive haze. So life stealer, okay. life stealer is a very good lane matchup into the Underlord, I guess. But <laughs> well, ever ever since the um, Berserker's Rage right goes through the um, BKB or the Rage, it just feels like uh -huh. it's. It's so yeah. much worse. That's I feel like you're going to need to rush an Ag's timing like straight after the Radiance here on the Life Stealer. I so mean, I feel like uh, lock in. the reason they picked the Life Stealer here is I think solely for the lane matchup. I think they just want to be able to do well in the lanes, try to play around your Ink Swell, which is going to get countered by Agonim when the troll gets Agonim. So you have to be really quick on that timing. Your Shard on Grimshock with the Dagger on Star, those are going to be really, really key. And with the Armlet, I think those are the early game timings you have to really abuse. Because if you don't abuse those timings, once AR gets their items on Troll, and then the Underlord gets the, the Pipe, whatever, the Grease or Lotus, the, the, the Aura items, you won't be able to kill any hero on, on AR. And you're going to have a lot of problems. You know, If you can't kill the Sniper, that's it, you know? Mm. I have the weirdest thing to say. What's the interaction between Grim ulting and if you get Args on Lifestealer and infest an enemy, do you infest both? Oh, uh, no, 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 you don't. I, I tried It's it. just one still? You've tried it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just thought about that. I've never actually thought about that interaction. So I'm glad you already know the answer to that one, Winter. But, Danog, do you have the answer to who's going to win game one? Uh, I, I'm kind of in agreement with Winter. <laughs> I feel like this uh, this Azure lineup does have that better potential. It feels a little easier to play as well. Although, having said that, I feel like if they are able to stall it out enough that you can get Zeus into that late-ish game, have that percent damage coming through, and have a lifesteal that might have the Radiance plus the Ags, maybe things can turn around for them. All uh, right, well, you guys have been pretty good so far in playoffs with guessing who has the better lineup, who's going to come out on top. We'll see if that continues, and we'll see who takes game number one here. It's Extreme Gaming up against Azure with Gareth and Lacoste. Thank you, Nat. Yeah, let's get into game one here as we have China versus China in the lower bracket final. A best of three separating one of these teams against that best of five with Falcons waiting for them right at the end. And Lacoste, starting this draft out, we had Sniper and Zeus first picked. What a world we live in. <laughs> Yeah, a weird one. Like, you can see the meta developing throughout the tournament. Uh, this is something that Extreme Gaming have been doing even in the Dream League. They started the first pick Sniper in some of their drafts. But this time around, Azure Ray will take it. And the late smoke coming out from them. Also, what patch is this? Is this 6.03 with Sniper <laughs> Troll? Insane. The only hero who's missing is Juggernaut. The rubber and band Axe. patch. Axe, was it 6.83 yeah. or something? Yeah, Jug, Sniper, Axe, and uh, and Troll. The spin to win patch with the rubber band comeback mechanics. Mask we of were, Madness. We were talking... On all oh, three of yeah. them. <laughs> and back then, you could also disassemble Trankles and Arcanes, and we had Jungle Axe swapping between Trankles and Arcanes to have permanent mana and HP with the active from Trankles. But enough uh -oh. reminiscing. Enough Shinkyu of the old days. Stuck. We've got a potential first blood attempt here onto Shinkyu. Ori... The sniper body blocking the frontline snipers coming with a shotgun. I'm gonna take this Grimstroke down. 
First blood for your mid laner. Great start for Azure Ray already. Yeah, Muerta getting the first blood there. Uh, this set it definitely looks like Muerta. What the <laughs> hell is that? There's You're right. Little, yeah. The little sniperino a combination between Muerta and some like Storm Spirit. But uh, yeah, I don't think I've seen this one before. Yeah, what is it? The, the Day of the Dead festival, right? In uh, in Mexico, with the little hat, got the, the skeletal face paint and stuff like that. Very very haunted and spooky on the sniper and going up against XM on the Zeus in that mid lane. Side lanes, though, probably going to be a little more interesting as that's going to be a snooze fest of farming. Down the bottom, FY being bullied a little bit by DY's Elder Titan. Double melee here into an Underlord and a Lion can be a little tricky, especially once Bach gets his levels up. And Underlord as a general uh, a hero in general, um, not seen much play, but I was looking at the stats and currently you know, Falcon's 3-0 uh, and on it. It's great, right? Yeah, he's four and five throughout the Elite League. The hero feels really good to play. I think the underrated value ever since this hero has been like changed. This hero has been changed like bazillion times. Pit of Malice, it deals damage, so you can't really blink out anymore. It's like mm. just a little bit of instance of damage, so canceling your blink dagger. So that's gotta be nice. Having this global presence, this is something that has been toyed with a lot ever since the introduction of the Twin Gates. These xp runes so you can easily try to contest them starting from like minute seven sometimes you're gonna be level six sometimes most of the time you won't but uh, 14 having this global presence jin q again in trouble they're gonna get on top of him with a troll and the bat rider the it looks like tian ming evil. gonna take him down Thanks, success left here about half hp but that's the situation you find yourself in quite often into a troll warlord lane Right, low. The team have picked this hero to win the lane. That's pretty, pretty much, much one of the greatest reasons to take it. Yeah, great against Slaughter in the lane. Slaughter doesn't get too much out of it, but seeing XXS, how he's CSing, maybe that like one death from Grimstroke changed things a little bit where he's getting some extra CS, but uh, yeah, definitely not the easiest lane for Slaughter. I think they are going to be playing much more aggressive once Zeus gets level 6, so this is the timing where you're going to be getting the kills. In the bottom lane, you have Lion, so if you want to go for any kind of aggression, you can immediately see he's going to get stomped. FY also getting Hex, like he feels like he needs that extra lockdown in this lane. Yeah, maybe try and keep them in the Firestorm, just stop this ET from running him constantly. Also, I don't can see really... F I don't feel this Life Stealer pick. I, I feel... Yeah? Against Sniper, against Troll, matchup changes with the Aghanim Scepter on Life Stealer, but also you need to get on top of, you know, Sniper. Uh, you're playing into Lion, you're playing into Batrider, like BKB piercing ability. So not going to be an easy game for Life Stealer by any means. Uh, sure, you have a vehicle, you have a dispel of your own. Uh, panel talked about Aghanim Scepter build on Troll. I want to see what Lowe's going to go for because... Corrosive Haze, that's really nice. You can dispel Inkswell, you can dispel mm. Astral Spirit. So a lot of the things, uh, this has been like very popular a month ago. Like maybe two months ago, we've been leaning more towards the Mjolnir build into a BKB on Troll. I've seen Skitter also play it that way. It really depends on the game because it's slightly faster than if you go for Battle Fury, then you pick up SNY, then you get the Aghanim Scepter. Most of the time you'll need a BKB maybe as a third item, then Aghanim's as a fourth item. So it gets in pretty late. Yeah, yeah it definitely gets super delayed. And thinking about this as well, I know, I know SVG in one of the games last night was talking about it where Lifestealer feels a little better nowadays in terms of carry to carry matchups because you've got this agonims the infest little tools to play around with and you're much more of a an anti-carry you know thinking about old razor being a counter carry rather than a straight up position one hard carry against a troll you know two three years ago i would say troll single-handedly wins this life steal versus troll 1v1 matchup any day of the week as well watch dy get himself back behind tier one safely but uh, what's the matchup like nowadays life steal versus troll if you put them in a in an arena cage match fully slotted well, who with Aghanim Scepter or not? Because <laughs> yeah, this yeah, changes we, we everything. Yeah, exactly, right? A Life Stealer is just super annoying with the Ags. Like, uh, especially during his ulti, you're waiting, he pops it, and then he's like, Bleh! like, what is he doing? <laughs> doing absolutely nothing. Standing still, maybe going for some creeps or whatever. But uh, yeah, this changes the matchups completely. But then again, you need to deal with Sniper. This is a uh, type of a lineup we've seen, you know, ET 
paired up with a lot of magic damage this time around. They have both magic damage from Zeus and they also have minus armor from Slaughter. So it's going to hurt. Lifestealer heavily focused on the physical damage, of course. So mm. if they can execute, we've seen some nicely executed drafts, uh, especially the one from Team Liquid yesterday against the Gaming Gladiators, uh, bringing some like new tech into the game. A lot of heals playing around that Monkey King. So let's see if Extreme Gaming can pull something off like that with this ET, with the Dispel, with like these blink initiators, the bomb coming out from Lifestealer and Slugger once he picks up the blink dagger. Yeah, they can for sure bring some surprises to those team fights. I guess a, a surprise smoke gang just blow people up with all of the minus armor and minus magic resist they've got. And Bach just holding back that Lifestealer and the ET down at bottom. As it looks like around the six minute mark, we will have the swarming of the mid. Double damage top. Chan Ming. Not going to get there in time. XM jumps over. Oh, he denied the rune, actually. Didn't see the projectile on my screen. Looked like the Zeus got it. They take the bat down. But Ori's sniper, long range hits with a shrapnel. He's got treads. Oh, Tian Ming. Just brown boots. Ori's coming for you. The Zeus, he gets Whoa, away from here. the second shrapnel. But the <laughs> troll is here. Bark in the bottom Bark lane. in the meantime. Radiant and they left him alone. Is under attack. Yeah, that was a premature tip coming on from Tian Ming on XM. I guess he knew that he's going to die because Lo made a rotation as well. I didn't see Lo coming to try to kill XM. But uh, yeah, so far, you know, considering everything, action-packed game, 3-2. Zeus is still level 5, so as soon as he gets that level 6, you can expect them to play slightly more aggressive in the side lanes. XM. Teleporting in, trying to clear this big stack, but not going to do it. Dyer, I have to deal with the wave first, it looks like. Man, just looking at the CS board, though. Sniper, he's always up there. You know, 43, 19, nasty values on Ori in that mid lane. Uh, XXS at top, Inkswell into Crush. I don't know if they can follow through on this. Yeah, Tenming arrives with a blood grenade and a flame break. XXS, he's the one being turned on a little bit there and forced away. But yeah, Zeus a little bit behind here, you know, losing out in the lane and then dropping up in that top rune spot as well. Missing out on the bottle refill. A lot of pain here for XM. It's got to be said though, Arme up there as well with 19 denies in his bottom lane into an Underlord and Lion. I thought he would be under a little more pressure. Uh, they, they can't really put pressure. You're playing the sluggiest, like the most sluggish hero in the game. Uh, I don't know, something about this, his model, I don't... A feel underload like the way he moves it's just very unfun for me <laughs> why though i don't know it's like well, it's also his skill his set it's, <laughs> it's also his skill set like what what, what is hype ability it's like wow he used pit of malice into fire so i think his ulti is kind of hype where you can teleport it's like Ooh, it's especially if you're against the uh, it was a Mar playing Underlord right against the Monkey King, putting the twin yeah. gates on the trees to drop them down. That's the hypest part about it. What's your hype item? Build? What's your fun item build? Road of Atos. That's it. Like, wow, you you rooted no. it again. Hoo -hoo. The hype <laughs> build is like Radiance Bloodstone. You know, Bloodstone the, is the one. That's what I wanted spell. to mention. Yeah. Once you get to the later stages of the game with Underlord, Pit of Malice, if you can farm it, it gets pretty mad. This is basically the whole screen. So it's be aware so of that if it comes down to the late game. Hit shard is oh, also yeah. slightly better, so you can use it because they're one of the recent changes to it. Oh, oh. FY will drop Zeus ulti. So hit shard, you could use it on yourself, so it did follow you before compared to the previous time where you could just use it on the ground. Now you can use it on allies, so at least that's something. It's like Bedlam, right? Just a little, little yeah. quality of life improvement there. And put it on the hero that's actually going to jump in. Because Underlord, not the blink initiator that we, that we usually see from the offlane. Maybe that's the yeah, fun kill that we haven't tried yet. Blink in oh, into yeah. Pit of Malice. Hell yeah! <laughs> and then Fiends Gate away. <laughs> 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 it's like buying Blink on Queen of Pain or anti Maid. You blink in, you blink out. A little surprise factor. Dead even in kills and net worth so far. Looks like Extreme Gaming trying to really defend this bottom tier one in their bottom jungle. Tons of dire sentries and vision getting cleared out by XM and DY. Starting to stack as well. Quite a bit of focusing on the stacks. As the 10 minute rune is going to be grabbed up by Ori in that mid lane. And that leaves, of course, 
Low on the troll in a 1v1 versus Slada. Down at the bottom of the net worth of the cause for XXS, as is expected. He's kind of been shoved out here on an island, just trying to gather what he can. Drag creep waves around. Just in general, it feels like extreme gaming... Like the numbers don't say it, but it feels like they're a bit behind in this laning phase. I don't know if that's just because we've got troll and sniper in the lanes that look nasty and mean. Yeah, it does feel like that. But, I mean, again, you are playing against sniper, you are playing against troll on the same team. And now, DY going to defend the tower, at least try to do so. Sniper with the shield rune for another good 20 seconds. But this catapult wave. Yeah, just making short work of the tier one tower. Looks like they're a little worried about fully committing with that spirit and stomp there. We'll dodge away from it and then go in for the finishing blow. Off lane tower down. It feels quite rare still that we see this kind of move. What's what's the reasoning here? They wanted to get that tower. Is it just because it was available for them? That's the easy way to get. Yeah, they dealt a bit some of gold? damage to it before, and they didn't want to like rotate the troll to the mid lane so sniper we've seen a lot of active snipers so he picks up the rune comes to the top lane with the range they can take it down xm is jungling right now doesn't have mana so definitely needs to go back i think he needs to be the guy who's making some moves playing with et grimstroke they're not as active early on you can see jinq again going for this farm oriented build putting more points in stroke of fate playing that four We've seen him yesterday being very successful when he was playing it against Morphling. Dealing the most damage pretty much in the team as Grim. Yeah, super, super greedy. And it was just the same thing, right? Max Stroke of Fate, Arcane, Zethal Ends, Aghanim Scepter. Max M flies back and forth over the Batrider with a flame break and a heavenly jump. Chen Ming not able to get there with the lasso. As they did gather a few forces in that mid lane. It would have been four versus three with Extreme Gaming having the numbers if that fight had broken out properly. With Flame Break into Heavenly Jump. Push back, jump over. Actually jumps down to... I think he wanted to try and jump back up. But because he was being pushed and jumping at the same time, he couldn't quite get over the hill. The old man, not limber <laughs> enough to climb up the, the ramps and the cliffs anymore. But here comes the move you wanted, right? XM is starting to get across nice the map with a smoke out here. You think he's going to go over the bridge, but uh, there's the smoke, as you mentioned, from Extreme Gaming. Phylactory done. Who are they going to find? Mac and Seeds of Serenity here for Bach. 1,500 health. And he's going to pop the Mac and heal back to half, but a lot of damage out of that Earth Splitter and Thunder God's Wrath. Low with the spike. Of life. Two man stun, finger of death, finish off the Zeus, and now the turn onto Arme. Hexed up and chain disabled forever. Gets the infest into DY. Maybe a stomp and a TP out. No, he's gonna infest out to try and bail away, but Ori with a double kill. Make that a triple. As the sniper comes into this bottom lane and just cleans house. Such a good fight. They did go for the tankiest target, and you can see the TP rotation. Because Ori TP immediately to tier 2 towers, starting to pump in damage onto Jinq, killing him immediately. And that fly with the first TP gets the stun. It's very important, they're very well coordinated in terms of who TPs where in and in which order, which makes a lot of difference. And then after that, like, Lifestealer doesn't really provide you with much. This was before Troll even popped his ulti, and that's gonna be Battle Fury now for low, plus another tower. I'm starting to get real worried for Extreme Gaming. You are letting this Troll and Sniper have a complete free farm. Yeah, I'm, I'm still struggling to put my finger on it, but this that, that feeling I had a couple of minutes ago, right? This is where it's starting to emerge. It's just like Sniper, Troll, they're winning lanes. You know, peaking that little bit faster than the extreme gaming heroes, and I noticed at the end, peaking at the end of that peeping? fight, uh, peeping, peaking, both. Yeah, <laughs> they're just doing very well for themselves. Um, yeah, no, I noticed at the end of that fight, XXS. You know, he was in the mid lane. He he wasn't meant to be involved, and probably shouldn't have been involved. He buys his blink as his team are all dying. And it's kind of like, okay, your team went to make space to try and get this blink, but it also means your next move has to pay off. You're two k behind. Azure Ray are accelerating very quickly here. The map could get small if you don't get these smoke, uh, you know, blink stun connections out of the slaughter of XXS. Middle tower is under attack. They're rotating yep. to the mid lane. No one's defending. Ori feels very comfortable right now and going 
straight into his shard, so wants to keep the distance, have that disarm ability after finishing off Maelstrom. Like, we've seen that uh, quite a lot recently compared to straight up Tank Cardell build. Yeah. And we saw this a ton from Quinn, right? Hurricane Pike, the Shard. Even even just not buying Aghanim Scepter and the, the Kanda. Almost as if those items are a bit of a bait sometimes in pro games. You go for the stats, you go for the much more consistent, conservative build here that's going to allow you to win team fights. Extreme Gaming do get that top tier one at long last. Still not able to move XXS into a position where he can find jumps alongside the rest of his team right now. Uh, using, using Blink Dagger defensively there in that northern jungle. Logan going to gather up all of the free farm that's left to him. XM and DY looking to play out of this middle lane. Wanting to buy a bit of time for Arme still. You know, this armor on life stealer. Good first item. I would like to see him get involved in maybe a couple of early fights, but it feels like he's using this just to farm into Radiance as quickly yeah. as possible. Amulet is fine. It's just because you need an item in between the Radiance, can't really rush it. Yeah. And then the best chance is going to be good against Troll, but you're playing against Sniper. I don't think you're going to be getting close to Sniper unless you will penetrate Slaughter, get into him, and uh, try to get, <laughs> you know, infest bomb going. Let's see. It's time to smoking, and there it is. They just infested him. Let's see what they the can slaughter. find. Has been penetrated, guys, in the words of Lacoste. <laughs> oh, the, the scout. Cabal the is scouting things out, but they are smoked. Good positioning coming out from Tian Ming, who has a blink dagger and smoke broke. Smoke broke. Thunder God's Wrath gives the vision for the blink stun into the two of them. Sniper and the troll in trouble. Low. Very low oh, HP. Stomp. Battle Trance already used, and the stomp is there. Finger of Death thrown in. Lasso as well onto XXS, and the Pit of Malice holds them back. They got the blow up on the sniper. Looked like Low would be dying as well, but as you're Ray able to scrape away with people still alive. And Roshan, yeah, Roshan. You know, half HP still out here. Without Slaughter, if they have Slaughter, I think they can go and try to take it, but they can not just poke. They're going to be very low HP. And once Azure Ray heroes are back, they can come back into the Rosh pit and take it because they haven't use much. Guardian Reeves is going to come off cooldown. Sniper did evaporate in that fight. Died immediately. So, we need to be slightly more careful about his positioning. I mean, he was killing Roche. You need to be inside. Jin Q still lurking around. Oh, yeah. He's very dead. <laughs> Mega greed. <laughs> that is the greediest play I've seen in a long time. You know they're coming back for it. You know that shoving that additional wave is probably going to lead you to die. He accepts his fate and falls for it. So Azure Ray will in the end get the Roshan delayed slightly by that death of the sniper. And Ori's perfect clean sheet game comes to an end. Four, one and two on him now. But that should be ages for the troll. And probably going to lead to the demolition of all the tier two towers. Interesting, he's going for a Manta style. Because Agatim Scepter just feels superior, but I think with Agatim Scepter, you want to have SNY, not Manta plus Agatim Scepter. Not sure if he doesn't want to buy Agatim Scepter at all, maybe as his like, sixth, seventh item. So that's oh, why fuck. he's opting to go for Manta. Just pops the he's Greaves. fine. Yeah, gets out of the Curse of Haze because he's got Greaves already. 19 minutes in, just dispels it, heals back up. Perfectly fine with what? Three heroes sat behind him as well. The struggles of XXS here. He buys the blink. It got one good connection into that Roche pit for a delay of the take by Azure Ray. But otherwise, it's been very hard for XXS to, to play unless he's with the entire team. He needs the Inkswell. He needs the Infest. I look a low right now. This troll is just charging towards Jin Q. Tian Ming, I think, has got a glimpse of him. Soulbind thrown across to the troll and the bat. Thunderbolt, a lot Big of damage, damage. on the Tian Ming here, and they've taken them both down. XM blows them up. I didn't expect that. But it looks like Extreme Gaming fully understanding the power of their draft here. With this ET spirit reducing all of the stats and healthiness of the troll warlord, 
And fly with a finger of death and a bit of control with a pit of mouse as well. Trying to hold them back, but the troll is dead. Extreme They're gaming. Going through the gates. Another couple of big kills as Ori goes through the Fiend's Gate, gets up the top lane, but FY not going to have the same luxury. Whew, man, Jinkyu, he was out of position near the Roche, and they're like, oh yeah, he's in a bad spot one more time, but the rest of the team ready to back him up. If he doesn't get that soul bind off, I think the fight is slightly different, but he gets it off, and look at the damage coming out from Zeus. Suddenly a couple of right clicks. Whew. From Lifestealer, they immediately disappeared. That was before XXS even get the jump. So, got the jump. So, you can see Troll being fairly useless. Uses that ulti. I, I think all these sounds that sound the same, like Roshan's Roar, Troll ulti, they're pretty worthless abilities. <laughs> Anything where you think that is loud screaming and annoying. Wow, I just described myself. <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to go after me with that. I was wrong nah. acting for it. <laughs> but Gary, you should, you should do some voice acting for one of these abilities. Uh, you did some voice acting before, right? Just a bit of screaming. <laughs> nah, you did it for Just make some loud noises. Didn't you? I uh, did some uh, there was voiceover work for, for Porsche. Porsche. For some of their videos, yeah. Yeah, I used to pronounce it as Porsche, and then I got told off by some of their, <laughs> some of their executives. They're very particular about pronouncing it properly. Anyway, maybe, back maybe to dead was, even. That's why it was the only time you work with them. Can't even pronounce the <laughs> yeah, name of the call, company. Yeah, they didn't <laughs> I don't call like that one. <laughs> Porsche? No. <laughs> These English speakers. Tragic stuff. Man, it's still so surprising thinking back to that fight, man. Like, close to 6,000 damage from a Zeus into Soulbind. Absolutely insane stuff. And ET... I always have to remind myself. ET Spirit, the magic resist is on the spirit... Uh, magic resist reduction is on the spirit, and the armor reduction is on the hero, right? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Clearing some big stacks again. Items are starting to pile up on Ame. Sanj now completed, going into SNY. This has been... The life stealer build, build now for quite some time. I assume the next item is going to be Agatham Scepter. So he can infest. Troll hasn't really done much. And look what he's building into. He feels like he needs Eternal <laughs> Shroud. Yeah. I mean, for the last couple of fights, it's felt that way, absolutely. I don't know I about that one. I wonder if they noticed. I wonder if they noticed that Troll Illusion walked straight past them. Immediate blow up on the FY Lion. Also, vision on the troll and sniper off to the right hand side as they TP across the map to get away. Dyer's bottom tower is under attack. Now, the surprise factor smoke gangs for extreme gaming are incredibly powerful right now. Infested Slardar finally getting stuff done it's alongside his ink swell. You know, he's honestly had a, a rough game, XXS, but every move that they've made with the full team has paid off. So now he's ahead of this Underlord by about 2,000 net worth. Yeah, they've been utilizing this Jinq swell with Slardar, with Infest, go onto one target, kill it off immediately. XM shows exactly where the rest of the team is, and suddenly it's 4v5. I've seen this build on Troll before, but not with the Mantis style. This is a time when mm. it was heart meta, and some trolls did build like Eternal Shroud plus Heart, and you're going in like basically regioning up all the time, being very annoying. But you need Aghanim Scepter with this type of a build. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Other carries we saw it from was like Naga Siren and, and PL, right? But that was when Eternal Shroud was kind of uh, bugged, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> giving it all to the illusions as well. Troll, probably the only, you know, only other carry that we've seen it from. He's changing his mind, though, hey. I'm glad. He's listening in. Because the problem is, you use one of those slots early on, and if this game goes on for another, like, 15, 20 minutes, you need to get rid of something. Ah, oh, mate. Has the item queued up. That's the He's big got... one. Yep. Yeah. First three primary items done. Armlet, Radiant, Sand, and Yasha. And the Aghanim Scepter, the anti-carry build to deal with that troll. And we'll be on its way shortly. Down at bottom, Tianming going to TP away from XXS. 
attempting there with the spirit, the stomp, the corrosive haze to track back. But Batrider, such a pesky devil, going around the trees, trying to cut waves and being a nuisance down in that bottom part of the map. Another minute or so for next Roshan as well. Good time here for Azure Ray yeah, to smoke up out of the mid lane, try and find a pick. And you'll know that, you know, four and a half minutes until daytime, one minute until Roche, you kind of want to be setting up in that nighttime top left corner, Roshan's pit. Get some wards down there, play into enemy ancients, play into enemy tormentor. All these things coincide with each other in that, or on that left side of the map, which is where they're playing into now with low showing on the wave and the rest of the smoke behind him. They are Action tanky if, they, if they're playing around Bach with Guardian Greaves, with Pipe, this freshly bought Pipe Radiance will make some difference in terms of damage output that came Radiance out from the Zeus. You're playing against ET, Dyer's so what you want to buy is buy some armor items, buy some magic resistance. Low, he does have BKB Radiance available for the next fight, but after all, he is troll, so that doesn't matter. Oh! Damn, Ming just disappears. Yet again, one straggler left out to their own devices, found by Extreme Gaming and disappear in a matter of seconds. Azure Ray do have a high ground observer ward for about a minute, still left over, but that's going to be swiftly dewarded by DY. And Roshan's still not up. 30 seconds to go. Batrider will be alive, and it looks like we're going to get a full 5v5 in this top left corner again. History repeats itself. Oh, man, you're looking to cut the wave up the top. Clear out some of these troll illusions just to set themselves up for a better position. It does quite often feel, though, you know, Dyer here with a little advantage getting up to the Twin Gate, the Outpost, and the ability to TP across with buybacks. We'll have that slight upper hand when trying to contest this Northern Road. Sniper has buyback. So does Lion. So does Batrider. So they can try to outnumber them. Roshan is up. Going to be here for another two and a half minutes. And Extreme Gaming have kind of relinquished control of that top lane and of the high grounds. They are pushing back across to a little staircase up near their ancients. But as you're rare coming, a lasso from Batrider into the pit of malice, soulbind thrown out, catching up onto the troll and Batrider. Infest in and out from Armes. He munches on FY and XXS is kept alive thanks to Lifestealer. Now with the ink swell and the move forward, Arme just destroying them single handedly, getting up Go in their blah. face, battling down to line of bat, and now the troll. Look at it being do? useless. Battle <laughs> trans BKB for what? Oh man, troll. I love watching tro troll in professional Dota. That was a good jump from Azure Ray. Getting, leaving until the ink swell is gone. He finds the right target immediately, but yeah, Infest making a lot of difference, giving him just enough Look time. At that to get the Yule Scepter off. And EP ulti, it's sometimes a really good zoning tool. And after that's gone, like Hame, he has a completely free reign in the fight. Yeah, what's the troll meant to do? <laughs> You're dead one way or the other. Oh man, Wait this until is he gets pre... ag at him, Scary. Exactly, yeah, this is pre-ags. It looks like a free Roshan here for extreme gaming as well. How has this game swung so hard? The pendulum, Lacoste, the it was, pendulum it was swinging. very firmly. It's swinging, <laughs> man. It went from Azure Ray all the way across into Extreme Gaming's ballpark now. I mean, what, a six, 7,000 net worth lead emerging for them? After a laning stage, an early game that looked very good for Azure Ray. Where, where has Ori been? Good question. We I'm haven't not... seen much. I mean, he's tiny, so hard to spot him in a fight, but seems like he's keeping the distance. Not being able to deal damage. If your frontline dies, they already use Guardian Grease. Yeah, see, it's kind of hard to spot, especially when he's near the trees. Love this set, man. I haven't seen this set before, and I gotta say, you know, this is definitely not the most expensive one. It's not that uh, astronaut, uh, the, or, yeah, the astronaut marine one. biologist. Space. I'm not sure which one. Yeah, the space suit one. That, that's a good one. That's the expensive one. But this one looks like Marvin really the good. Martian or whatever. Oh, I'm gonna have to look in the market for it. See if I can buy one myself. But it better not be one of these exclusive that's uh, that's untradeable and unmarketable. A catch on the bat rider, XXS and XM going to exsanguinate the bat down in that bottom jungle. 
Sniper has picked up an Aghanim Scepter. Kanda queued up next. It feels like you're kind of relegating yourself to just sitting back and being this long-range artillery. And not wanting to be out on maneuvers with the rest of your team. Just sit on a high ground somewhere and hope that you don't get jumped. Another Inkswell. Slardar's coming. Ori, you're in the mines. But I think you've been found here. The Fiend's Gate. Oh, they got Yules and Crush. There is no escape. Bark is coming through the gate. Trying to fight this and defend the sniper. Infest in, jump back out. Oh, mate. He's just going to crunch and munch on you. Sniper dead for a full minute. And yeah, Bark comes through that gate and he's like, Hello? No, 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 goodbye. I don't want to be here anymore. What was that line from Gimli? And they call it the mines. The mines. <laughs> Um, and Vorf caught uh, near the mines, getting deleted instantly. XX says he's been, I, I think, coming into the next game. This game's not over yet, but it looks very difficult for Azure Ray. Like, what do you even do? Because he was playing, he was the lowest network core for a long period of time. Gets a blink dagger, suddenly everything changes. He's playing in one of the worst matchups that you could possibly imagine. Maybe if he had, like, stronger position 5, but it was already difficult. And XX says... He's, I think he's the player that has been so stable for the last couple of years. He's been my favorite player from China, definitely, in the last couple of years. Yeah, so, so consistent. Very, very nicely played in this game, especially. Yeah, I mean, thinking back to how this all came about, like, laning stage was poor. But that bottom fight where, you know, I mentioned XXS just wasn't there. He was farming Blink in the mid lane. Gave him that chance. Gave him the opportunity. His team fed to give him the space. And now he's able to just blow people up alongside Ame. And he's been handed that couple of minutes of of free time to buy the blink dagger. His team literally fed their lives away for him to get there. And since that point, it's been a one-way street. Give us your ray a little bit and snatch it all away from them. Now we're looking at Refresher Orb Zeus. Big old damage gonna come out. As low is being run at. XXS with Inkswell, another crush available. Good pit of malice though from Bach. But look at Shin Q. He, he blinked in, in onto Troll. Aggressively moving. <laughs> Yule's under the Troll. And they missed the stomp here. XXS is still trying to fight into it as they get a lasso into the back lines on the DY. But the Inkswell can dispel it off. The Glimmer Cape not enough to save him. Troll still being turned on. Holding Battle Trance. Satanic and BKB. Arme. Pushing Arme away a little bit. But he's got Aegis. He's got Infest. He's inside the Troll. BKB and Battle Trance forced down here. Low trying to life seal back up with a Satanic. But Arme and XXS, the Yule Scepters and BKB just find enough time to turn and kill him off. The troll is going to get taken down here by Arme and XM. Tian Ming and Bach with FY getting there towards XM Zeus. Do they, do they just don't have enough damage? They can't kill this little fella. Even with the Assassinate out, Extreme Gaming, they're going to clear them all out. Underlord through the Fiend's Gate, but not enough time. Oh, Ori Arme, could be in trouble. He's, he's inside of him. In him. Oh, Ori Sniper, we've been asking, where are you? Where's the damage coming from? Gets a good couple of assassinates out, but in the end, Extreme Gaming, a firm, a dominant grasp on game one. Ori had a really good done. positioning. I want to see his damage from the last fight. It was definitely high. 10,000 damage coming out from Sniper, because he was peeping from a distance. He had Troll in the, like, very close by, fighting against both cores from Extreme Gaming, but it's not enough. Fighting. This was a fight with Aegis. This was a fight with the buyback coming out, but uh, I'd say some uh, signs of life. Uh, Troll, however, he's not dealing damage. He's sustaining. The one who's actually dealing damage is Sniper. Yeah. Five assassinates in that in that team fight, I'm getting a lot of damage out. And Arme, you know, next fight if Lifestyle doesn't have Aegis. It could have some problems. Especially that was a quick very reaction from entries. If he doesn't get the BKB there, I think the fight is completely over. XXS will get multiple rounds of his stuns. He can lock onto a target. Refresher Zeus is also causing the big issues. It must be so chaotic, so frustrating as well. Like you're in the middle of a fight like that. I I can imagine if I'm that troll, I'm just face rolling keyboard. Like just BKB satanic battle trans, press all the buttons, try and stay alive. Hello, yeah, very calm. I'm just trying to buy as much time as possible. Utilize every item and spell to the fullest. Still a 13k lead here for extreme gaming though. 
Tormentor grabbed up by the Dire, giving Tianming the shard, which well, is kind of well worthless. DY's oh one. My Zeus. He will have amplified damage for the next fight with Refresher oh Orb. My God. Plus, he's been holding on to Whispers of the Dread for a really long time. So, yeah, his damage output is insane. Going into Aghanim Scepter next, just a thousand gold away from it. I'm kind of curious what the full damage number is with Natural Order on someone as well. This could just be Annihilation if Lo doesn't BKB TP out of here. The jump stun gets the BKB off. Chase is on Go from XD gaining, though. Uh, he's, trying to, he's trying to TP now, but the bashes are there, and he's finished off by XM. Troll dead crazy. for 80 seconds. Oh, boy. Uh, it might Looks be time, like time for to try two. to... Yeah, not just tier two. I think they might also... Try to siege the high ground. Seventy seconds without low. Next success. He's chasing. A different side of the map. Sniper needs to be there. Ori will need to keep you back. It's also yeah, double I mean, catapult wave. Thirty-five minutes in. True. And yeah, at the very least, poke to see if he buys back. Sniper getting some good damage onto Arme there. Yeah, half HP, realizing he doesn't want to stick around any longer. No buyback forced. High ground defended. Azure Ray. They live to fight another day. And Chan Ming doing classic Batrider stuff as well. Cutting waves down the bottom. Which would have made it very challenging to continue the push anyway. Still being hemmed in your base though. And it's going to take some kind of smoke, Fiend's Gate play. Some little bit of magic here for Azure Ray to get into a good position to fight. That's still another two minutes for the next Roshan as well. More time for Extreme Gaming to farm up their next round of items. I'm kind of sad Shinku hasn't been as greedy as we've seen previously. They're still still quite greedy. There's, but yeah, there's, no there's Aghanim Scepter yet. Yeah. <laughs> Buying Guardian Grease, I think that's completely fine. Wants to keep the distance with Eater Lens, Psychic Headband. But uh, no Aghanim Scepter yet. I don't know if he even wants to get it this game. Sure, Troll is fine, Sniper's fine. Maybe he's going to opt to get Hex instead. I think that would be more valuable mm. item. Smoke, yeah, like success, no... he's in. He's spotted. Lassoed up as well. Dead. <laughs> Batrider. Extinct. A blink of an eye, he's gone. And XXS, oh man, XXS he's XXS hungry. With this Yule's he's found the sniper. Stun. Or he's dead for 80. Hey, is Arme going to go diving here? Looks like he is. Bark in his sight. Hexed up by FY. A few stuns thrown away of the life stealer, but you can just see he's 1v3 under tier 4s, and it's Azure Ray who are afraid. They don't want to get jumped by XXS on his slaughter again, and he's Stop coming once more. Two. Inkswell, jump crush, low, and Bark trying to hold them back, but... Extreme gaming so powerful here, just pressing forward into the enemy base without even having a creep wave near them. It's not easy to see to high on. You're playing against Underlord Sniper when he's alive. There's a gem being pinged out by Tian Ming. He's like, please pick it up. And this is the big item. Like XXS, he's been going for this build for quite some time now, picking up this Wind Waker. You'll scepter a lot of value that he got from it already. And now he can is get out of low? trouble. Okay. Nah, nah, nah. You don't want. You don't want to infest. Dy will still drop ulti. That and then the jumping in mid. A lasso onto Slada, who tried to jump in onto this soul bind. He still got the good crush and stun on Fy. Now the soul bind goes onto the bat, sleeping up Box Underlord, and Arme can open up on him. Not too many hits here to get the center of the slug man, taking him down with XXS grabbing a double kill. Low Tian Ming and now Ori Sniper. Trying to get back into this battlefield, but all they see are dead corpses. Sadness for Azure Ray. Tier 3 tower glyphed up for now. That's a real struggle to see how they enter this fight, though. I mean, you can buy back the Underlord and the Lion, maybe. DY is doing one hell of a job controlling the back lines, allowing them to go for some of these jumps. Refresher coming off cooldown in 15 seconds, and guess the neutral item that. Zeus found, of course, it's going to be Timeless Relic, because why not? <laughs> Kaya, Timeless Relic, <laughs> Thunder God's Wrath, deals almost 700 damage, times two, 
max HP on top. It, it, it's wild. It gets pretty ridiculous. <laughs> plus natural order, plus this, plus that. And yeah, <laughs> anything else? Batrider, a couple of hits on him. Army's life stealer, absolute beast. What was it? Zeus's spell amp. It says 25, but that, that number is much closer to like 70 or something with everything thrown in here. Any, any veil enjoyers? No? That's upsetting. No, but look at what Lo is building. Eternal Shroud. Oh, he's, he's going committing. back for it. He's going, yeah, he's wow. actually going for it. I, I don't know if that's the build. Maybe he thinks I need to be as tanky in the front line as possible so my sniper can deal damage, but what happens if they jump sniper they're gonna see him you have a slaughter corrosive haze is gonna be undispellable in the next few minutes level 24 right now this is also roshan banner plus a refresher shard so what is that that brings eternal shrouds magic resist when he's on the full stacks to like 50 percent I mean, maybe all right now he does have 57 percent when he gets the stacks uh, should be around like 70 up to an 80 maybe even more than 80 because okay. he's also holding the trickster's clock so it should be more than 80. Radiant let's see if we can stay alive against the zeus actually i'm buying e-blade now yeah just look at that net worth graph 97 percent win probability Pretty big gap now, 27,000 net worth difference. And that, that start of the game, right? Getting into, getting out of the laning stage into that kind of early mid game where Jure had a few thousand in the bank, a good lead up over XG. It just seems so meaningless now. A rattle cage for Bax Underlord. A bit more tankiness. Armor gonna help against Life Dealer and Slardar. But again, coming to what we were talking about post-draft, right? This is such a good mix of damage sources from Extreme Gaming with amplifiers across the board. It's it's very... I mean, this this is why Lois is having struggles, right? The draft is so good that itemizing against individual heroes doesn't work. You have to itemize yeah. against the draft, but it's so well covered that you can't. And Lo, he's just going to get jumped on. Stunned and abyssal bladed. Gets a little bit of distance thanks to some four staffs. And XM, they just killed Ori. He just gets blown up. A dive into the base. <laughs> Take down the sniper. Or he's gonna buy back as they're losing their tier three in this bottom lane. XM got level 25 before that fight. He TP'd on the other side, picked up that XP rune. So extra 150 flat damage. So that's 700 coming out flat from his LP 10% max. He also used refresher. Sniper's sitting at 2.2k HP. So with a little bit of extra like nimby double nimby if you drop it on top of him you might get some solo kills where was the sniper i don't know i actually when don't he know. died it's, it's 900 damage with yasha uh, with uh, kaya and timeless relic Jeez, six and a half thousand damage absolutely incredible now it's adding even more Lifestealer was an MKB, so he adds magic damage to his kit as well. <laughs> FY, very nearly just straight up dies to the Slardar. He might still fall. Uh, they're not, not going to go hunting for him. Oh, their vision game spirit. is insane. Zeus, ET, showing you exactly where they are. Tian Ming, again, trying to go for the creep wave, trying to cut it. Do whatever you can. Ninja Gear is helping you out here, slip across the map and find a little place to hide. XM. Thunder God's Wrath. The damage into that bottom Ori's lane. Dead. And trying to kill the troll. <laughs> Ori dead again. Shinkyu found the backstab and low falls as well. G I mean, GG called. It's been a foregone conclusion for quite some time now. Extreme Gaming. We've seen them in the groups. We've seen them get into these playoffs and have some struggles in the laning stage. Have some struggles in that early game. But it seems like... Now, after the past couple of series, they've ironed everything out. Drafting is superb, laning stage perfect, and they get into that mid-late game, which they have practiced several times, let me tell you now. They just have such decisive decision-making. They snap into action and get the job done. Yeah, XM has been amazing this game. So has been Ame. Their team fight 
is insane. Like some of these mid and late game team fights, the execution is really there. Ame with some clutch, infests having Inkswell on top of Slardar who goes in. XXS, he's just a beast. Uh, DY's been controlling the back lines constantly with his Echo Stomps, his ultis to try to zone them out. It looked very good for Azure Wraith in the first like 15-ish minutes, but I gotta yeah. say, I don't, I don't like this troll build. I don't think Manta Styles think. I think he needs Aghanim Scepter to be more mm. tanky, have a dispel for himself, dispel Inkswell, dispel Astral, dispel Sprint. Things get pretty difficult once Aghanim Scepter is picked up on Ame and changes the matchup completely, carry to carry. Uh, but yeah, they have to think of something different. Also, I didn't feel the influence of this Underlord pick. It was a tough lane for yeah. him, and he didn't transit position into anything better than just you know being this pit of malice uh, his items didn't really matter that much yeah there's a rough one a struggle to make any kind of moves i mean it felt like the the equivalent of a viper you know in the old days win lanes yeah. lose game just very very difficult stuff for, for azure to convert a net worth lead and advantage from that early lane stage into anything meaningful allowing extreme game to take game number one as we pass it back to nat and the panel Thank you both so much. Uh, we might sound like a little bit of a broken record here because at the end there, LaCosta was talking about the build on Troll and when throughout that game, that was pretty much one of your biggest gripes. You, you thought that there still could have been potential for a way in if Lo had have been able to build something that uh, enabled a team fight better for his team. Yeah, I think LaCosta, he was spot on there. You know, he said the underlord was also feeling like he didn't have a purpose in the game. That's because his other two cores are building dog shit items, you know. <laughs> Again, Sniper, he built like a... <laughs> he built like a MJ, which I feel like... It's not really... I think you can go for Maelstrom, but you don't really fully upgrade it, you know. Because it takes too much build up and you, you're you going to need like an Agadames and you want to build Kanda. You want Dragonlance on here. You just want so many things, you know. And you're delaying so much of your core core item build that allows you to do damage and your teammates are like just okay i mean i'm waiting in the bus you know first ride home you're still not here second ride home you're still not here you know when when are you gonna join me in the bus you know just when you know that's why this underlord is always on his bus alone you know can't really do anything and if you have the troll that doesn't want to buy agonims against all this this spell he wanted to buy manta into eternal shroud at one point that guy was like just uh i guess he didn't wake up you know from his nap that's a frustrated <laughs> pause five there, Nat, going through with a yeah, lot of those yeah. words. And... She's like, I can't believe it. Everything was resting on our pause one shoulders. And classic, I give him one of the best lanes, and we still can't win the game. It was really tough, Danog, for AR, because they did have this great laning phase. We saw this momentum. They were taking stacks off the Zeus. This Zeus had nothing. He was actually below the Underlord in net worth coming out of laning phase. It looked like it should have gone in favor of Azerite. They should have been able to keep that momentum going, but in in the bottom lane had a little bit of a I keep saying it blunder is what we see some of these teams doing every now and then but yeah the the tier two bot lane was I think where the first thread of the unraveling began yeah maybe just overestimating their strength at that stage of the game they did have the win probability it was only at like 60 65 percent at that point in mm -hmm. time but all throughout the pregame we were talking about the potential for this life stealer to take over the game if he got into that agonim scepter and it really felt like once that happened the game just ballooned out of control right it was a really clutch infest on the top tier one right prior to that to be able yep. to save xxs and get that big four for one turnaround but yeah, it was really just the, the delay game and, I mean, what what can we say? Late game Zeus is pretty scary, basically yeah. one-shotting Ori in that penultimate team fight. I feel like we do have to talk on that more because, um, y y <sighs> sorry, let me start again. We need to talk about it more because Sniper was the first overall pick, right? So that meant that Azari in their mind felt that Sniper was going to be able to have the one-up on Zeus no matter what. They were so comfortable in giving that trade in mid lane. We want the Sniper. You guys can take the Zeus. We know we're going to be able to beat you with it and win. But then, when you already talked about it, sometimes you just have to know when to go the magical build. You go for that global build and it just nullified everything that the Sniper wanted to do or even had for himself in the early game. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the, the problem wasn't even that, right? It was just that them missing their timings with their, their lineup. I think with the Troll, Underlord and Sniper, you are supposed to be dominating. I think you win the lanes, that's fair. You know, you win your yeah. safe lane, you win your mid lane. And after that, you have to be able to ball together and take towers and just bully the enemy out of the lane. They're they not supposed to be able to get so much time to farm Radiance on Lifestealer and get their late game items on the Zeus. I, I don't think that should have happened just based on the lineup and based on how 
the lanes played out, you know. They just didn't mm-hmm. have uh, the right build to make their lineup strong together, you know. Getting, even for example, a small thing like getting a Solar Crest on the bat. I think the dagger was fine, but after that, he needed to buy Solar. So when your troll has maybe SNY, Better Fury and Agadims, he's standing in the front line. He has status resist. He has the barrier from Solar Crest. He's not dying, you know. And your sniper is behind with the Dragonlance and early Agadims. Uh, he's just peeping away. And the reason why they needed an early Agadims is also because they needed the sniper to be a pseudo initiator, right? Because you have Underlord mm. and you have Troll, which doesn't have any way of jumping the opponents, but just be in front and just standing and tanking. So when the sniper mm. gets the Agadims, I think the whole dimension of the team fight actually just changes so much. Hmm. I think this is something that we were touching on briefly, even in the, the draft phase, right? I was talking about, okay, who's actually going to be the three making a lot of these rotations? Sniper's not really going to be one of them, and you need to rely on the bat rider and the Lion to be able to get into those Blink Daggers to be able to make something happen. But unless you can actually confirm a kill when you do find one of those pick offs, which they did a few times, it, it does feel a little, you know, underwhelming, I suppose, is the, the best way to put it. So... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, Winter, about all that. Even just the, the choice to go the full Mjolnir instead of the Ags and then rushing into the Kanda. Like, Mjolnir versus Maelstrom doesn't provide any buff to the Kanda at all, right? And it means that you don't have that extra bit of a layer of burst damage that you need, considering you're going up against open wounds, heals coming from the Grimstroke, um, you know, just general lifesteal from lifesteal, a period. Yeah, I mean, if I'm the off laner or I'm the plus four, I'm the plus five in that game for era game ends, I immediately report my mid and carry right <laughs> away. No, no kappa, I just report them, you know. This item will just like, oh my god. I do feel bad because, like, especially for supports, I feel like I have a little bit of extra sympathy for them. But the bat rider just couldn't do anything. I won't yeah. lie, I felt that he couldn't help in team fights. There was no one that he could pull aside and no one was willing to rotate with him anymore. After that bottom tier two is, you know, like we said, that that's maybe where it sort of uh, put AR on their back foot, Dano, but surely there still was a realm at that point in the game where you smoke up and you kind of run again and you kind of like try and pick someone off because they're still farming themselves over on XG. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, I think a little bit of credit needs to be given to XM as well, just for his positioning. You know, he only died twice in that game. And, you know, as long as he's not getting picked off, basically, once the initial, you know, brunt of initiations come in from those Blink mm-hmm. Daggers, what happens then? They've got absolutely nothing left. So as long as he's just staying well on the back lines, which he did after that first iffy initiation that they tried to go onto the Underlord, uh, I think only like 15 minutes in, then they kind of learned from that. They learned from their mistakes. They only let themselves have one big one. And then from then, it was just pretty clean. Yeah. After that, yeah. I think XXS played really well like in, in the rest of the engagement. That was only, like I think, his one major mistake going on the underlord on the bot lane. Like After that, it was just a perfect play. Like He knew who he needed to go on. The life stealer with him, with the Elder Titan spirit, and Zeus is just waiting to take all the kills. Yeah. Well, rough lane for the side of XG, but they're able to claw it back. They're ones that are able to uh, react and, and learn quickly. So we'll see if AR are able to make those quick adjustments for themselves, because right now we're going to have a break. And when we do come back, it'll be game two of our elimination at best of three.
<laughs> we are back. We're already trying to talk about what we want to happen in game number two. What changes can happen for us to be able to see this best of three go all the way to a game number three? Because right now, XG, Azure, one of them is going to be eliminated here on our last day of Elite League. And the other one will be progressing to the grand finals where they will have to go up against Falcon. So, you know, maybe Azure, they're trying to experiment with some stuff. We already talked about it, Winter. If you're going to come into a best of three... Game one, you're allowed to have a little bit of a shaky one. You're allowed to have something that you're not overly confident on, but you have to rein it back in and you have to be sure of what you're going to bring in game number two. And we were discussing, do you go for that Zeus and Sniper trade for your first picks? And if so, are there going to be change-ups to your bands? And right now, Azurite, they're doubling down on it. The, the exact same bands that they had last time, Sniper being picked up for them and Zeus still in the pool. Yeah. yeah me. <laughs> That's... Uh... I feel like you're more worried about Zeus versus Pango, right? If you're Sniper, because at least, you know, Pango, you can hit Pango when he's rolling through the middle of the team fight if you're playing Sniper, but you can't do anything to Zeus if he's just sitting on the back line and no one's able to initiate for you, right? It's also a free lane for, Pang uh, for Sniper if uh, Pango goes through. But I guess they just value the 3 versus 3 a lot. That's Pango plus any two supports at the level 6 minute rune with the roll you're more or less going to oh. have a high chance of securing the runes. It's very difficult to fight Pango in the runes when he's level 6. That's fair. I didn't really think about that as well. Um, it it still is a worry that they have this matchup. They realize late game that they're not able to close it out. And the Shadow Demon and the Centaur are still up there for concerns in, in Azure's minds that these are three heroes that no matter what happens they're actually willing to trade off the Zeus which has dominated game after game and is able to go two different builds is able to adapt to whatever the game really needs for himself but if they are going to make this sniper work if they're going to you know look towards securing this game number two for themselves winter what needs to come around this uh this lineup and what needs to enable it to actually keep progressing and keep the momentum going that they didn't have in game one uh i think just mainly itemizations and knowing how to uh, utilize the team with your, your time, not just your own timings, but your team's timings, right? Because last game, I felt like everybody was kind of just, oh, I need a Manta because they have Slala, you know? They are not really thinking about a lot of the other things. Oh, I need to actually be useful early so that my Underlord, but he's, he's rushing a mech, right? So I have to be able to get an item early enough to play with the mech and Greaves timing of the Underlord. And then my Sniper is also, oh, I need MJ to farm creeps. I want to push out waves, you know, instead of just trying to get a Dragonlance Aglim so he can actually play play around all the three calls. I think that's actually the, the biggest problem that they had the last game, you know, figuring mm. out how to play together as a unit. Yeah, yeah, and they clearly still have that scaling potential with the supports coming through now with the Dark Willow for Shen Q, but you just have a look at those two bands coming in, uh, the second phase of bands, right? The two that they faced up against in that previous game, obviously feeling like the Elder Titan with the Natural Order is a bit of a cheat code with the Zeus, just to be able mm -hmm. to buff up that damage even further, and maybe even just feeling like, well, okay, our Sniper actually had a really good laning phase, we just need to pick our own supports or an offlaner that's going to be able to enable him just to be that frontline, to be that catch that we need. Need. and as long as we're not getting caught out by that you know inkswell buffing up whoever's going in on the sniper he should be happy to just sit back and you know continue peeping away because ori did have a fair few good team fights where he was just able to sit back unopposed but then you know the rest of the team was just getting shredded in that time and there you go there's your frontliner that you need but again yeah. It is a slaughter being kind of blindly picked into a lane where you don't even know what the support is let alone what the um what the carry is that you're playing up against I do want to, you know, you talked about the bands right there that as a Ray, the Elder Titan, the Groom being banned out because it was, it was picked last game and they don't want to come up against it. Uh, I was just comparing XG's bands and they're all the same across the board except for the IO. Um, IO was banned last game, Oracle now being banned in replacement and they go for the Dark Willow still leaving it in the pool. AR don't even look towards it either despite it, what felt like pre-playoffs. Um, doing great and having a lot of fantastic pairings and uh, giving a lot of sustain to to teams and i'm a little bit surprised that as didn't even contemplate it i guess is what i want to say winter mm, i'm not really sure about this hero i know blitz said that this hero feels uh, good in parts, specific matchups where you can win the lane and they were just picking out the hero without <laughs> seeing the lane so i'm not really sure why they wanted dark willow or anything else you know maybe like 
compared to Bat Rider, I think usually teams would just pick Bat at that junction instead of Dark Widow. So picking the yeah. Dark Widow tells me that maybe they want some some more late game uh, global range hero that can reach the sniper because you can <laughs> reach the sniper with your your talents and your air games later <laughs> with Willow. So I, I don't know, man. I'm trying to I'm trying to reason <laughs> why. Just a comfort pick. We could just say that maybe it is just a massive comfort pick for himself. This is gonna be his seventh game um in yeah. like the last week competitively on it so i mean i'll say they they really like like the, the double team fighting support uh from xg you know like it, now it makes uh, a lot more sense because they they have a phoenix so you can use terrorize to protect the egg mm -hmm. and but it's very very slow right you have this dark willow and phoenix support duo which you don't really initiate very well until you get uh use on on the dark willow so your heroes are basically just trying to play from range right your three men Fighting so for runes is Dark Willow, Phoenix, and Zeus. So nobody has a stun. So everybody's like just trying to poke and prod. So greedy playing along this as well. I mean, you, you, do you think they're just going to full greed this one out? Like go an early Orchid on the Naga Siren? You can have, of course, the Zeus ulti to be able to, you know, potentially get some kills. Yeah. You can have the Bedlam join in on top of that because Phoenix, really not the greatest ganking support, much more of a reactionary, and DY is one of the best, at least Maybe in terms we've, we've of his reaction. Maybe we've seen him like. We've being willing to just buy any item that the team needs right on the phoenix he bought i guess like he bought like a, a atos nullifier i guess mm -hmm. this game maybe you can i think you should probably try to rush the the hex this game i feel like it's a good choice here in, in this particular scenario where nobody has a mm -hmm. easy way of uh, starting the fight for a team i guess they still have their off laner but i think this yeah. if i wanted to rush a hex this would probably be the type of uh, draft that i'll be thinking about that and with the yeah. zeus and the naga so all the waves will be constantly pushed out right and you want to be able to find pickoffs. so if you have no stuns no catch then it's not very ideal for for their team could be could be a hex could even be a shivers if you feel like you need to play a little bit more defensively but yeah i'm totally on the same page with you winter about like needing a little bit of that initiation yourself like it, it kind of feels a little weird that naga might need to be that at least for where the draft stands right now Doom's banned out against uh, Lifesteal, obviously a good matchup. Slaughter, they've already picked it themselves for Azure Ray. Just trying to think of some other, you know... They couldn't, like, Legion Commander into this, could they? It's not really a hero right now, but against the Lifesteal, you do generally okay. My question is if um, this Naga is going to become overwhelming, if you feel that it's not really going to get out of hand when she uh, does finally get yeah, to... I mean, I think against Lifestealer, it no longer is the case anymore right now yeah. with the Aghanim's SMY Radiance build. I think late game is not that straightforward. I mean, before I agree, you know, without this mm -hmm. build, Lifestealer just, uh, you get upscaled by Naga easily. Late game, you have a, uh, and you have a uh, Blood Torn late game, you have Hex, you know, but I think nowadays the matchup is not exactly the same anymore. You have uh, so many ways of playing the team fight with Aghanim's. It's just so hard to lock him down mm. and he's like hiding in your carry disarming your carry maybe against naga okay the disarm doesn't matter as much because you have your illusions but the radiance is going to kind of also deal with the illusions you know mm. so i think this matchup is totally different now and we see lifesteal is not afraid to buy bkb these days either and that feels like a great bkb game when you consider you know things like orchid um you know just zeus willow phoenix damage overall it kind of bumps up that priority of the um the hex that you were talking about for phoenix to potentially get as well winter just to you know find that quick initiation where you're actually able to try and burst someone down before they're able to react and so right now both the, uh a ar needs like uh need a mid hero extreme gaming needs an off lane hero actually no ar needs a sorry ar needs a support Mm -hmm. Hey, I thought, I thought you were going to bring some new tech here, you know, like a Pos4, <laughs> Pos5 sniper. I'm like, okay, what, 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 what's Winter been cooking in these pubs over there? <laughs> they could still Batrider, couldn't they? Yeah. Still in the I mean, pool. It's still pretty yeah. good. Just I mean, another way kinda, to be able to find that quick jump. Yeah, another you can kind of deal with the uh, illusions in the lane too with Firefly. Mm -hmm. I'm still kind of on the fence as to what XXS is going to go. Like, does he go... Something like an Omni Knight for team fight. Okay, a <laughs> little bit of magic damage, a way to be able to deal with some of the illusions and egg mm -hmm. hit him somewhat, I guess. Yeah. Wow, Spirit that is uh, that is a uh, look at Tian Ming, a, a different away. one. 
Okay, Spirit Breaker can be ungodly and annoying at times. Um, how, do, how do we see it fitting in as a post three? Where's this build? Where does he go for team fights, winter? And, and how exactly is he going to add to the pre existing? I mean, they, heroes? they need stuns right now. So, <laughs> Spirit Breaker is one, <laughs> one of the heroes that can provide a lot of stuns. And whenever you have uh, very little or limited ways of stopping the charge, I think SB can become really obnoxious really, really soon. And also the lane, I think that would be my primary concern when you pick SB, right? Because SB is not that great in the lane, and he's uh, gonna—I think he's gonna struggle. You know? He against Lifesteal, you're probably not gonna have a very good time. I'm not sure how much this Dark Wheeler is gonna be able to uh, change his fate, yeah. but I can see why they wanted to go for the SB because they lack a lot of disables, and the Spirit Breaker kind of gives them global, right? Because you have Zeus, you have Spirit Breaker, and then you have the Naga Illusions pushing out the lane. So anyone who shows up on the map. To push out creeps, especially a sniper, right? You show on the map, there's an SB charging you, and there's a Zeus ulti, you're gonna die. I was gonna yes. say, you don't you don't even have to like show on the map now. Zeus could just ult, and if his Spirit Breaker's got fast fingers, just straight on the charge there, and everyone else heading down towards where they found that sniper. So I can see that Wombo combo potentially happening, maybe playing off for themselves. Danog does the last pick Spirit Breaker, give you the confidence in a 2 0, or as a ray of like, you know, supported their sniper a little bit better now. Uh, I feel like they have supported the sniper a bit better, but I'm always up for some unorthodox stuff coming out. We mentioned <laughs> Zeus, Naga able to shove out lane, Spirit Breaker can as well, so heroes are going to be in trouble, but so are creeps. I feel like Extreme Gaming, I'm going to go with them for this one, 2-0. Alrighty, we'll see if that's gonna happen if Extreme Gaming are gonna be able to advance themselves to the Grand Finals. All I know though is that game number two is ready and our cast is as well, Gareth and Lacoste. Thank you, Nat. Yeah, off we go. Some interesting drafting coming out here in game number two. Spirit Breaker to round things up for Extreme Gaming, but also this kind of back and forth. Sniper Zeus stealing Slardar, stealing Life Stealer. And uh, Spirit Breaker Zeus, Lacoste, is this just a good luck sniper kind of game? Have fun getting charged at nonstop? Uh, I mean, he can use the concussive grenade, or he did get it early, pretty early in the last game, so that's something to deal with Spirit Breaker Charge. You need to be like quick on the fingers or you need to have to the some kind of vision. But uh, yeah, it's not easy this time around. They have a little bit of save that comes out from the Lifestealer. We've seen in the previous game how Ame played the Lifestealer. He was mostly focused on XXS to either play with him for the initiation or use it to save him when he gets out of trouble. So I, I think also the reason why Slaughter plus Lifestealer are popular together as a combo, especially in this series, is Slaughter counters Lifestealer in the lane. So if you take that one, if there's no like mm. razor or anything, uh, Lifestealer does have free time in the lane, and I don't think Spirit Breaker is going to be able to put much pressure on top of him. Dark Willow, I think they need to drag the creep waves as much as they can because if you're relying on those greater bashes and they don't come, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, yeah, just don't be honorable in this lane, pull out <laughs> all the little tricks you possibly can and try and get your levels up on this XXS and Jinq. Dual lane down at bottom. A camera looking into mid. XM on the Zeus. Ori on the sniper. Let's look away, shall we? We've seen this. <laughs> yeah, but this time there is no first blood for Ori. It doesn't have that extra gold. Still, sniper does well. We've the meta developed, so we now have like sniper Zeus being very contested from the mid lane. Heroes that are kind of difficult to kill. I know it sounds stupid, but sniper becomes super tanky early on with his magic wand. Trez goes into Dragon Lance, double raid band, sometimes on top of magic ones, so extremely difficult to take down. And we've seen a lot of rotations early on, especially from the Chinese teams. They're not too afraid to TP mm. three and a half, four minutes into a game into a mid lane to save their mid laners or try to set something up. I should be reactive, get on top of people. On that final lane up at top, Naga and Phoenix against Slardar Gyrocopter. Quite a fair amount of damage out of FY and Bach if they're able to get on top of DY. Got to be very careful with his health totals and where he's positioned. But uh, I, I don't know. We've we've had discussions about Nagasaren through this group stage, through this tournament. I I feel quite strongly about this hero in having uh, quite a, or from what we've seen, having quite a short window, a period of time in that mid game where you can strike and feel very strong, and then outside of that window, you feel like hey, you're just kind of flopping around, pushing waves, and not really accomplishing too much. Is this a game where Ame can flourish on the Naga? Is that window going to be wide open for him for that kind of Bloodthorn timing? Uh, I think he can. The panel talked about 
life stealer against naga matchup it's again life stealer doesn't have that many bad matchups anymore builds into radiance uh, has sny becomes super tanky radiance always going to be good against the illusions but then again you have i th think this is a god tier butterfly game all three cores are heavy physical also mm -hmm. i want to see some ac i want to see some solar crests to come out from extreme gaming maybe you have its halberd from one of the supports i think it's very easy to itemize against lineup like this because most of the damage is physical there are some magic coming out from maelstrom what are you laughing about the radiance of course from life stealer i heard a charge and i was like yes action what's going <laughs> xxs charged a ghost in the small camp to try, try and secure some last hits and stop the pull from chan ming nothing Doing particularly good. interesting it just it tickled me <laughs> Then he's going for these charges early on just to try and manipulate the creep wave. Like you said, you don't want to play this straight up in a 2v2. You want to try and drag things around and oh, make things no. a little bit annoying. Charge comes in slightly too late bottom. Tian Ming picks up the Lotus, so... Definitely valuable. XXS would definitely love to have it. They can't put the pressure on low. There's no way that they're going to kill him. Becomes nah, even more difficult. Time. As time goes by in this lane, two points in gold frenzy. You get close, you get hit by it. Pretty much, you need to charge away. But it's an overall good spirit breaker game. They don't have that many abilities that can stop him from getting the charge off. Well, Ming may have overstepped here. And Jin Q taking a lot of damage. Is in trouble. Sticky bomb. So and is first blood Jin is there. Q. Okay, good start. Double Null Talisman purchased by Tian Ming. Ever since the buff to an item, we've seen it more being purchased instead of the Falcon Blade. Uh, some weird looking item builds overall where you have like Ray Band plus Null Talisman. Horrible looking. I'm all about the aesthetics, yeah. but uh, it does the job. DY, he's going to get the kill here. That's a solo. Take him down. FY gone. Oh, my, just good up the creeps. Understanding that you can fight against Gyro, who has Rocket Barrage two points in it, on the side with no creeps. Ui having a pretty good read how much damage he's going to take from it. Yeah, I guess this Techies was always... He's always buying the double circles and the branches, so just finishing them off into, into Nulls feels pretty damn good. Not having to sell the items later on, just building up into something. I'm trying to play aggressively again, bottom into XXS. Chip away at the Spirit Breaker as they again try and drag this wave around and away from that bottom lane. He was doing really good bottom. On him. He had 15 like a minute ago. Now he's sitting at only 19. Things are going to get even more difficult in this lane. You can see him like charging away, trying to get some creeps. He's just and dead. There's the blast off. Tian Ming will get him. And Ame's being chased out of that top lane as well by Slardar. FY and Bach here. Getting up in the face of this Naga Phoenix. This is, this is much more like it from Extreme Gaming, going back to that old <laughs> that old style of who cares lanes, let's go mid-game. It's it's kind of tough, honestly. These first five minutes, Azure Ray getting advantage in both side lanes. And it feels like there, and uh, mid lane, Sniper 34 and 6 against the Yeah, they want to go for a four. kill. Thunder Gods is available. Not sure if they can get the kill in the bottom lane. Tian Ming, low, both full HP. You might trying to bait a little bit. Charge went on the creeps. And Xin Q, a step away from death, finished off by Tian Ming's techies. Hack success, unable to do anything as the Thunder God's Wrath is launched out there. I was trying to finish people off. And Tian Ming survives. The Bracer, man. Yeah, he changed it. He, I saw him buy both Null Tallies. FY was thinking about going for a kill, but with the Blood Grenade dropped, losing some of his own HP. Did not want to commit. And will TP out. First Thunder God's Rat, not getting any kills. That's a bit of a difficult one. You don't necessarily yeah. need to get the last hit. It's, of course, probably worth it if you do, compared to others getting the kill. But, yeah, not getting anything out of it. 1k gold lead already for Azure Ray. Yeah, starting to pick things up. And XXS kind of relegated to pulling. Get as much as he possibly can. I don't have any difficult situation. You know, you can leave low down here alone. He's not going to worry about too much anymore. 
Send Tianming up top. Try lane into the Naga. Boot army out of this lane. Maybe force Naga Star into jungle. At the very least, get a bit of pressure on that tier 1 tower top. Tianming start out with a sticky bomb. Not connecting on anybody. DY dives across the creep wave, but a good glyph there. Keeping the creeps alive, healthy, safe, and sound as FY and Tianming pair up to kill off the Phoenix and the Scout, that pretty hefty medium stack. Mm, this is big. FY has one point in flat cannon. Bach, Slithering Crush level one. But uh, they could farm it together. This is not too bad. It's also seven minutes, so that means they're most likely going to get... Tianming's level six. Okay, never yeah. mind. <laughs> He's a monster. They're going to snipe the gyrocopter out here as he tries to steal the stacks. XM's rotation, looking to secure it. Keeping vision over the gyro with that charge, but Ame's not quite able to finish it off. Techie's the kill to get to begin with. Quite a bit of money going his way, and there we go. Thunder God's Wrath used nicely by XM to snipe out FY. A couple of support kills, but honestly, they've had such a good time that it's a fair amount of gold and XP going to Xtreme. Uh, definitely needed to, to make this kind of rotation. Sniper, make it a move. Here. He's very speedy. Ah, oh, Arme just going to get peeped. A hasted roaming sniper comes into lane. <laughs> now, sniper players have been very active ever since the hero become, uh, became first pick material. We've seen a lot of snipers moving. This is the perfect rune for you to pick up because if it's something different, you might die. Spirit Breaker still in recovery mode, trying to get his level 6. Things are not looking too good for him. He can't come to a bottom lane. He can't square up against low. Four points in gold frenzy. He needs to immediately go away. And it's going to be the, the same build that we saw from Arme last game, right? Orb of Corrosion, Armlet into Radiance. Yeah, it stealer. has to be. The, that item build just feels superior to anything else at yeah. the moment. Yeah, adds in like raindrops holding a lotus now, but I'll see him pick up that armlet in a couple of minutes. Oh, FY shit. getting that mid lane for level six alongside Jin Q. Both position fours, like, yes, free experience. <laughs> One thing Extreme Gaming likes to do is pick two supports who don't have that much impact early on. I think one of their favorite pairings so far at the Elite League was Phoenix plus Shadow Demon. Like, these heroes... Mm. Sh sure, Shadow Demon is one of the best support heroes right now, but when paired up with Phoenix, things can be relatively rough early on. One of the reasons why they tend to lose so many laning stages, but they focus heavily on the team fight. God, yeah, I mean, make, look at this. Big kill. D oh, DY is getting another kill. They would definitely love to give that goal to Ame. Yeah, I yeah, sure would. Uh, quite a bit of rotating there to get onto him. And dire vision up in that top jungle, of course, giving the perfect bit of vision onto the techies. Four heroes swarm onto Tianming to take him down. But yeah, extreme gaming have very much been about activating core heroes, right? You talk about that Phoenix, the Shadow Demon here, Phoenix and Dark Willow. Very much you know, put Bedlam onto your Spirit Break. Get in, be active. Unlock a bit more of that potential from your core heroes to do damage or give them the control and team fight backing that they need with a supernova in particular. Yeah, you're right, in lane stage and in early game. These these aren't heroes. You know, it when we're talking about the draft and kind of building things up for a game, quite often we look for those hero pairings, right? You know, who yeah. can play with whom? Who's gonna be roaming and smoking together? A winter, I think, likes to talk about the the trio. You know, your mid laner plus the two supports. What can they do when they're guarding runes or being active? And you're right, Extreme Gaming, the answer is just no. <laughs> no, no, they can't. They're going to be sitting in lanes, playing in lanes for the first 11 minutes. And try and get their levels up and scale towards that mid game. Seems Hell, like the... DY, look what he's got queued on DY. I don't think he's going to go for <laughs> Nullifier. He might be listening to the cast right now and wants to troll us to see us talk about how important it is for Phoenix as a position 5 to rush this nullifier. Someone did it last night, though. Was it last night? Two I remember watching one of the games that Cap and SVG were casting, and there was a team that was, like, completely stomping, and they had a Phoenix pause 5 just go rush nullifier. Maybe it, maybe it was DY. <laughs> My memory uh, fails, unfortunately. I'm just wondering, like... If he decides to commit for it for whatever reason, I don't think they're in a spot right now where he can get it. It's not that good of a nullifier game anyway, so... Mm. Yeah. 
And they got Draft. Snipe out F White. Call down chucked in towards them as well as they're trying to get on top of Ori with the supernova and the fear. Oh, he gets Sniper. the bash. What, where's he going? Sniper just bouncing back and forth. XM will take him down. Supernova Charge in two off seconds. In the end. They're trying to low. come across. Back again. Low has arrived. XXS trying to hide. Infest in and out. Observer Ward being pinged out. And in the end, a three for two. What a good fight for extreme gaming. Like, damage coming out from Zeus is no joke. Like, if he gets multiple rounds of spells, that's going to be very difficult, like, early on to sustain through it. Look at the numbers coming out from Zeus. Yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. So 2.5k damage coming out from him. And good Supernova. He actually did buy Helm. I mean, he can still turn that into Bale. I think that's just a better option. But uh, I got to check the Dota buff to see what happened in that game that you talked about. Yeah. So it was DY, it was Extreme Gaming against Liquid. DY got Rod of Atos, 19th minute, and then 28th minute Nullifier. So it wasn't a straight rush. Um, but yeah, he got that okay, Nullifier so you very lied, quickly. Against, 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 like, he still got it, it wasn't a first <laughs> item, but he very quickly moved into it. I remember it was a quick one, and SVG was like, just imagine, you know, Pos5, <laughs> Phoenix is running at you. A 30 minute Nullifier, the fear into your hearts. But yeah, against Ghost Scepters, four staffs, all that stuff, very, very handy. Have that dispel. That's cool, man. I mean, this kind of reminds me of Toronto, Tokyo, and Miposhka going for Scythe Rush on Phoenix. XXS. That's a big kill. Hanging on top of Bark. That is an important one. Ooh. I mean, Azure Ray were the ones making the first move, but they get held back by that tier one. I don't think they need to be this aggressive. Like, Zeus, if he's there, if you're not getting the jump on him, I don't think you're going to be winning the fight. And now they're farming some big stacks. In the triangle, Spirit Breaker plus Zeus having this global presence, you're gonna start to feel it because XXS is still lowest network core at the moment. But once he picks up the Shadow Blade, somebody is shown under the ward, they're gonna go for the kill. Machine Q gonna bodyguard the creep wave for him as well. But yeah, XM, big stack taken. About three grand saved up. Looks like he's going straight into that Manta and Shard first on the Zeus. And then we can start thinking about going back for your second round of items. And low with this armlet. 1500 saved. Just get to that Radiance as quickly as possible. But if you're farming towards your big items, you've got to know your opponents are doing the same thing. Armes, Nagasire and 7000 net worth. Still up in that top pack of core heroes. Not having a not having a rough time at all, just farming jungle, pushing wave. Under a little bit of pressure now, as Azure Ray do show a couple of heroes on that top tier one. I'm curious. Does Extreme Gaming want to fight this with Song Supernova? They could maybe make a mark in this top left corner. Azure Ray not entertaining it though. Or oh, Ori's been charged. That's their oh, target, but it's a little deep. Zinku still Jin wants to go Q. for it. Brambles. Oh, Rainbow's the sniper. Three of them instantly. Here come the Power Rangers, but the Supernova's dropped on his hand. The Bedlam, the damage is already done. Ori's dead. Supernova being focused down. They killed it off. Son of the Sauron not going to work out. XXS oh, in trouble now. It. TP out. Arme runs, but the Blink Crush from Bach will come. Shin Q bashed down into the ground and a three for one. Congratulations, you killed our sniper. But we <laughs> react, we rotate and kill three of you in trade. Uh, this is what you write in the old chat. Like, we've all experienced it. Uh, unfortunately for them, Lifestealer did have Rage on, so Song plus Egg combo didn't really work, and then Terrorize also not combined with Song. Um, it's like, see you later, nerds. I want to TP out. So he's the one who TPs out first. I think the play, of course, is to let the other TP, and then you go. But maybe the Song was ending. Didn't really count it in. So not too bad. I mean, they kill Ori but lose three of the heroes. They will need Spirit Why? Breaker. Why? Just immediate half HP from the artillery shots out of Azure Ray. Sniper and Techies with a homing missile to follow. They've got some pretty heavy firepower here. Just keep adding more and more guns and explosives to our game. <laughs> It's just kind of funny to think back, you know, that Ursa, the cowboy hat, 
was not fit for the game's aesthetic. Not it's allowed. not allowed. <laughs> the world we live in now with anime Marcy waifu. XXS gets back to high ground. Away from the initiation out of us. I do array that. A bit of time for DY down bottom to get a little, a little closer to the nullifier. 2,000 or so saved up. And a ping onto Ori here. What is it? Arme Naga. DY Phoenix. Not sure they can do it on their own. A charge from XXS from across the map will keep the vision onto Ori Sniper. And they are salivating, licking their lips. Look at this guy. He Ori has charge snared. coming on the courier. And it's not delivered on time. XXS. Concussive grenade not going to work out in time. But once again, rainbow TPs. In we come. Supernova dropped. Good Arme. This time. Not Arme. enough protection. The egg we'll is drop. good, but... Naga Siren dead. DY comes out of the supernova, diving away and Sunray TPing while XXS will charge out of there. Yet again, they've killed Sniper. They've bought a bit more time on the map in the game, but losing your Naga this time around has got to hurt. <laughs> Ori doesn't like this. <laughs> he doesn't like the trades, trading him every single time for something, you know, either three, three heroes from Extreme Gaming or trading position one for him. Somebody else do the job. He he needs to live. Yeah, all for me? Really? It's been sad times for him. I just always that question, you know, is is it is it worth it? Are you buying enough time here to get your Zeus Spirit Breaker and Naga Siren properly activated? Or is this just a kind of wasting time allowing Lowe's Lifestealer to get to this critical mass point? Where Radiance is 300 gold away and honestly incredibly scary. Bach, he's gonna meet some resistance up top. XXS. Oh, Bash, perfectly Q. timed. Jin Q took over the Watcher. Bach blinks in, gives him enough vision. That's a bit unfortunate timing for Azure Ray. And then gets the Curse Crown. He's maxing out the Curse Crown build, which I really like. Picked up the shard of his own for Tormi. Which is something that Jinq usually doesn't do. He likes to wait. He loves to invest his gold into items. But uh, yeah, uh, lowering the cooldown of it. 12 second cooldown. More brambles. It's gonna definitely cripple Slaughter. They their maneuverability mm. in like in the middle of a fight. And also Eye of the Vizier now going into Eaterland. So he wants to keep the distance and get as many spells as possible. Yeah, from super long range. And I guess you're, you're putting Bedlam on Spirit Breaker, sending him forward, and then the rest of it, yeah, can be just long-range control and disables. Extreme Gaming, smoking down to this bottom outer ring of jungle camps. I wonder if they're hunting the sniper again. He's not He's not around this time. Instead, it's Bach holding onto that bottom tier too. Extreme Gaming being pushed down into the bottom right corner. All... Pretty much all five of them down here farming. XM is moving up to that top part of the map right now. A 2k lead for Extreme as well. Now 11 to 11. Again, another dead even mid game. But coming out of laning stage. Is this, is this the deja vu hitting me again? Like it, felt, it feels like game one. You know, Azure Ray coming out of laning stage, getting this good advantage, starting to step forward. Uh, are Extreme Gaming just that much better at mid-game teamfights? They're going to come out here and win a couple and just win the game off the back of it? Uh, I, I could see that happening. I mean, their team fight is super strong. With Egg, if they can control Lifestealer, with Spirit Breaker ulti... Ooh, they need to be careful, Jin-Q. This Stormy causing some of the problems. We're thinking about... Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, they're good. They're good. It's fine. <laughs> it was close, so who got it? XXS... Planner Pocket. Hmm. Uh, that shard can be okay. Like, having self-magic resistance at 75%. Uh, uh, 75 more feels really good. But what's he gonna think? Like, which ability? I think Corrosive Haze is probably the most Corrosive important Haze one. Corrosive Haze the big one. That's I it. I think so. Assassinate. I mean, hoping, hoping what happens with Assassinate? It just, like, turns. It's like, uh-oh, not going for the target. It's wanted. <laughs> Just is bend it... the bullets around. Alright, I got a question. Is it a homing missile if it doesn't even 
go for the target that you initially targeted at. Just malfunctioned. The electronics were faulty, obviously. Uh, jump up to the bottom lane, though. Infest out for the life stealer. XXS Invis. Blast off is there, but there's Sunray. Healing him back up a touch as the song Let's supernova see the combo. combo. Sniper speeping. With the terrorize as well. Oh, it's not timed properly. So as you're ready to come out, the egg still will land and the dive again clears out Tian Ming. XXS is traded out, but Lowe's life steal is still in trouble. He's got nowhere to run. The brambles causing so many issues while Ori assassinates Shin Kyu. Yes, but the turnaround bark and FY back in onto XM. We'll keep him alive. Fighting through it all. Okay. Extreme Gaming, they answer my question from two minutes ago. One team fight is all they need to come out swinging hard in this game number two. They're, they're unlucky. I'm not even kidding. You know, we Dota players will love to use the unluck word, what can you do, but this time around, Sniper needed one extra hit on Phoenix Egg to kill it. I think the fight could be different. Egg doesn't explode. A DY did one hell of a job with that Sun Ray, but Zeus the big winner. You can see him from the bottom, bottom right, attacking the egg. They do go for the combo, and egg one hit manages to explode. Things, I don't know. It, it, it feels unlucky for sure. But Still overall, an incredible fight for them. Yeah, nicely executed combo from Extreme Gaming. And Danos just messaged me our conversation about the play in the pocket. He's saying Infest, potentially. Yeah, if you try to Infest as Nagasaurin with Agnum Scepter, Lifesteal is looking to anti-carry. All of a sudden, it jumps in the Spirit Breaker instead. Undo your entire team fight. Well, that only works if he has Agnum Scepter. Yeah. We'll get there. Now, Nagasar and her time to shine again. We're in a team fight. Push the lanes. Clear mid and bottom. And at the same time, you're scouting. You see Bach, Tianming, Ori, and FY in that bottom to mid lane. And XXS knows he's got potential here to go through Twin Gate and play top, but he decides no. I'm going to charge into this Tianming Techies instead. And Bach, he tried to jump and stun there. He didn't quite get the connection he wanted to hold them back. They lose the techies, and again, we've got Radiant Extreme Gaming with a very nice foothold in this bottom jungle, playing across into both tier twos. Radiant structures are fortified. Ame is super tanky right now. He wants to, like, one of the reasons why he's getting heart as his third Radiant item, wants to survive long attack. enough to get the song off. No matter what, with Terrorize, with Sunray, I don't think Radiant's he should have any issues getting that off. And DY. This madman actually did get Nullifier. He, he was also available for the previous fight. What is he gonna dispel? Uh, Guardian Sprint, Dispellable, Yule Scepter on Gyrocopter, Taser. That's it. There is no Pike on Sniper. Lysler doesn't have anything, so... I guess he wants to shut down Slardar, who goes in, yeah. loses his movement speed. Makes sense, yeah. Also, the projectile speed has been increased in the C patch by 700. That's These are some big numbers. Flies out so quickly. Roshan time. Extreme gaming in the pit. Azure Ray trying to get here with Gyro Slada leading the charge. Bah, FY, cool down. Trying to get a bit of a division in the pit here. Dangerous times, though. Jinkyu just holds that front line. Not allowing any entrance from Azure Ray. Song and available. Roshan about to die. Jinkyu will die. 40 seconds on the sidelines, but there's Aegis with the song. Get the hell out of here with that. Uh oh, safety. if Ame gets oh. caught here. Oh. oh my god, they had high ground vision. But not... They even had vision on the high ground. <clears throat> Tian Ming just plays it. This could have been pretty big. I think Jinkyu. Okay, he doesn't have buy. Very big difference in terms of usage of Infest into Slardar Bomb that we've seen from the previous game. Because we really haven't really felt it this game. Look at that. No? Obs. Last millisecond gets out. That was a close one. Hey, we haven't had these jumps. I mean, we really should be seeing Azure Ray kind of looking for the Zeus. Getting the catches on him. XM unkilled so far this game. 
XXS in the meantime, just charging non-stop, relentless and fearless, but maybe he should be fearful. Dies to Ori's high ground sniper who just starts plinking away You're at cursed people. Him, Gary. XM looks like he's going to drop for the first time. I apologize. That is entirely <laughs> my fault. Uh, there was no Ame in that fight. He's the Aegis holder. Definitely need him to be the front line. Overextending XXS going in very deep. Octarine core available on him with Shadowblade. So giving away a couple of freebies. Who got the last hits? FY, both of them. That's 1,000 plus gold for him. It's just like you win a team fight, you get some big kills, and it's a cold reminder that you're playing against a Naga Siren. And she pushes bottom all the way into tier three. Mid lane's being cut. But yes, we got some kills. Let's press forward. Let's move our advantage a little bit further. No, we've got to come back. Prune the lanes. Maintain the waves. Keep dealing with this absolute bullshit from Naga <laughs> Siren. Who now has a Bloodthorn on top of that heart. And this is that key timing. That, so I was talking earlier, I've not been a fan of Nagas in this tournament so far because quite often they've missed this window where 30 minutes in, they have these items and a couple of team fights go the wrong way and you just don't feel like you have impact anymore. So very important here with this Aegis, with this moment in time, that Extreme Gaming get the Naga, you know, fully off the ground. Yeah, he's in a good spot right now. The most farm hero in the game by far. Time to use it. Two and a half minutes left on that Aegis. Let's see if they can find a fight. Tier 2 tower in Die. the bottom, already gone. This is something that Azure Ray is going to have problems dealing with, and they did already by pushing out the waves. You're playing against Spirit Breaker, who one-shots the creep wave with his charge. Zeus, Naga Siren, two Manta-style carriers. Dark Pillow isn't that good, neither is Phoenix, but... Yeah, you have three cores who can constantly shove the waves. And look where the lanes are. They're constantly across yeah. the river. That's disgusting. It's just a pain in the ass to play against. Top tower is under Low right now, looking Radiant's at a Lincoln Sphere. Wanting that additional little bit of protection. He spots Jin Q. Now he sees DY. Radiant's top and what are you die support doing in my drop. hey? Charge in on techies. Another fireplace on the Tian Ming as a nether strike comes out of XXS. Arme is also entering the fight, trying to find a good angle in towards the back lines. Some of the sirens gonna come. DY dives away. Supernova's available here. And BKB up from back means that he could be focused, but he's got Can the dive it. Jumps himself no, away from danger. Connect. Now low, he's got Manta and Infest. Sniper's still peeping from the sideline. He's trying to chip away at Arme on this Naga Siren who still holds the Aegis. Extreme Gaming, they kill off the homing missile and it looks like they've extracted from that situation. Ending up in a one-for-one -one trade with all spells spent. Oh, not too bad of a fight for Azure Ray. Observer War dropped immediately onto high ground. And Lifestealer going for a Manta-style build, so he has a dispel of his own. A little bit of an overlapping there. Spirit Breaker comes in, he gets Yuled with the stun from Florida, so that doesn't connect. He still dies in the end. Definitely needs a BKB. XXS for the next fight uh, might need to have it because he doesn't get multiple charges. He can easily be controlled. I also felt like Extreme Gaming kind of lacking the damage there. Maybe in part due to the fact they didn't get that massive team fight combo off again with a song Supernova. XM's Refresher Orb definitely going to help out in the damage department. DY's <laughs> level 17. Slardar's level 16. How does he do it? Yeah, he's so surviving good. most of these fights. He's the, like one of the last survivors collecting the XP. Still going for Shiva's guard, so that's going to be his tankiness. There's a lot of armor from Nullifier, from that veil. Bach has to deal with Naga illusions again. Dire high ground vision here. Not going to spot the smoke from Azure Ray. Infest into Bach. FY leading out, but the scan is there. Extreme Gaming understands something's coming. And that is not a safe place to be. 
the very least, we've got two minutes left on the Roshan timer. Uh, just Azure Ray here trying to find a team fight to maybe get some vision down in this bottom right part of the map. There's going to be, what, two minutes fast spawn, three minutes until night. So it's, it's going to be a quick Roshan if it's a daytime Rosh. Yeah. Took me a second to realize what you said there. <laughs> uh, I was struggling to get the words out as well. Working with numbers and Roshan moving from Rage into Dire. Long spawn, Rage short spawn. <laughs> Next success. Farming his VKB. Definitely needed. 500 gold away from it. Is there a big item? Butterfly. We did mention Ame. You are playing against all three cores who have physical damage. Maelstrom slash Mjolnir is good against it. The procs, they work, but other things, they don't. I don't expect Slardar to be able to like deal damage. He's also not supposed to focus Nagasarin. That's not his job. At one point in time, didn't Headshot... I mean, Headshot used to be stun to yes. begin with, but Headshot yeah, also it... was piercing, Proctor. right? Yes, you, you couldn't miss. God, imagine, imagine that in this day and age. Attacking high never... ground. 40% yeah, can't, can't miss. 40% accuracy. Oh, yes, accuracy. Good old Rod of Atos used to have accuracy on it. Solar Crest, I think so. Solar Crest well. as well, yeah. Gave you accuracy. Level 20 on the Life Stealer. After finishing off that Lincolns, I love the itemization from Lou in this one compared to the previous game where he kind of struggled. To figure out what's it, what's needed, what's necessary for him to sustain, to be able to deal damage. And again, the same problem for Azure Raid. All the lanes are pushed in. Naga Siren with the illusions. Constantly in your face. Mid lane getting pushed in. XXS has that BKB. There is Butterfly Oname available. Roshan, let's see the spawn. Two minutes, so we'll be on Dire's side. They have two big items. I think it's time to take a fight. Oh, Zeus with the Arcane Rune. Oh, this could be huge. Plus Refresher. Whisper they of the see Dread. It. They see the Gyro make One, a jump. Big two, damage. Refresher gone. orb. Both supports absolutely annihilated. <laughs> and this and then is again. with Arcane Rune, Gary. So we'll have yeah. Refresher in a minute and a half. And in 60 seconds, another ulti. And, yeah, and again, it's just it's not just the middle lane. You know, Ame's here pretending to be an illusion. It's top <laughs> lane being shoved in. Bottom lane's being cut as well by Naga Illusions. Low, you know, trying to deal with this. Difficult challenge to contend with, though, as Azure Ray with both of your supports down. A dive forward onto the sniper as well. Bark and Low trying to defend him. XXS has gone quite deep here, but four staff back Good to safety. Staff. Supernova, can they protect it? No DY, he's down. No saving the egg there, as the Naga Siren getting bonked around a little bit. Sending Illusions back out aggressively, but this has given Azure Ray the chance to respawn, get back into fighting shape, defend this he top tier to chase. two. Chasing XM, XM. In trouble. Oh, the Heavenly Jump down to low ground, and there's no blink here for Bach Nicely to give done. Chase any further. That also gives him enough time, cancelling his blink dagger, trying to TP out. So, yeah, only one that so far on XM. Having a perfect game. Pretty much there is XP rune available. They are giving him all these XP runes. This might be... Like his third, maybe even fourth XP rune that he picked up. So, level 23 on Zeus. <laughs> he, did, he did 6,000 damage with two Thunder Gods rats. Oh, the infest bomb. Finally netting them a kill. XXS dead for 60 seconds. And Roshan is 20 seconds away from respawning. No. Yeah, he does have buyback, but still... They need to try to set up some vision. DY, two observer wards on him. Plants it down immediately. Mission Q is going to clear out a large camp on his way out of that top lane. A little scared of what's lurking around the corner. Roshan goes down so quickly. Slardar level 3 ulti. If they start attacking it right now, you don't have enough time. Like, you might need to use Thunder God's Wrath to try to see what's going on. But even then, just traversing the map is the tall order. Extreme Gaming just going to have to give this one up. Azure Ray with a free Roshan. 
Aegis for the life dealer. Cheese on the slaughter. We're picking up some big items on the way as well. As the sniper now has a satanic. I don't think we've seen too much of this tech, but Ori has been the one being jumped and pummeled, so he needs that extra <laughs> bit of protection and sustain in the fight. Going full, full, like, this is like a, you know, melee, right click, carry. Tank Gardel. With the <laughs> Dragonlance added. Yeah, definitely needs to tank up. Two Zeus ultis brings him down very low, so he needs to pop Satanic. DY didn't manage to get the Radiant ulti off like two, three times in a row. Attack. Like that one near the enemy triangle did go off, but didn't connect onto anything. And a little bit of a extra push. Zeus, he is the one sieging the high ground with Naga Siren Illusion. Somebody needs to deal with this. More illusions it's coming so, out. It's so toxic. Like, again, he's like, oh, you got Roshan. Good job, buddy. Yeah, we're pushing <laughs> your high ground. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you come back and defend against me. Jin Q, he understands that he also needs to scale in this game, so Hand of Midas, 38 minutes just finished. I'm sorry, what did you what did you just say? Yeah, he picked up Hand of Midas. I, I think something that you were mentioning, Naga Siren, she tends to fall off. It doesn't get easy for Naga to play against like three cores. Zeus mm. You know, he deals some of the right click as well with the shard with Manta style, but he also wants to keep the distance. So you think it's the two supports here, Shinkyu and DY, saying, "Hey, we can carry this late. Let's just drag okay. the game out." I mean, look I'm at these items. I bought Nullifier even... first item on a Phoenix. Let's go. Nullifier plus Shivas, compared to Gyrocopter, Four Staff, Yule Scepter. So that all gets nullified by one item from Phoenix. Greaves on Tian Ming. Tian Ming stopped scaling. Like, he was having a, such a good early game. XXS. Turned on. Yule's up. Bark with a BKB. Tian Ming, though, being run out by the Naga Siren on the left hand side of the fight. They assassinate. Flew quickly into the Spirit Breaker, but he stays alive. As Arme is going to sing song it up. And probably TP out of here. Assassinate is coming though, so a little bit awkward. Can't go for it straight away. Now retreating alongside the rest of his team. Now, oh, your Ray, don't step too far forward. You've got Terrorize and Charge and XXS for the BKB to contend with. They've blown up the Slaughter. Bach has buyback. Oh, this egg. Oh, he's going to turn to try and deal with the egg. The Supernova protected. Age is down and low surrounded. Bach, he does return with a buyback to try and get into this fight again. But they Azure need to get Ray, something uh, out of it, but they can't. The can. damage was dealt already. That's so big. Nullifier again on top of him. Loses his movement speed immediately. He starts to get attacked and the Spirit Breaker. Like, this happens so many times. Bot goes in. Nullifier, charge, into ulti. Dead immediately. And Zeus showing, like, Ori was thinking about attacking the egg. And then, like, okay, see if I'm not going to do it. Concussive grenade runs away. Well, these team fights are just so difficult. If... if Azure Ray aren't getting that immediate jump, right? With the infest bomb, the slaughter, blowing someone up, getting numbers advantage. It is so difficult with so many reset tools out of extreme gaming here. It's time to God's Wrath to give vision to begin with. Supernova terrorize. This spirit breaker. I didn't have a good read, and I honestly didn't trust that pick from Extreme Gaming, but XXS has looked pretty tremendous on this spirit breaker outside of the laning phase. I mean, a lot of the times you'll see XXS get sacrificed in the lane. They don't pick his hero to, like, win the lane when a lot of his heroes get targeted. But he gets the most out of it. I think he's one of the best players in the world right now to make a comeback after a bad mm. laning stage. For sure. Yeah. Fully agree with that. Yeah, just look at the map. I mean, it speaks for itself, right? Look at the, look at the pink dots. As DY does die on the enemy side of the river. Every little advantage that Azure Ray gets is on their doorstep, which just reeks of desperation. Hex picked up by Naga Siren, so it doesn't go for like another scaling item. This doesn't provide you with any stats. It's no no strength, no agi. Give you that intelligence instead. Uh Disperser, also very good item if he wants to pick it up. For now, it's going to be Boots of Travel. Not sure mm -hmm. what he gets rid of as his item. 
Yeah, not too sure. I mean, like, maybe just put the bots in backpack and then you have your the sixth slot. You swap out for the boots of travel. Yeah, most likely. Or Man Manta Star, like Manta Star loses effectiveness the later and later you go. I guess less so on a Naga than other heroes, but still maybe an item that you could swap in and out. I don't think he'd want to sell any of these items to replace them, but we no, do the definitely old, you know, not. Eternal Envy, you just swap, swap, you, swap things in and out. You're getting value from Manta Style. You can put it in. Again, push out those waves. Look at the towers. Tier 1 tower, Tier 3 tower mid, 800 HP. Bottom one, 400. Yeah. MKB is up now for the sniper, though. Ori finally having a response to this butterfly of the Naga. A life stealer. What's he done? He's disassembled the Radiance into Nullifier, holding the Talisman. And Infest jumping out of the Slardar onto Phoenix and Naga. Going Supernova the Song. But they've got Rage and BKB. The song's going to come down as the oh, Eggland is perfectly whoa. executed from Extreme Gaming. Oh, it's just gorgeous, isn't it? Now Tianming and FY, the next one's on the menu. Extreme Hungry. As they come out on that map. Oh, man, I was saying if Azure, they get the jump, they can look good. But they need everyone there. You can't be they going do. just two men. They need Sniper. He needs to peep the egg if they want to focus it down. This time around, it was low, alone doing it, and Song plus <laughs> egg combo. He's he's not 25 yet, doesn't have that rage duration talent. Maybe with it, he would be able to kill the egg, but yeah, unfortunately, doesn't have it. XXS, thinking about going in with the Nether Strike. If he can find yeah. Ori, Hex also available. Things are looking pretty grim right now. No buyback on your carry. And mid lane is also being pushed in. Easy breezy for extreme gaming here with no buyback on the life stealer. And yeah, the spirit breaker with BKB Lincoln's playing a pocket, offering protection to himself and his team as he stands by them. We're looking at the second lane of barracks in the mid lane. Extreme sun ray to heal everybody up, keep the creeps, the illusions, and the heroes all topped up in fighting shape. As Azure Ray trying to poke with the blink slardar. The Damage from the sniper was pretty tremendous on that Naga Siren, honestly. An assassinate shot. That's not going to fly too far. This team is so good at disengaging the fights without losing anyone. This happened so many times in this game. Maybe like losing one previous fight also with the buyback from Bach. They didn't catch anybody. And playing it to Zeus, like seeing the trade that they did two times in a row, picking up Zeus over the sniper, does feel really good. That does feel better, I would say. Because you have something against the Sniper with this Refresher build. You are showing exactly where he is with double Nimby. You can control where you're taking the fights. It's kind of hard to enter the fight when you're already down to half HP. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> like you're infesting defensively when you'd love to you know, be infesting aggressively. You're trying to heal people up and keep them alive. And you're popping Greaves and whatever very early on in the fight. Dark, dark times for Azure Ray here. In game two, don't forget, we're in the lower bracket. This is elimination time. A single victory, potentially a single team fight, separates Extreme Gaming from the grand finals. As they'll find Tian Meng, a single pick off down in that bottom outer ring of jungle camps, and he's dead for 70 seconds. Unfortunately for Azure Ray, top tier two still exists. That is up there protecting the base from the onslaught that is sure to come. Roshan has already respawned. A pretty quick one, I believe. 30 seconds or so was on the timer. As the big man returns to his cave. Yeah. Fabian having a pretty rough game. Like, he's unable to get those jumps. Uh, they don't have the vision. He's playing against Sniper. He's playing against Zeus, sorry. So, Blank Dagger gets cancelled a lot of the times. If they don't have that initial jump, he's going to really struggle. Ooh. And also, Nullifier, Ooh. it ruined him. Plus, Spirit Breaker. He jumps in, he's immediately dead. This Ori, uh-oh. This could be it. If they find them here, Low managed to slip right past them. Looks like Ori's going to be okay as well. Buyback status now, vitally important though. Lifestealer has no buyback anymore. He's bought out. So no sniper, Lifestealer, no anybody in fact. Radiant have no buybacks whatsoever. So they are all in on this, on this next team fight. Which surely should come around the Roche pit. But it looks like Low just... Trying to deal with the creep waves coming in. Can't join the rest of his team as they raise themselves. Well, this Third Roshan, dire side. Getting Aghanim's Scepter. 
Let's see who's gonna pick it up. Maybe give it to Dark Willow. Zeus already has one. Naga Siren Shoot. doesn't really... I don't know if he <laughs> needs it. Look at the Aegis. Uh, okay, so Spirit Breaker got it. And... Aegis for Dark Willow. I wanted to give Dark Hell Willow yeah. Aghanim Scepter, but... Yeah, Hand of Midas kicking in. Now Cheese also passed the Spirit Breaker, so you will have reduced cooldown on charge and also BKB piercing tools, so... Another one. Things are getting out of control right now. 34k lead. And they really have... They really have done an incredible job here. Unlocking our mate. He's pretty slotted right now. Looks like he's aiming for a refresher orb next on this Naga Siren as a, another item to have in his backpack. Now, it, it can be said, you know, one final end of barracks can be difficult to push because it is just one place to defend from your opponents. But when you've got the vision and the damage to do things like that, FY's dead with no buyback, don't forget. You're in a 5v4. There's Aegis, there's Cheese. Life still trying to defeat the Naga Illusions. Terrorize, charge, back with the charge back in. The crush will hold them away. I just don't see how they can do it. They're being poked and prodded away from their tier three. It's being killed off by Naga Siren and her illusions. That's difficult. XXS, another charge into the back lines. Low moves forward, runs back. Never struck, Nimbus, damage with the E blade, another Nimbus, and that's him dead. No buyback for your life stealer and Azure Ray. They are out of this one. No core heroes to speak of. I mean, Ori is BKB, the sniper. He can try and do what he can, but your Slardar is just being battered around and forced back to Fountain. XM with a double kill. Azure Ray cowering in their Fountain for protection and calling the GG. Extreme Gaming brought the heat this series. Improvement on top of improvement through the group stage into the playoffs. And honestly, a scary prospect heading into that grand finals. Falcons might have an opponent that can actually face off against them. Yeah, this is also 2-0. This has been the best tournament I've seen Extreme Gaming play at. And I believe this is the furthest they, they got into so far. This team is just very, very good. Like I think coming into the next one, coming into the grand finals, they will need to pick something that relies more on the early stages of the game because Falcons are heavily invested in the... Like, laning stage, they haven't, like, they lost. They met three times so far in 2024 at Betboom Dacha, Dubai. They lost 2-0. Uh, Falcons beat them in Dream League, second group stage 2-0. And at the Elite League here, they also beat them 2-0. So, doesn't look too good for Extreme Gaming. This is a team that is super versatile, so I want to see how they're going to approach it. This one, again, XM, Ame, pretty much everybody owned. Uh, DY with some, like, 15 20 minute nullifier on phoenix completely ruined yeah. Fox game <laughs> absolutely incredible yeah it's d a different beast for sure you know here we have china versus china they've obviously you know, know each other inside and out that draft very similar from game one to game two with the zeus and sniper back and forth i guess falcons there's a lot more to contend with a lot more you know picks and bans and the mentality heading into it that you've got to cover as that will be the final series of the day but before that we can head back to nat and the panel to break down this series Thank you so much, Gareth and Lacoste. Always a pleasure to hear those two casting. And it was such a good game number two, if you're an XG fan. If you're an Azure fan, on the other hand, though, it was a bit heartbreaking. You know, they go for that trade again with the uh, Sniper over the Zeus, even though they had first pick. But they pick up a couple more carries for themselves that looked like they were promising that they were going to be able to help with the lane, snowball out of it, and keep that momentum that they didn't have in game number one. But this slaughter was nowhere near impactful in the hands of Azure as it was on the side of XG. And uh, what would you say was the biggest reason for that one, Dan? I'll I think you just, they were a little bit hesitant to make plays just because you always were going up against this uh, Naga plus the Zeus who went in really early Aghanim Shard. So lanes were constantly being pushed out and it means that a lot of your rotations become a lot more obvious, right? When you're trying to find that smoke into a Blink Crush and even when they were able to find them, you just see here, that's the reveal of DY with his nullifier onto the Slada. That was a 21 minute Phoenix nullifier. So Slada's impact in these team fights was just so minimal. Yeah, I, I want to have a conversation around Manta style a little bit here with you, Winter, because over the last few days, and I mean, even today, right, it's been quite prevalent in the two games that we've watched. 
people picking it up on heroes that maybe traditionally haven't always gone for the Manta style, heroes that have better item progression than going for the Manta as their second item, and I mean, Life still ends up picking it up for himself, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad pick for himself, but do you think that that could have been a big change in pace if it had have been a different item? Uh, uh, if I don't go Manta, I'm probably going SMY this game. I, I felt like the Manta was okay because he was kind of anticipating the early Orchid from Army. I think mm -hmm. this time it's okay in this scenario. I think uh, it has its uh, place in the game. It's more about like uh, what Matt said, you know, they, they can't really find a timing in the game to play together. They got off a pretty good start in the early game. The the Slada, the Lifestealer, the Sniper, they were having a good time, but they just couldn't really keep like the ball rolling, you know. Once you get to mid late game when the Zeus keeps farming and the Naga keeps shuffling your lane. And especially the Spray Breaker, when you get to that portion of the game, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and you don't do enough uh, building damage already, you don't take at least one lane of Rex, you're gonna have a uh, problems in the late game, like Sada against Spirit Breaker, and on top of that, the Nullifier seems like a, a clowny item, but it kind of made uh, the Sada useless in uh, in the first couple of engagements. And yeah, I was, I was wondering when we were going to bring that one up. Sorry, Dan, I need to talk about it. Oh, I was just going to say, like, you were saying towards the end of the game, like, where are these Aeon Discs on the SRA support? Yeah. Like, bro, they got a Nullifier, there's nothing you could even do against this. It, it you know, seemed a little memey, but yeah, it just worked out incredibly well for them. No, it's so true, you know, as a support, one of your saving graces at times is a Ghost Scepter, an Aeon Disc, and a Yules, and you can't really go Ghost with the magic build um, on, on Zeus or the potential for Even that, and then, and then and then you're just going to get nullified if you get an Aeon Disc or a Yules, so you're like, okay, what exactly can I do other than just sit here, be charged by Spirit Breaker, and give Zeus the vision that he so clearly needs to just be able to snipe me from halfway across the map. Mm. It was a rough one. Um, the support's having yeah a really tough time on the side of Azure, but not to dwell too much on that. Big positives for Extreme Gaming is getting this 2-0. Not only is it going to give them a little bit of extra time before they uh, have to go up against Falcons, but instills a lot more confidence, I feel, in yourself, Danog, to be mm. able to come in and very confidently take a 2-0. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think Falcons are going to let them have the Zeus in particular. I feel like that's something mm -hmm. that is just an XM specialty as well. So in addition to it just being, uh, you know, some, somewhat of that counter to the sniper, not for the lane, but for the game, uh, it's just, again, something that he's so comfortable with. Uh, I'm just having a look at back at some of these item builds as well yep. for Azure. I mean, I really wanted to see Lo get a BKB. I understand going man to BKB can be kind of like, uh, they kind of do the same sort of thing just to be able to mm -hmm. dodge out the Orchid, but he took uh, 62,000 magic damage, by far more than anyone else in his team, just because he was constantly worried about the Phoenix, the Willow, the, the Zeus in particular. So uh, I feel like he even went a Boots of Travel too. Now, I'm not sure if that was just to give himself a little bit of extra movement speed, so he wasn't being kited around as much in fights, so that he could actually try and lock onto the Zeus, or maybe even tried something crazy like Boots of Traveling onto Slada as he's trying to make that jump in while still having Infest, but it just... It felt like it made his game a little bit too difficult not having that BKB, you know? Yeah, and by the time that he was ready to kind of get it for himself, he's not really getting the farm that he needs. He's not being able to get it in time. So, look, we could sit here, we could nitpick it apart all we want, have the hindsight that we have for that game number two. Um, I do want to look forward, though, towards what XG does have to face. That's Falcons. We're not going to touch too much on it, but Winter, I do want to hear from you about what XG can take away from this and what are going to be their strengths when they do have to play it again later today in the grand final. I'm not sure if they can take away anything from this series because okay. the, the next game is going to be completely different. They are a totally different base, you know, Falcons. They, are, they put so much emphasis on the lanes and mm -hmm. they're going to play very, very quickly. It's very different from playing a, a fellow Chinese team, you know, for extreme gaming. So they have to be prepared for the lanes. The last time they met in the winner's bracket, it, it, I think two games ended really quickly. The first game was like kind of over at 10 minutes. I mean, the game kind of dragged yeah. out, yeah. but they got dumpstered like across all three lanes, you know, so they have to find solutions to deal with the, the laning phase of uh, Falcons. If they don't play the lane, they won't be able to play the game. Yeah, I thought you would have been like, oh, you know, it's okay. The fact that they lost some lanes in, in this series and they were still able to come out on top. I thought that was going to be the confidence builder you're going to give them. But Winter's hitting them with the hard reality is it's not going to be the same when they do come up against Falcons. And this is it. Day number three. This is going to be our final series coming up later today of... Uh, top eight teams exactly how they've been able to take the upper bracket run 
continue their lower bracket run. I mean, Extreme Gaming, they uh, fell down the first round of the upper bracket, and they've done well. They knocked out Quest, they knocked out Liquid, now they had to knock out their brothers over in Azure, and uh, yeah, last hurdle for themselves, Danog, is Team Falcons. Yeah, that's right. I think they will take a lot of confidence, though, from that previous series. Not game one, like Winter said, like they got absolutely <laughs> crushed in that one. But game two, they had taken tier four towers. You know, they were 16k up just like 28 minutes in. They were taking multiple mm -hmm. lanes of racks and they just kind of threw it away. It was a, a big effort, particularly on the back of Melreen, to be able to bring that one back. And the thing that I've really liked about Extreme Gaming throughout this tournament is that they haven't just gone their one style, their sit back and farm. You know, they are capable of actually putting themselves into another gear and being able to you know, push the tempo a little bit more not pigeonholing themselves just into one style of draft so I'm keen to see how much they've learned from their rematch obviously this might not have been the best warm-up for them but definitely yeah. the liquid series might have been that little bit of a boost that they could have needed just to get the Western European style back in their brain uh, we always have that debate, you know, is playing more and going on the lower bracket to your advantage. You kind of come up against different opponents. You're able to test out a lot of different things for yourself. The other side is that gives, uh, you know, your future opponents more of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the advantage? Information? Yeah. Uh, whatever. <laughs> We'll say with Donald's word, it sounded better, you know? Um, so it's going to be tough for them. Uh, schedule did come up on our screen as well. This is a not before. So our series will not be starting any earlier than the time you saw there. It was 6 p.m. CEST. So you guys can go ahead and, I don't know, squeeze in a game of Dota if you're really good, if you think you can push high ground at 16 and a half minutes like XG have done in the past up against Falcons. But unfortunately, we won't be having an interview from XG. They're going to have to rest up. They're going to put their brains together and do what they can to be able to come up against falcons but for now uh danog any last words because we're gonna be we're gonna be heading off it's gonna be a new panel that comes in new panel new casters yeah it's been a great elite league right it's been two weeks of just this tournament qualifiers even before that so i'm loving all this dota love the swiss stage and uh, i love yeah. seeing china back up at the very top there although it's gonna be rough trying to take out these juggernauts and falcons loved loved it so far i'm so so happy to see you sniper <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought you were going to say you're really happy for Spirit Break. You know, now we have to be worried for our pubs again. Ah, uh, don't worry. Spirit Breaker won't be back. This is just one game. That one game of 1,000 game or 100 game that you might see the hero. <laughs> and he's going to be back to his slumber in his cave. He can rest easy, our sweet little prince over there in Spirit Breaker. But for now, guys, we're going to head out when we do come back. New panel, new casters, and a new best of five in the grand finals here at Elite League.
Ladies and gentlemen, Dota 2 Twitch chatters, Dota 2 enthusiasts from all across the world, welcome to the Grand Finals of the Elite League. It has been two long weeks of some incredible Dota and these two, two weeks have given us two of the best teams of the Elite League. We have Team Extreme Gaming and Team Falcons of course waiting for us in our upcoming series, two teams that definitely to definitely deserve to be where they are right now specifically after the lower bracket finals with me two incredible talents Trent and Vaga did you guys did you guys uh watch the lower bracket finals of course you have but did you assume that it's going to be another 2-0 I didn't think it was going to be a 2-0 but I did have a feeling extreme gaming were probably going to be the victors just by what we saw you know yesterday towards the end when we saw them play I was hyped I told you I'm on board the extreme gaming train 
Um, but yeah, 2-0, impressive. That's what we want to see, though. A lower bracket, strong finalist coming into the Grand Finals, maybe to challenge Falcons here. Yeah, I don't want them, like, middling through this lower bracket final, like, barely squeaking it in. That, that's not the kind of energy we need right now because, you know, they, they've defeated one team, but now it, it is Goliath right now. It is Falcons. They've been winning everything. They seem bored, honestly, you know? They're talking <laughs> about... So it's kind of eh, a little easy lately. So I'm, I'm expecting Extreme to take that energy from that lower bracket final and slam it into Falcons and hopefully give us a good best of five. Mm, I hope we get that momentum because, like you just said, we've actually talked to some of uh, Team Falcons players before. And uh, what was it? What did they say? It was a little bit easy the last couple of tournaments for them. Not even, not even only this one, but the last couple of tournaments have been easy. And I see the Twitch chat. I see what people want. They want some old chatters to maybe see a defeat here and there but first and foremost of course to get there you need to deserve it and let's see how these two teams did get here in the first place at the beginning we had a swiss stage 16 teams eight teams fell off immediately and um, maybe some pretty big organizations that some teams expected to drop out some some uh, people expected them to drop out some didn't we've seen enigma and secret get out very quickly here but we also did see a, an improvement in team secret and team enigma something that's been um a question for quite some time after that of course the teams that did go through the swiss stage they had to face out the, the invitees the eight teams that were invited to the group stage and i believe only two by the way this was this was a round robin format with the best of two game series only two teams out of all the Swiss stage teams uh, managed to go, go through the group stage. So I believe that was PSG Quest and an additional team, Tundra, of course. Yeah, so yeah. only those two. And of course, those two are not here with us any longer. On the screen, you can see the Swiss stage standing. Um, anything that surprised you in the Swiss stage, guys, or is it pretty much as expected? I mean, I, I would say that the Swiss stage, you know, you could maybe have made a, a case for some of the teams that did go out that, oh, maybe they could have uh, gone further. But it's also a danger, you know, it's a quick elimination format. You are going up against teams that maybe you match well against, maybe not. You have to be ready for anything. Um, mm -hmm. So ultimately, you know, we, we saw a lot of teams eliminate early that probably had way bigger dreams, uh, hopes and dreams. For me, Talon was one that I thought, you know, would make it through. Uh, but yeah, they had a, a rough time as well there. I think uh, we talked about them a little bit before, but Heroic, I thought, played really well during this stage and then um, mm -hmm. obviously making it forward after two into the next round, Robin. So that, that was definitely a standout team. But uh, likewise, you know, Nouns, I think, a bit disappointing. Down near the bottom, uh, NA's other hope, not able to, uh, to clutch it out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the NA, the flag bearer, didn't really make it through. We had uh, some other teams, of course, in the Group A and Group B. We had the invitees, uh, PSG Quest and Tundra in Group A and Group B, the only one that actually managed to go through the groups when it comes to those teams uh, from the Swiss stage. But besides them, Team Falcons, Azure, of course, Team Falcons that we will see in the Grand Finals, Azure that have just lost the lower bracket finals to Extreme Gaming, who came out second in Group B. Any of these teams that got eliminated in the group stage that are maybe a surprise for you guys? For me personally, um, Team Spirit who looked, in, okay, not in the best shape. It's off TI season for them, so they're not looking the greatest, but maybe I didn't expect them to drop out in groups. And the second team for me definitely, uh, this one was a Wild Horse, but heroic, because they looked incredible in their opening series, and then it just was a downfall afterwards. Yeah, I think also like two teams that I, you know, they were very, very close, both of them, both OG and Betboom were just right on the cusp there with their 7-7 seven, seven score, just not quite enough to pull them through. I think both those teams definitely had, mm -hmm. you know, potential and bigger hopes than getting eliminated here in the groups. Very competitive group stage, uh, you know, that every single match mattered so much uh, due to the level of competition here. Yeah, it was really nice. Like, even to the very last day, there were all these potential tiebreaker scenarios, especially in Group A, which uh, we did wind up having some tiebreakers. But it was, like, before the final day, we, we hadn't even, like, fully eliminated everyone that we were going to be missing and stuff. So uh, it was a really impressive group stage for sure. And then, of course, as you can see at the top there, I mean, uh, they were right. The results were correct, right? That's our top four who came top two and top two. So uh, successful teams in the group stage went to be successful teams in the bracket. 
Yeah, sometimes we see uh, teams drop the ball a little bit in the group stage and then in the playoffs they make it up for it. Not the case here, uh, right Vaga? The teams that have won have been looking as strong after the group stage. Yeah, I mean, they they both, you know, both the teams that fell out from the upper bracket here, we see Extreme Gaming and Team Liquid falling down immediately. They just went on a tear uh, immediately and took 2-0, 2-0 in the lower bracket. Of course, Extreme Gaming just barely managing to uh, take down Liquid and then going on to, I want to say quite easily, bring down Azure in the final, uh, in the lower bracket final that we just had played out. Yeah, I'd say it. It, looked, it looked like they had kind of solved a lot of their problems. Uh, I think that was our biggest takeaway as well. Just yesterday when they were playing versus Liquid was that those drafts just felt better. It felt like they were finding more flexibility. It felt like they were finding more potential uses of their supports, uh, more in like in tune with this idea of rotating these supports to cores and making something happen early. Like We've seen them be successful when they're really passive, when they do their shouting with Phoenix. It, it's scary, but sometimes it does work out for them. But I think that they're trying to make it uh, a little bit more... Like, let's actually make some moves here. Yeah, definitely. Like, something that you guys had uh, questioned in the upper bracket semifinals when Extreme Gaming have already met Team Fal Falcons, uh, you questioned their ability to adapt with the drafts, right? Like, the drafts are either a little bit too, um, how to put it, too obvious, too transparent, right? Like, they, they pick heroes and you instantly know where they're going. Have they managed to, uh, they managed to sort that out, right? Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I think they, yeah, definitely. They had us guessing in the in the later series. You know, looking at where, uh, you know, in their game against Liquid, they were pretty flexible with how they drafted. Like, where's the Bloodseeker going and stuff like that. We were still questioning it even in quite late into stage, and uh, you know that allowed them to get better setup. I think that's going to be important here because. Like going up against Falcons, the most concerning thing for me for Extreme Gaming here is survive the first 10 minutes without huge drawbacks. Last time we saw them go against each other, they ended up having this long lane Viper against the Weaver. It was a nightmare of a lane. It was not a good time. Um, and a lot of that comes down to, you know, how they drafted back then, which is very obvious. Now we see them switching it up a little bit, which is refreshing. Yeah, but there is still time to talk about the drafts, you know, like we can talk about the heroes all we want, but tell me about this momentum coming into the Grand Finals, because Extreme Gaming and Azure, they're head-to-head, -head, they're an interesting one, they've been an interesting series, there have been wins on both sides in the past, and uh, one takeaway that you guys had before was Azure are more stable, but Extreme Gaming have a higher ceiling, and you'd rather see Extreme Gaming... Um, in the Grand Finals. Do you think that this 2-0 brings the momentum to the Grand Finals for them? Oh yeah, yeah, it's way better than, you know, you don't want to be all tired and drawn out. I mean, there, there is definitely a disadvantage, even though we, we used to have this idea of like, is it really that bad for the lower bracket team? Because they seem to come in all warmed up. It and, is a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a history of them actually doing really well. I think as long as you're preparing well and you're a team like Falcons, I think you still beat that advantage. Like you're warmed up, you're getting to watch this team play. Dota is mentally exhausting. We all know that from us playing it and these guys are playing at the highest level. So momentum is really good for sure. Uh, it, it's, that's mm -hmm. why I'd say it's even more important to have that 2-0 because you really don't want to be dragged into this like really exhausting three game series and then go face Falcons. Mm. This is your best case scenario for being lower bracket. I think for XG. I see. So, so it's not really the momentum. It's just the fact that they played less. Yeah, the you're games warmed were up. Quick, it's like so they have more amount, energy. You know. I see. Yeah. I see. I mean, I, that plays see, into this grand finals because if this goes the distance, if it goes a five-game series, you know, if that yeah. was to happen, then you're happy that you had a two-game series before and not a three-game. You know, it, it's a long time to be sitting there and at the absolute peak of your attention span. You know, really focusing. So yeah, I think it's important for Extreme the way they got into this. Uh, I think for Falcons, on the other hand, you know. From the interviews and from what we've heard from them, their biggest enemy might be, you know, themselves or the biggest thing they have to look out for is that they said, yeah, it's been, you know, kind of easy. You know, they have to not get complacent, and not underestimate and stay sharp here going into this because Extreme Gaming, they're a different team than last Falcons played against them. It was just, you know, two days ago that they last faced off. But I think Extreme have improved since then. Yeah, definitely. What do you think uh, was the biggest improvement? Is it the support duo being a little bit more active or is it uh, just the flexibility in the drafts coming back to the story uh, we talked about previously? And do you think that Team Falcons have improved as well through the upper brackets? Because uh, they haven't truly been tested. They won 2-0 versus Extreme <laughs> Gaming and 2-0 versus Azure. One of these guys in the middle as well, he had a little bit of old chat going on versus Extreme Gaming. So... Um, <laughs> 
we have a little bit of spice, right, coming into yeah, the grand finals. Yeah. I, I do think it's hard to judge Falcons in terms of their improvement for sure, but they've done a few things that, you know, we've commented on, be like, oh, like the, the Amar Pango, you know? They, he played a little bit earlier, but that was still just his fourth Pango game ever, so that is something that they're bringing that's new, even though they're not really being tested or pressured. They're still trying to adapt and trying to evolve their own drafting to make sure that they're not getting complacent, to make sure teams can't try and mm -hmm. figure them out, because teams have been trying. They've tried to say, you know, do we ban the Razor, do we ban the DK, or do we ban the Timber? You know, this was this big question they had, and you still have to worry about those other broken heroes now. Um, the Chen's still there, the Disruptors, this really big one that's been shown to be extremely powerful, and now Sniper's kind of peeking out, like, at some point, is, is Falcons just going to bring out a Sniper? It's not really something they're known for. Uh, that, that's also a possibility. Yeah, I'm actually very uh, glad that you mentioned the Pango there because I think for Falcons, you know, I was looking a little bit at how the teams have been drafting, what they're doing. And I think the one change we might see from Falcons going into this series here from last time they played against Extreme is maybe they won't ban that Pango. They were the ones to ban it first phase uh, twice in a row against Extreme Gaming. But then they also went on to have great success with their Pango offlane, showing the flexibility of it themselves. So maybe Falcons will change it up a little bit and that will, you know, change the dynamic of the draft uh, a little bit that perhaps Extreme will not be ready for. Whereas Extreme... Mm -hmm. I think their draft is probably going to be pretty similar. I think they don't want to play against Chen because the tempo. They don't want to play against Dragonite because of the tempo. Uh, and, you know, but they have those passive supports, so they don't want to get steamrolled on the map. And uh, that's also... Maybe we'll see some change, but yeah, we'll see. It, it's like the best part of a best of five, right? Is that like, the game one tends to be pretty weird in a best of five, I feel like. Like, it's oftentimes some team will take kind of a risk because it's a best of five. We got time in case things don't go the way you want it to. You can try to sort something out. So you might see a hero let through. Like maybe Chen just gets ignored. That, that kind of stuff has happened before in best of fives. <laughs> Ooh. Play, played a lot against a lot of Chen. And I don't know if I le ever let that go through. But uh, maybe. Maybe in the best of five still. This is the matchup between these two teams. Head to head. Bad Bundacha, of course, 0-2 for Falcons Dream League 22 Stage 2. Also 2-0 by Falcons. And Elite League Playoffs 2-0 by Falcons. Now, yeah, Ami, mean, there, just, <laughs> yeah. his, his hands, what, these, these, this is the what can you do, bro. <laughs> you know, it that's is. The, that's the emo right there. But uh, is there maybe, let me paint a story here, like Extreme Gaming and Azure, of course, already in the lower bracket finals, that's our uh, third and second team of the tournament. It's still amazing, by the way. And Chinese teams, this is something that we've been waiting for from the region it's so impressive to see the region finally stepping it up and seeing them in the grand finals it's always nice to see a lot of chinese teams out there but with all these wins from falcons is there maybe a world a chance in which they drop the ball and like trent said maybe risk it a little bit more and let some heroes go through yeah i i honestly <laughs> i honestly think that falcons they're probably uh you know they're they're, they have no reason to change too much since what they've been doing has worked six times in a row against Extreme. Um, <laughs> but we'll see. We're actually, you know, we're we're getting into the draft now. The game has started. Six so. times you can get us, but the seventh time. Yeah. Uh, look at this, though. It is a bit of change here going on. As uh, we see, I guess the, the first pick this time is actually for Extreme Gaming, whereas last time they played, Falcons had first pick both times in a row. So now we see Falcons instead being the ones to ban out the Chen due to the first mm -hmm. pick on Extreme. Yeah, Extreme have been yeah, favoring definitely. that uh, second pick quite a bit. So now yeah, they're going to be Radiant and first pick. So I guess uh, happy times for them. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely doesn't a little tend bit to... different. Part of the problem, though, I guess, is that... Uh, I mean, I guess it depends if you're first or second pick, but... The, the flexibility works both ways. Like, if you're really good uh, at your flexible heroes and you have these multiple roles, when you're last pick, it means that you can get this, like, really good matchup. Uh, and this idea of just, like, ah, we can move things around to make sure that there's some lane that we can target really hard with this last pick or, like, some concept that the other team no longer has a chance to counter. But it's also important when you're first pick that you have this flexibility because you don't want to get cornered somewhere. So... It, uh, it is a, I mean, that's just why we talk about flexibility in the draft and why it's so important right now, because no matter where you're starting in the draft, it's, it's very easy to mm. just kind of get blindsided if you don't have that flexibility. Yeah. One hero oh, wow. that hates being cornered by something like a Bloodseeker is a Pangolier. And so far, Bloodseeker untouched by Team Falcons. Um, if you are extreme gaming, uh, do you pick it up here or do you ban it out? What's going to... By the way, it's... Phoenix... Mm -hmm. 
Please buy yeah, it. I think it yeah, I think it's extremely likely they will go for the Pango here, but they're actually going to ban it themselves and instead go mm. for the Disruptor. Classic first pick as well. And yeah, the Phoenix target ban here by uh, Falcons. They, they've they seen Extreme. They've just been playing this Phoenix over and over and over. Say, you know what? Do something else. <laughs> Play anything else. I mean, yeah, that's definitely has been banned. his best one, right? Like, mm -hmm. he, he rushed an Nullfire again. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he didn't rush it the last time he did Atos first, but the Nullifier is pretty clutch when you're winning like that because all these ideas of, like, how to salvage a bad game all get countered by Nullifier, and core players don't want to buy it anymore because it's not as cool and as helpful on them. So it's this weird item where you really got to commit as a support to get it. But at the same time, you're like, why don't I just, like, go Scythe? So I do think it's a hard one to, like, fit into builds. Yeah, yeah. And I think is... Phoenix is a rare hero that can take it because he has so much HP. The armor is actually really good on him as support. And he basically survives in most fights anyway, right? Like, all you have to do is pop your egg as long as there are no silences. Um, and it's also one of those heroes that can buy anything, I feel like. It's, it's literally one of those utility-based heroes. Anything you buy on him, as long as it's um, useful in the game, will be all right. Um, Nullifier being one of those items. But... Uh, Talk to me about this. Razor by Falcons, absolutely no surprise. Um, will they have the right answers for him? Because so far, Sniper banned out. Morphling usually is the next one that Team Falcons bans out against the Razor. Uh, do, you, do you foresee these heroes going out or maybe something else from Extreme Gaming that we have seen? Was it Amara who said he doesn't care about that matchup? About the Morphling? He's like, I don't think it's like bad something or something. Yeah, he's like, I don't think it's mm -hmm. bad. I think it's fine. I, it's not a counter or something. Like, I, that was one of his discussions. But you're right. I mean, they have banned it uh, other times as well. So, uh, versus Ame, I mean, I'm, I might let it fly. I don't know if I'm that worried about the Ame morph. No offense, Ame. That not really his his most well known hero. I wouldn't think as of late, at least. Damn. Some back shade. in the day. Back in the day. Yeah, obviously, back, back you know, he he had one famous, particular yeah. game. <laughs> That yeah. many people might they, remember. So they did lose and drop one game in the group stage to Team Spirit. And Team Spirit actually played Weaver against the Razor. So maybe something... Actually, no, it was it was them that played Weaver into the Razor. My bad. Um, Team Spirit won with the Sniper Void combo into their Razor. That's what they yeah. played. Exactly. That was the... We talked about previously a time. And we haven't seen Falcons ban out the Void yet here. It's still available, and Void definitely a nice option. So yeah, they're going to get rid of it last here on their uh, fifth ban, preventing that mm -hmm. combo. Void also would work really well with Disruptor. You get all these big control spells, it's really hard to play into. Um, so they protect their Eraser that way. Of course, the Sniper's already gone as well, so no potential for that combo. Yeah, and when we see the Razor here from Team Falcons, you can't really put a finger on which kind of a draft it's going to be right for them because it's super flexible when it comes to the next four heroes that will be picked with him, right? Yeah, you just don't know it what is. they're going to do. And even here, like they are still maintaining some semblance of flexibility. Obviously, we all assume it's going to be crit, but uh, you can say the same thing with the Pango where, you know, that was his fourth Pango game ever on Amar. And the whole time we're like, yeah, it could be Amar, but it's probably going to be Malreen, you know? Maybe Malreen's working on the Earth Spirit. I don't know, but it's probably wow. going to be for crit. I think the difference is, you know, how much people have played it overall. Because Amar is still a Pango spammer outside of Pro uh, Dota as well. Like, he's super high level on it. I can't remember if he's Master or Grandmaster. But, uh, you know, whereas Earth Spirit, I don't think any of these players are big spammers or Earth Spirit. So, this is going to be crit. Let's not kid ourselves. The fish is back. A lot of Slardar at the end of this playoffs, it feels like. Extreme uh, taking a win versus Liquid yesterday with it. And they're going to get a nice friend here. So... This is pretty solid for support duo compared to some of the other pairings we've seen from uh, XG in the past. You know, definitely some ideas of aggression here, and you have a good save once you have the shard on the Grimstroke too. Just need that little bit of coordination, but uh, I like this more than some of their uh, other duos. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's a nice nice uh, synergy. They have a lot of good spells now to operate with, and also a pretty good hero to just uh, protect someone when they get jumped by Earth Spirit. If you get the shard on Grimstroke, you can dispel them as well. Get rid of you know <laughs> silence, magnetize, bunch of stuff. Speaking mm -hmm. of dispel, yeah, I guess the Slardar, the sprint, yeah, and the uh, Inkswell as well. You can like insta pop it. Yeah, one of the nice things about having enchanters here. Um, 
It also opens up a lot of carries, right? It's a troll that we have seen into the Slardar yesterday, and it owned him. Is that maybe an option for Falcons? Is it something that you'd like to see on Skitter? I think it's very likely that we'll see that since the the mischance is really horrible to play into as a Slardar. And I, I guess Troll is pretty fine against the other two. I do think the supports are not bad against Troll though. You have Glimpse to kind of control him, the the kinetic field to stop him running at people, and the bind can even be great in, mm -hmm. a, in a pinch. But yeah, just because of the lane matchup, it would be really hard to play Slardar into Eng plus Troll. Yep. Yeah, there's not many actually... other carries you think of. Mm. You know, it's like the illusion heroes, I guess, can be a bit of an issue because they're they're actually all in the pool, which that's another thing that's changed a lot during this drafting stage throughout this tournament is that we're not seeing quite as many second stage Naga bands, I feel like. I feel like she's like making it through a lot more now. Mm, do you think this is a good Naga pick? Because it looks solid and they have rolled the Razor plus Naga in the past. I think that might be the discussion here. Is like, do we make this a Naga game or do we just keep it simple with a troll game? Because I, I do think the troll is. I mean, there's definitely some issues like glimpse and stuff. I guess can be kind of annoying, but yeah, I, I think yeah. it's. I think it's simpler. I think the problem with Naga as well is you give you know uh, a Naga into two supports that are pretty damn good against her, right? You yeah, have the decent, yeah. the Grimstroke can build Aghanims and get very nice Lucian for himself. You have Grimstroke with the glimpse already to kill Lucians. It, it's just. You know, not fantastic in that regard. And Troll does punish the Slardar more in laning stage. So yeah, they stay more. more competitive for lanes. And that's what we've been seeing. Falcons, they put a lot of emphasis on having good lanes and good setups for themselves. And so far it lo looked great for them. They win the lanes, they win the games. But uh, can you punish the Troll with the position one? Is there some ranged carry plus draw... Uh, Plus draw, plus disruptor that can do well into the troll. <laughs> not <laughs> leading, it. <laughs> not leading. Some, on. Well, what someone did play draw earlier <laughs> this tournament. Uh, I think it was them, right? Yeah, it was versus um, Game Gladiators. They did bust out the Ame draw, uh, which was pretty cool to see. And obviously, it has some synergies there with the slider. And you're definitely thinking ranged. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe I, I think. Yeah, what? some form of physical damage build. They're gonna go for clinks, so this is uh, yeah, kind of hard locked into safe lane clinks. Uh, I doubt that we're gonna see that go mid ever here. So clinks and slaughter. We saw it before. It's minus armor combo, and uh, you do a lot of damage with it. Probably the I... uh, the Deso build or even the Gleipnir shard build that we saw from Hame. Mm. He played a really good Gleipnir uh, shard build. I, I really like it here because of Enchantress as well. Uh, but Trent, what do you think mm. about this lane? Like, Disruptor clinks into Earth Spirit, rolling on you with Razor, being kicked into the Razor. Is it difficult or will it be just fine for Falcon, for Extreme Gaming? Mm, that's a good question. They'll be on the Radiant side. So, I mean, controlling the, the Lotus might be kind of a nuisance. That That's probably going to be going the way. It is, you know, the Amar Razor, kind of scary. Mm -hmm. uh, Disruptor, of course, maybe... Just has to be really solid with the glimpses, uh, as well as some maybe two points into the thunder. But yeah, I, it's definitely worrisome because they have a lot of synergy together, right? This idea of utilizing the link and then trying to get the uh, like the earth spirit just like, kicking you back. So it's going to come down to wave control for the most part. Yeah, I remember last uh, disruptor we saw against crits uh, earth spirit was not having a good time. I think it was you know like five deaths in the laning stage or something. But there was a big disconnect there between carry and plus five. Oh um, yeah, I think <laughs> they're they're gonna have to be very on point here, not to be overly aggressive with disruptor without the help of clinks, you know, to harass people down. Because uh, yep. crit, he will look for those kickbacks. Um, Vaga, by the way, now that you mentioned that lane, they lo the team lost the lane super hard with the disruptor weaver. I think that lane might be even stronger than disruptor clinks. Am I correct or? It, it is. Should have uh, been, also, but man, would... he didn't do anything with that weaver. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you know, I would argue that it was stronger and even that the, you know, Racer Earth Spirit is even stronger as well than the, the Pango Earth Spirits that we saw. Um, mm -hmm. But it all came down to internal synergy, like no communication. I, I was, you know, I was saying that Crit, yeah, he played good, but that was really, you know, the opponents also not being on the same page. Yeah, you were damn vocal about it and it, it, it was... <laughs> 
you told the truth. Like it, it, it was how it was. It was a mess in that lane. But uh, hopefully, Extreme uh, Gaming will play this lane a bit better than what the Weaver and Disruptor did, because something like that cannot happen again. You just straight up lose the game. Zeus banned out on one side, Lina on the other. We are waiting one last ban, and I believe these two picks should be our straightforward mid laners, unless there is some flex on this Razor, which I don't think will be the case. Uh, but with this Mars ban, my, what do you guys think? Can it be? I think it definitely can be if the matchup's really bad. Like, I, I think you're locked out of certain heroes in this case. Like, just nah, I love maybe. this. So, the, yeah, this looks better. The DP pick here, DP pick synergizes with Miner's armor really well. So Slardar's ulti is going to help DP do more damage with her own ulti. Uh, and I think this is one of XM's best heroes. I was thinking about what heroes he could play here. I think this is definitely going to fit the draft really well. Has you on a, a certain bit of a timing, I guess, like just this momentum based of like getting stuff done with your exorcisms and everything, which can be somewhat stressful, but maybe that's something that XG kind of need is something that's sort of pushing them to make those moves. Mm -hmm. And the heroes are a little bit better for it. The, uh, the idea and the direction of the game sort of puts them in that way. And that's just been something that they've been a little bit slow on. So DP is a hero who you kind of know how you have to play it. And defensively at those towers, Falcons don't look incredible at the moment. In terms of the the other matchup, though, they are going to mix it up. They're going to grab that Doom. Okay. And Malreen's taking that Razor mid versus the DP. Doom? Like, yeah. is this does, does this make the lane strong? What What's the reasoning behind the Doom? Is it just to Doom the DP, or what's behind it? Do Doom is fantastic for stopping DP from her healing. Uh, so that's one of the really big things. And it's also a very nice way to try and deal with the, you know, the clinks. If you get vision on him, just drop the doom on him and he won't really have any impact. But it does make the lane more passive on their off lane. It also means that, you know, their mid laner is now a razor, not necessarily a high impact, super early uh, ganking type hero. So we'll see how much Malrean can do, of course. The matchup is pretty good. Razor against DP, you know, you just static link when she spirit siphons and you're happily taking her damage away. You kind of do well in that trade. But mm -hmm. this was not what I expected from Falcons on the last pick. No, I think it really speaks uh, to the confidence they have in the Doom, right? Like, they, they do this a couple times. They'll, like, open with the Kunkka as well, and the whole way through, you're like, yeah, it looks like a good Amar Kunkka game, and it might it would probably be better if we got a different mid, but then they just end up grabbing this Doom anyway, so... I think maybe he just enjoys having this late. He can really get a good read on when it's going to be an important Doom game and thinks that he can take over because that's what you got to do when you're last pick. Mm. So all things said and considered without seeing the team names on both sides, which one do you think is the better draft, the Radiant or the Dire? Give me some percentage. I, I think it's very close for me, but maybe I favor 55% or so for Radiant, uh, which is Extreme Gaming's lineup here. Uh, so I think... They did a great job not getting demolished in the draft by say, Falcons, who usually draft extremely well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would probably lean the same way. But the only thing holding me back, I might even go just flat 50-50 simply because I do think the slider is super important and he's going into the troll. So uh, for me, that's the most important thing to be watching is to see how XXS does. Okay, like I actually personally believe that it's a really good draft from Extreme Gaming, but uh, enough with us and our perspective. Let's get a fresh new one from Cap and SVG. Thank you, that's right, Lizard uh, here in uh, the Grand Finals. Welcome everybody to the Grand Finals of Elite League. Avery and I will be taking you through all of this action and uh, we got our first draft of the series, which I feel like is always very important, Avery, to be able to set the uh, set the stage, right? When it comes to drafting wise, what did you get out of this uh, opening draft for this best of five series? I mean, I think XG coming into the series are worried about the first 10 to 15 minutes more than anything. I think Mm -hmm. They're confident in their team fight ability. They're confident in scaling, especially with Ame, who likes to generally go late game, get those five, six slots, be a beast. But the first 50 minutes, and especially setting yourself up in the draft so that you can deal with the flex cores that are coming out from Falcons, they're going to get one of them between Malreen and ATF. You can't stop it. And then you have to get in a position where your lanes are flexible enough as well, and you just don't get run over. So I think XG did a decent job preparing for that, at least in the game one. I think their draft is even on the tempo they have pretty good objective taken between the dp forcing buildings that they can fight around and slardar forcing the roche that we've seen a lot of these chinese teams favor particularly the two that made it to the top three here and i think they can push that tempo as long as falcon supports don't get a lot done however that is a tall order as we have seen this support duo just clean house this tournament in terms of 
out rotating people, out laning people, and just getting way more net worth off the map. And this is a support duo that is going to scale really well into those mid game fights, particularly with your spirit, if you let them get a lead here. <laughs> Crit outmaneuvers Ame and manages to snag the bounty rune on the other side. So they're going to be up one bounty rune. Already a good start for Falcons, even if there's no first blood. Uh, I do want to point out something that the panel was talking about the uh, the Earth Spirit. And uh, Waga is correct. Malreen is by no means an Earth Spirit spammer. Um, I do want to point out, though, he has actually played it a few times in pubs uh, the last two weeks. So that that is a possibility. Um, you know, I think it's unlikely that we see it, but it shows, just goes to show that this team, Falcons, has so much flex potential in their draft. It's crazy. You know, we see a Razor, you're just like, I, it could be any of the three lanes potentially. If they feel like Earth Spirit is a good mid right now, then they could potentially flex that hero into the mid lane as well. It's just very hard to lock down what their last pick is going to be. Which is why just throwing something there like Death Prophet is is pretty well rounded like it's going to be hard to punish xm on his types of heroes i think that's one thing xg can go to in the series you put a viper you put a sniper you put a dp mid okay maybe you just don't even give a damn what they flex them right because these heroes just generally do well versus anything i think that can be something they go back to here as the series progresses especially just getting laners that are pretty unpunishable and already we see this slardar troll matchup not going how falcons wanted it to as Jin Q gets the job done with some early ink swell. Nice. Yeah, pick up I mean, this, this matchup makes uh, quite the difference, right? If you can actually get some sort of leading stun onto the troll and uh, and then follow up with Crush and Grimstroke outputs so much damage as well with an additional nuke and the Stroke of Fate that this is going to be a little bit tough, but they do manage to get that kill on the Ame. They're pressuring him quite a lot. Uh, we saw this double melee matchup, not this exact one, but a double melee matchup against Azure Ray and absolutely crushed the lane before. So I was watching to see if Ame would uh, would end up slipping up against them. And sure enough, he does at least one time. Hey, those are both kills you might not really expect so early. I think Klinks is definitely more susceptible level one than the troll. I'm surprised Skeeter gave up that death. They got the heal level one out of Snake King, which enables the aggression more. Just... Really nice timings on both these off lanes. I mean, crit hit like four rolls in a row on Ame here. Had the early orb of venom, had the blood grenade. It's a lot of chase down on the level one for a hero that can't really fight back. Needs the the later points in death pack to be a nuisance on the lane. So once more, this double melee off lane for Falcons is already putting in work. And Malreen is doing pretty well in the mid lane, 17 and three, and uh, it potentially can't get worse because the trade-off of Spirit Siphon and uh, Static Link, XM's HP might stay high as they drain each other, uh, but ultimately Malreen walks away with the damage buff that allows him to get more CS. So XM gonna have to heavily rely on Crypt Swarm to get last hits. He's still not doing too bad though in that regard. It's, this matchup between DP Razor is really interesting because I think the lane is kind of whatever, but I think DP definitely has a favorable matchup in the early, like the earlier mid game, that 20 to 30, 35 minute mark where you can force the Roshans and Razor isn't strong enough to man up into Siphons plus Exo. But I think as yep. this game goes really late, we're talking 50 minutes plus, when you have six slot heroes, Razor almost doesn't care because he can get to a point where he has double BKB and he just runs in the fight. And once more X success on top of Skeeter, should claim his life here. And Skeeter is very, very dead. Meanwhile, DY on the other side is also potentially going to get a rundown with a blood grenade. Crit is very low. Nope, he's got a fairy fire. He's going to be okay. So that last bit of damage from Ame is not good enough. The tar bomb beginning to be a bit of nuisance uh, for these uh, two melee heroes as the damage is stacking up. This should be a lane that goes well for XG. Like, they got that cheeky kill, but Crit's still suffering in terms of staying on the lane his net worth is really rough as he had the TP out as he got glimpsed under the tower earlier. So XG are still doing a decent job punishing both these side lanes, putting Falcons in a position where they're not just going to run this game over. And if you can put Earth Spirit especially in that position, there's a reason we don't see this hero a lot because his lane phase is extremely volatile. If it works, okay, the hero looks great. You get a fast turn, you can do some roaming. When it doesn't work, it's one of the worst in the game. So... Crit is struggling to find some early gold here, and I don't know if he's going to find it on this offense. I don't think Doom can just force the fight here into double ranged hero with potential Grimstroke TP or, or potential DP teleport later to counteract this. 
It's also a yeah. hero that I think ATF generally likes getting the solo XP on, getting to that six first, getting the doom before the enemy carry can sustain it, and just getting that solo kill. That's a huge momentum swing if that happens. So, I mean, Crit's kind of stuck here. He, he doesn't want to linger here because there's no action on the lane. He can't really go top because that lane didn't go that well for Falcons. He, he might think about it still, but the real question is, can you roam mid here with the Earth Spear? Because that's what you're looking to do. And instead, the roam is coming to you right now as XXS once more shows how fast the Slardar can I rotate. Love, yeah, I love watching his Slardar, man. They, like, this guy does not stay in lane. If he does, like, he's winning the lane and he doesn't stay in the lane. It's very uh, unique approach. This is just super good gameplay from him overall because he's shutting down this Enchantress room, which, I mean, yeah, he misses some CS, but it's just mega value on the map for his supports in this early game. Once Crit, more, missing Crit. a roll in, might die here for it. He's yeah, getting he throw the kick back at Ame, but he's dead. Jin Q making a rotation over, so Amara thinks he has the upper hand with Ame being so low, but with a third hero on the mix, that could make a big difference. Is Ame is just going to get away with just a bit of HP, keep the damage on Amar, and Amar can't run because ultimately he's one man down. He's just going to get glimpsed back if uh, the opportunity presents itself. DY doesn't even need to. There's that aggression where. XG are happy to TP in and counterplay that. And you just don't have the sustained damage for that kind of fight because the Earth Spirit's just, he's too low level. He doesn't have some super fast earn. He's not giving you much damage in this type of situation. You're going to get kited out. It's the downside of these double melee off lanes. XG have four ranged heroes in this lineup. So you get stuck in these situations where you're just fighting it out. It's going to hurt. And I like these early moves from, from XG so far. It, I think they came, they came to play today, which... It counts for a lot in the first game of a BO5 where you're you're trying to set some some pace, some morale. Now look at this move. Maureen moving to take the wisdom rune, but XXS is not gonna get it up so easily now. He's gonna take a lot of damage, try and sprint himself away. The enchant was already used, so that debuff oh, is free. No. And he caught the crush on him. He managed to get back, gives up his uh. life. Shin does the same. <laughs> Wait a minute. XM, he's not on top of the razor. Now he's being kited around. He's trying to get to him, but he, he actually too? doesn't have that many resources to work with. Spirit Siphons are going oh, out, but the damage my. is too much. They thought they had Maureen. They stopped his TP, but it all goes wrong. That's, that is the power of power runes right there. Arcane rune for Maureen. He gets so many more plasma fields off here. And just showing the power of Eye of the Storm in these open areas. And straight back well, on the XXS. Screw it. At least we can kill Amar. That's the one thing that we can do here. As they brought that Razor up to top lane. Throws out the Doom. And uh, with the Blood Grenade, he's going to tick out for sure. Uh, Crit gets glimpsed back. He just TPs out. No problem there. This is just a disaster in the offlane that was going pretty well for XG, though. I mean, that's four kills up there for Maureen and a tier one. An insane net worth injection into this Razor. And a big setback for XM as he commits exorcism to that fight and gets nothing off of it. Falcons finding the connection using this Enchantress creep. High levels and Enchant now. Recovery gold for Skeeter. Just when you thought it was kind of going okay here in the laning phase. Falcons push you back down. Yeah. And now they're going to bring the pressure to mid because now they have the Enchantress levels. They can bring numbers to this this push with the, the will that can force a response out of XG. And this is not the situation that this Death Prophet wants to be in where she's the one getting pushed instead of the other way around. They got to get some D warding out. And he guesses wrong. It's not that ward, it's two different wards. The ward behind the tier one tower at top that uh, Snake King put in earlier when he had that enchanted creep that allowed them to go for that wisdom rune placement. And then a mid rune as well that was spotting XXS attempting to stop this uh, mid play from Falcons, so. And we're seeing them get this early jungle invasion. They have another really good rune for Maureen in this amp damage rune. You have the level three enchant creep with the satyr, so it's pretty strong right now, this nuke. Still does 160 damage. It's a decent time to fight for Falcons if they want to skirmish. There's no ult levels. Or there's no ult for Jin Q. They just got Static Storm up for DY. But I think they're going to bring Maureen somewhere right now. Because you get a fight with this Ant Damage Rune. It's going to convert into a tower really easily. And you have Doom coming up in 25 seconds. So Falcons are going to look to combine these two cores probably somewhere. Or at least threaten somebody with a Doom. If it's an empty lane for ATF, maybe they don't have to rotate here, but... This is dangerous for Ame to be down here right now. 
He does not want to linger in front of this Doom coming off cooldown with limited defensive capability here, and they don't see where these supports are in their jungle. As Snaking keeps keeps sending a creep mid, but he's mainly playing behind that Radiant Obs. It'll secure another power, and so they didn't get value out of the DD, but they secure another one from all here with an illusion. Now, one thing that uh, might kill semi degression from Falcons is uh, DY got a very early level six due to the constant Doom kills that they were getting in lane and a couple of uh, Earth Spirit ones as well. So he actually got level six before the Slardar. So maybe that's uh, part of the reason why they haven't managed to actually make anything happen in the mid lane just yet is the potential for DY to counter that play is pretty high. Definitely helps. It prevents some of the diving capability here. But we're still seeing how scared Ame is playing bottom. He, he's just ghost. Mm -hmm. He's just running around skeleton walked. Does not want to show versus ATF. He's afraid of the support rotations. So XG just going to play it pretty defensive here. Get some ancient stacks up. Get XXS back in this game. Let Ame jungle. Give up some lane farm to stabilize the map right now. And get their Slaughter back in fighting shape. And honestly, not, it's not the worst for them. Because... I do think Falcons had a little window there where Snaking was the strongest support on the map. They were threatening one of these dives on the towers. They had the power runes from Alreen, and XG kind of dodged that that move. Maybe the Earth Spear just wasn't strong enough to take that fight. As Crit, again, having a pretty slow early game here, still doesn't have level 6. The big question to me is, like, can XG use the Death Prophet? Because this is not a hero that they want to just have idle in terms of, okay, XO's up, but we're not using it. Like, this is a spell you want to use in the early game. Super strong, super powerful. You have the siphons. You don't want to let Malreen just continue to farm and scale here versus you get a Manta up, get a BKB up, and then suddenly we, you have more fights like what happened earlier where you XO on this Razor and he just kills you instead. Yeah. I do wonder if uh, part of their... Oh, denied regen rune with the illusion... I, I do wonder if Extreme playing so cautiously, some of it just comes back to that series yesterday uh, against Liquid, right? Where Ame destroyed with that clinks. I wonder if they feel like th that th this hero is just going to carry the game for them. And as long as they don't give away too much momentum to Falcons early, that they can put their faith in the clinks to carry through. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I was surprised at how much damage he did in that game. And I... Yeah. I mean, as much as we hate on the clinks, maybe I hate on the clinks. There's a lot of people who hate on clinks because... Well, these clinks, you know, this hero is just the walking embodiment of a trash can for many, many patches. But it also means nobody really knows what this hero can do because you just don't see it. You don't play against it at its full capacity. You know, like who is the best clinks player in the world right now? I, I don't know. It, you know, it's probably crit. <laughs> this guy plays it more than <laughs> almost anybody. <laughs> He's obsessed with that hero, true. Go for the pickoff on Snake King here. The damage does not come very quickly, but XXS will deliver the final blow. They showed three different cores in this part of the map, though, all at once. Uh, and they also have uh, given the information to Falcons that there is a high ground war. So, Radiant XXS well, things were given away in that move. Happy to get involved. And that's a fast blink considering the lane he was up against and what happened mm -hmm. around that Wisdom Room fight. They also have the Yules done on the Death Prophet. So this is a nice smoke timing. For XG, even if this doesn't work, they're going to get value out of the XO taking down this mid-tier 1. And Ame's Deso flying out right now. So triple core item timing here for XG as they just sink it all up off the smoke. And they're even going to get a little greedy. Look for Skeeter at the same time. I mean, this would be great if Ame was joining them as it is just a two-man. We'll see if it works. They have the Disruptor coming in for a potential glimpse as well. The ult's going to go off. Skeeter. How much damage can he get done during this time? Blocked out by the kinetic field. XXS trapped between two heroes. He's really stuck here. Soul Bind glimpse back on the Razor. Doesn't send him back to where he TP'd from. XM's gonna push forward. There's the Doom. No more healing for the Death Prophet. A Yule's up in the air to stall some of this damage. But a kick from all the way across the field. Crit lands at it and the Death Prophet will die as a result of that extra damage. No way he can sustain ATF coming in there, especially with Veil just amping up all this extra magic damage and XG overextend. I mean, I was saying they're getting a little greedy there, and they do get Skeeter on top of that. I mean, your Exo was running out, but damn, did you pay a heavy price. Snaking wasn't even there. He's just farming bottom. It just takes way too long to kill this troll. The glimpse is, like, a little weird because you're glimpsing him out of the static storm. 
But you don't really want to fight these two cores here, and I think XM just overestimating how much Ame is going to bail him out here. Uh, Ame's damage yeah. didn't, was not impressive in this fight, I'll tell you that much, for an early Deso timing. And just XM going up against the caught again. This is going to be one of those Slardars that gets a Blink Dagger and struggles to get items past that, it looks like, because he is just having to die in every single fight that they're a part of. He's the lowest net worth core. I mean, uh, Amar's probably looking at this going, well, this is why I don't go Blink Dagger first, you know? Oh, absolutely, because he's just rushing Shivas right now. And the second that Shivas comes out on the Doom, you know XXS is going to wonder what the hell he's doing in this game. Like, you're, you have a Deso Slardar Amp lineup into what's going to be a 16-minute Shiva's guard. That is a very tall order to pierce through at this point in the game. You just don't have the damage, and you're just destroying your item value in terms of that armor reduction here. You're also going to have a very fast Manta on this Razor, which means effectively two heroes. Slardar just not, does not want to go on at all. I almost wonder... Like, you see the idea between this Clink Slaughter. I think it's it can be really strong. They have a lot of physical burst damage that's going to come out very fast. If they get it on the right heroes, like the supports or even this troll before he has later items. But that game yesterday from Ame where he went the Gleipner, it gives him a lot more flexibility in terms of where the damage is coming from, the, the source, the extra procs off a of barrage, things like this. That maybe would have been a bit more impactful in these fights, but obviously this... You can't skip the Deso here with a Slaughter lineup. It's just making the itemization pretty straightforward here for Falcons as you get some Dispels, you get some armor, you get some DKVs, and then are you winning that man fight? Another rotation will secure a tier one with another power rune for Maureen. Feels like he's gotten every single rune this game. Yeah, and the one that he didn't, well, he denied. So he's had full control of the power runes all along. DKV coming up very fast for Skeeter. And XM in the wrong neighborhood right now. If he gets found, and he does, smoke breaks, crit rolls on him perfectly. And XM, I and mean, we're going to see this, like, this combination of the single target damage that Falcon is able to do is actually pretty decent. This Death Prophet is just not tanky enough for a lot of these situations. But then also, the Doom was such a great pick for them. Uh, it counters the Death Prophet entirely when it comes to the healing aspect. And it also deals with some of these other heroes, right? We're talking about uh, other heals in the game. you got the uh, Shard already up on Jin Q. That's another source of heal. And then you also have the Clinks, who heals himself with Death Pack. So uh, the anti-heal mechanic from Doom is definitely going to get a lot of value in this game. Early Shiva is also just paying off in that regard. And, I mean, all this is going to translate into a, basically a two-man Roche for Falcons as the rest of the heroes are up here, but they are not needed at all. Just Skeeter laying into this with early Maelstrom. Snaking can take it with the Enchantress. Just really efficient map play. And this is an Aegis that you know XG wanted in this game. So taking it away from them is almost more brutal than what it does for Skeeter here. As you had a Deso, Clinks, and a Sardar getting denied on the first round. Tough position. You're finding yourselves down a decent amount of gold. Your team fight isn't anything insane. And this early Shiva's on the Doom, it, it just feels like impossible to fight into right now. With how high HP these heroes are, the Razor just seems really hard to bring down. And XM, you gotta find a way to activate this death problem. Because it doesn't feel like he's becoming more useful. It feels like he's just continuing to fall off here. But the way that early game went, just not fast enough. He's against the anti-healing, he's against Doom, Shiva's early vessel on the Earth Spirit. There's so much anti-healing already up for Falcons. There's multiple dispels. You know, there's Doom. He ATF can also get a dispel if he really wants to later in this game with a purge. You have the, the max enchant for snaking already. He has drum. So they're gonna they're gonna dispel you, they're gonna slow you down on this guardian sprint, on this death prophet running in, and they're gonna kite you out with extra move speed. This Razor's incredibly fast. With Drum Charge, he basically goes hasted. How are you going to stick on these heroes? This is another issue XG you're going to have to solve in this game. You have Glimpse Field and you have a Soulbind, but these BKBs are going to be coming out pretty soon. And then you lose all that control in those. Yeah. Well, BKBs for BKBs. I, I, I guess one thing is extreme if they get all their BKBs they will have the better physical damage even if that's being mitigated heavily by falcons uh item choices 
Pick off here. Oh, the glimpse. Wait, he still hits him. Crit with God, the blind damn. roll in, lands on Ame at max range, and he might even live through this burst. Yep, he's gonna live through it. What a hit from Crit. God damn, this guy's good at Earth Spirit. I and mean, he, he legit did see him at all. That was just, a, he just soul read that man. Like, there's no way around it. He stared into Ame's soul, he knew where he was. He just gets the easy plus one here. I don't know, like, did they see him on the edge of the dust? Or he didn't get dusted. He was not dusted. Oh, he was not Oh, he dusted. did get dusted. What? Maybe it was a second dust? I don't think he got it dusted was on second the first dust. one. Crit, yeah. crit rolled on him, yeah. hit him, and then popped the dust because he landed on something. I mean, yeah. he was just guessing. I checked, I checked the first dust, and I did not see the debuff on him. So. I mean, so they saw him on the earlier wave, so Crit felt like he was lingering somewhere there, but that is just, just a sick hit, and... You get that two for one, another 3k gold built into the lead here. Where, yeah, you shut crit down in that early roaming stage. Does not seem to have affected him as he's found the farm on the map. And now he's at that point where he can just scale into the fights as an earth spirit. That's the dream. Well, extreme with some cope, but they, they better hope the BKB timing uh, changes the way this game is going. They're about to hit it for Ame. XM has his. They've got the BKB on the Slardar already. They're looking at Troll right now. A hard hero to burst, but the silences, they can get the Aegis now. He still has BKB on the second life, so they gotta get out of here. Oh, they're gonna turn back for a crit, actually. Get him That's inside nice the Static Storm. This is a kill where he's pretty isolated, and they can maybe still slow play this fight out. DY, they feel strong enough they can get the glimpse backwards, but Maureen comes in from the side, immediately addresses DY, and takes him out of the fight with the Soul Vine. Now with a Doom on Death Prophet, it's going to force a lot of these cores back. A big crush from the Slardar for the BKBs. Again, allowing Has to, run to in. push through. DY with a buyback, though. Can he get the extra hero? He's got one. That's going to be Snake King pulled back into his Doom. Wait, nope, oh, he's got the shard already. He hops out of the jump, the burning barrage from Ame, and Ame jumped in by Amar. Now another buyback, more support buyback. They the need ATF here. Two seconds, they need ETF, they need the extra kill, but Amar's ATF. gonna fight back. He goes back in with going the in. with the plasma fuel, almost wiping out Ame. Ame on the edge, fighting for his life, trying to finish up these heroes. It's not quite enough damage. Maybe they can get the zoom with the dead. remaining skeletons. He needs a little oh bit more damage. My. He goes to 70 HP, and and none of it's enough. Falcons outplay the hell out of extreme. Seven I, versus five, and they win. That is a that is a regrettable chase, a regrettable glimpse there. This is not the man you want to be glimpsing right now. As he just mans up early Shiva's so much value in this game, it's absurd. I think XG played the early stages of this fight pretty well. You gotta remember they took an Aegis out before all this. They had their triple BKB timing to try and disengage here. They force Skeeter in on the end, of the back side of this ult, and they wait out the Doom on the Death Prophet. Everything up to this point is not the worst trade for them, but they got too greedy at the end, not respecting the strength of this Doom. And boy, is he strong. And now the tips already coming out a little bit off the high five. What, what's, what's with the tipping on XM all the time? Because obviously Maureen does it, because, you know, that's his matchup. But now the delayed tip from Amar on uh, XM as well. A glimpse back. Snakey trying to burst him down. Again, he has that shard, so he's not the easiest kill, especially with his cores behind him. And the enchant killing the sprint just means that he can't go anywhere. XXS pulled back, leashed Jeez. by Maureen. Now, these shards are, are paying off for Falcons. Razor shard, Enchanter shard. Just more annoying movement control in the fight. Making snaking a very hard target to go on, and it's making Malrain able to chase down these cores. Slarter has no gameplay once this fight breaks out. Like, you have to get the job done in that initial amp, or you're just dead. You can't disengage to come back in. Just more stellar team fighting from Falcons as they, they just know their limits better. What have we here? Coordination, a bit more crisp, and now ATF done with his BKB, so. Your dreams of initiating on this Doom are, are growing thinner. And he has gained the confidence to make the initiation of right. Okay, straight yeah. up dooms him. I mean, he knows he has no buyback, so... 
no world in which he dies, buybacks, glimpses you again or something. Ami's coming in from behind, but the rest of Falcons is coming in as well. They're gonna go for this kill. Question, Question mark. mark. Oh god. <laughs> right before the fight even breaks out, Amar already knows its outcome. He knows they're gonna be able to win this one. They chase down Ami, hit him with the dust, he BKBs, teleports down. That should work for him just fine. But it's three heroes dead. <laughs> Two heroes dead for chasing Amar. The mental Daring. damage. <laughs> the mental damage is just already adding up. I, lost. I mean, who else does that? Like, you're getting initiated on. And you're, you're not you're not moving your hero. You're not TPing out. You just write question mark. <laughs> you're that confident in your EHP right now. He's been right every time. I mean, he is right. That's the thing, you know. If you're gonna, if you're gonna talk trash, you may as well, you know, do it when you're right. Do it when you're winning. Do it when you're losing. I don't know, but he has been right. He has been winning. It works out. I'm just putting myself in these players' shoes. God, I would pop off so hard if, if you know, you managed to beat Falcons. <laughs> Be, that due is to true. all this trash talk and i think it, it it adds up in your head you know like the oh god i really want to beat these guys but you just can't <laughs> at least not in this game 19k net worth lead for falcons you know i mean no no dota team stays on top forever but that doesn't mean you're going to be the one to bring them down as you know it might you might just be another XXS on vision. Stone. Can he blink before the hit? No. Crit makes sure to even throw out the geomagnetic grip right before he hits him with the roll. Just to make sure there's even less time for XXS to react. This game just spiraled so fast. It's like you give Falcons a little bit of an opening. You mess up that early game a little, they build a little lead, and then suddenly that next fight's just that much harder. And this team is just so good about playing around their item timings. They dictate when the fights happen, and they're almost always advantageous for them. It's just not yeah, I mean, a clean DY's enough looking game. For DY, DY is doing some rat smoking right now. He smokes, cuts the wave with Thunderstrike, gets some really deep wards down, probably so they can, you know, rant some more with, uh, with Ame. They're just trying to see anybody split up so they can get some sort of information to lead to a pickoff here. Yeah. But they, I think they have to commit everybody on the first target. They have to commit Exo. And that's tough because you're probably getting spells off on the side of Falcons, even if you get jumped. Like, I don't think you're 100 to 0 in this troll. I don't think you're 100 to 0 in this Doom, which means you're getting troll ult off. You're getting Doom off, even if you bring one of these heroes down. And it's hard to see you winning the fight after that. So, XG, they really need some crazy good angle here or something. Scanning. ATF hunting for some sort of split push up here, waiting for the rat to show, waiting for Ame to try and take a single wave. Radiant 28 scan. minute wisdom rune is also an opportunity for a kill. <laughs> is Jinq trying to see if there's anybody there? He's not going to dare go on for it. DY tries to get the wisdom rune on the other side, and he'll pay the price for it. I mean, if I'm DY, I'm like, guys, this guy isn't doomed anybody else in like 20 minutes. What's happening? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I don't think he needs to doom anybody else. No. It's perhaps the sad truth here is once more, they're going to two man this Roshan. There's max efficiency here. Absolutely no punish. This will be an Aegis that allows them to go high ground for sure. They do not need much more in this game. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they've beaten uh, Extreme into submission, that they're willing to just play like this two or three man aggressively on Extreme side of the map while they're doing Roshan. They take that Roshan, Amar blinks into the jungle, praying that Extreme will try and fight him, even though it would be a three versus five. I'm not even sure they win that, to be honest. So I yeah. can't disagree with the, the greediness here. I mean, Ame is going to rat a little bit. You do get to Shiva's on XM, which... It is a big item. I just... It's going to be an item that is, instead of being used in an offensive or a Roche battle, it's going to be used to try and defend your high ground here. And XG's heroes are not that good in a defensive fight like this. You have very little spam. Your glimpse is useless when the enemy is running at you. 
I mean, it's just Ame throwing out some Skelly Boys here. That's about all you got. Waiting for another round of Blink Crush. Okay, they're pretty well lined up. They're going to be able to finish off the support, but Skeeter is the scary one. It gets locked down to Slaughter, so he's going to be able to chase him down. Malrain is in deep, putting damage onto Ame. See if they can finish him up. No. Ame gets back to the fountain in time. They turn their damage instead into barracks. Got a glimpse Skeeter here. Get something off this dive. With the ink swell, XM is going to chase him down. They bring down the Aegis. Malreen still standing stall, though. High of Storm starts lagging on to XM, pulling him back in. He's still low. The Razor finally does die, but the Doom on Ame. Ame is dead. He's going to die to this one, and without the damage, can they finish off Skeeter? It's all up to XM. XM does manage to do it now with another Ink Swell. They can chase down some more heroes, damage? offering a high five to Amar, and they get the kill. Now he finishes all the Falcons up with Crit, the last one down, and an immediate tip from XM. He's been waiting <laughs> for this opportunity to be the one offensively tipping, rather than simply responding to being tipped. I mean, that's about as good as a high ground hold you're going to get out of XG there, and that is the damage they were looking for between the Clinks and the Death Prophet. XM able to sustain himself through this fight as the Doom goes out on Ame, which, I mean, yeah, that feels great in the moment you get the buyback out of the Clinks, but it does open up the hat back into this fight for XM, and he cleans through Amar on that TP. No question mark there. Gets some revenge. That's going to bring this lead down a little. It was costly. You get some follow-up here, though. Not yep, too they bad. get an extra I mean, kill. This was looking like a game that might have just been over there. Instead, you brought that lead back almost 10k, defended an Aegis, and it only cost you one core buyback. Honestly, now a lot better than I thought it was going to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got gem, too. Snaking's gem now on DY. You got some d ward value out of that. He's halfway to an Ags. Some glimmers of hope here for XG. Dyer's top tower is under attack. Full out Daedalus. Can this Clinks carry the late game like it did against Liquid? I mean, th the thing that XGF going for them is, in theory, the Clinks will start to pick up the scale because you had the super early Shivas and Manta between the, the Doom and the Razor, but they're not, like, their tank ability isn't just exponentially cool. You're yes, getting some extra yes, They're HP. not getting the same amount of armor for the uh, same amount yes. of damage that Ame is getting. Exactly. So, in theory, his damage is going to start to pick up here. If XM can stay alive, this level 3 EXO with amps is, is going to be pretty nice as well. But a lot of it yeah. comes down to, you know, that initial jump. And that fight only works because Ame dies once and is able to come back. In a normal 5-on-5, five five, he doesn't have two lives. He gets doomed and he's just dead. None of this really matters. So actually need to protect the clinks they need to play around his his burst damage his long range poke and the biggest problem for them so far i mean it has just been atf there's no way around it the, this doom is just dictating the, the way the fight happens he's willing to bait the frontliners pick his point with when he wants to jump and he knows his targets he wants the clinks he wants the death profit he wants to get one of those secure that big core kill remove half the damage from xg's lineup nobody else is a threat here and these types of games are very nice for Doom because this is an anti-carry hero. So if you put all of your eggs in a single or two Radiant's core basket, and ATF just attack. chops half that off instantly, his game is very straightforward. And I don't know if XG have a way to Radiant's remedy that situation attack. other than making the DP and the Clinks both as absolutely strong as possible here. Yeah, I mean, the, the Wind Waker from XM might be enough to be able to uh to save ame against some sort of initiation uh but he's trying to get a lincoln's when the counter is already there in doom you know you just take a neutral creep that has a single target ability he already has mana burn and you just blink in break the lincoln's and then get the doom off anyway so even that is only half measures you'll see them push out here trying to find something do have a ward on the map. They did get that gem back, so they are getting some vision value out of this move regardless. They get a power rune as well. We're seeing Falcons play a little defensive, maybe waiting for the next Roche here, respecting the damage output that's gone up considerably. Thirty-five minute wisdom rune coming up. 
Man, only 35 minutes in. Feels like it's a later game than that. I mean, somehow the top net worth is Ame. I, I <laughs> don't know how this has happened in this game, but this man has found a lot from a little. But it is going to be the Falcon smoke across the map that's going to try and catch something here. And Jin Q, yeah, he the had courier. the position. He did. Courier spotted some of these heroes, and Falcons will follow that courier and catch some more. They're going to get Jin Q. It's his dieback. So that's an 80 second timer. Not insignificant here when you're battling for vision control leading to that next Roshan. But I, I get, would think XG are okay with that because right now he is. Arguably the least important hero to keep getting farm on the map. You're yeah. trying to get to this Ags on DY. Like, that is perhaps the biggest item here for XG if they can grab it and somehow just get that mute on these heroes in the middle of a fight. I don't know if you're ever going to land it on ATF since he's picking his jump with just Blink BKB, but if you can get it on the troll before... You know, you jump this troll when he's sieging. You stun him, you throw that Static Storm on him. I guess there's Earth Spirit Shard you have to think about, which is pretty obnoxious here, but... True, yeah. It's still going to be annoying in that fight, especially if you can place it behind the troll, maybe zone crit out of being able to get this grip on the target easily. It's something for you. You're not you're not getting much better here, so... Let's see if DY can make use of it. Level 18 for XXS, so that's an additional 5 armor reduction. So amping up the Klinx's damage even more, and he'll be closing in on level 20 in not too long, which is another three if he wants that talent. I, the refresher for Maulring is, that's terrifying though. If he if he ever gets a link on the Klinx, that, that might just be the fight, honestly. Yeah. Especially if Ame doesn't have buyback. If he has buyback, you're in another base defense situation. It gets pretty iffy for Falcons, because their lineup is pretty committal. You have to commit a Doom, you have to commit the Razor BKBs slash Links, and then if you have buybacks after all of that, I can see you winning a fight like XG did. It's costly, but you can do it. In these open areas of the map where you don't get that second life, it's a way different story. And, and once more, XG are going to try and push forward with this gem, take an outpost, secure some sort of vision, get some neutral items as well, Tier 4s. They're going to play around this war that they have, knowing that Extreme are here. They killed the creep wave mid while they're smoked. They re-smoke up. Skeeter, first one to break it. Got three. And Shieldron, what a crush on three. No immediate follow-up. Tries to Wind Waker out of there. XM, going to be a target. Soulbinder and a couple heroes. Another Wind Waker trying to get them back. These crushes keep on going up, but the BKBs are too strong for Falcons. They run over one, two, and a third. That's Those are all yeah. heroes without buyback. I mean... There's just no counterplay to the BKBs here. The second they all get popped, if this maybe if the Static Storm is there right off that crush, but like DY, he doesn't even have the Ag, so it, it wouldn't have even mattered. Yeah, that's just a hard go. Again, the fights where XG are outside their base going into them, it's just damn near impossible. There's way too many BKBs, way too many durations that they're not putting out any damage. One bad fight, this game might just be over. Is yeah, Ame, you were top net worth for a bit, but what did it do here? Well, it's extreme. They're playing against Megas at bare minimum, if not an actual throne push from Falcons here. Falcons, if they want to play chill, they can take this, get Megas, get back up, take Roshan, and then, uh, look for that pickoff that allows them to end the game again which is exactly what they're going to do extreme being locked inside their base due to incoming waves of mega creeps ensures that roshan will not be uh disturbed that's gonna be the refresher for atf so you have the refresher razor you have the refresher doom and you're gonna have this third roshan going into the hands of the troll everybody getting what they want late game here it's an ags too so I could even see them giving this Ags to Skeeter. I mean, I think there's an argument for a lot of heroes on this line of taking it, but getting the extra dispel here for this troll seems pretty nice. You're against the Sardar, you're against a bunch of Yules and, and random dots. Ame wants going to go on a Mar. He's well. making the call. Please. Yeah, I mean, this is a good get point. over here. You have to try stuff like this, because 
you're just not winning against Megos without something crazy happening. Gets off the BKP, but the bash is there immediately afterwards. So that's kind of the best outcome right there. Yeah. You get the kill and get him to use his BKB. I mean, there's that decent damage we saw, like we or we wanted to see in that last fight. It's just you can't sync it up when you're all running away. That's why Falcons are so annoying. All these heroes they play that they abuse in terms of the scaling, they're all these like anti-carry heroes, which just makes it even worse because when these Razors and Dooms get strong, they make your life hell as well. Like you have to itemize against them instead of them itemizing against you. You know, Ame feels pressured to buy the Lincolns here to deal with something like a Doom. Like he probably feels pressured to have something like a Dragon, a Dragon Lance or a Hurricane Pike to try and recreate the gap against the Razor. Whereas Razor and Doom, they're just buying refreshers, buying BKBs, buying whatever the hell they want, Octarine cores, and just going on your ass. And that oftentimes feels pretty bad when you have to buy these defensive items instead of just playing your hero to the, you know, the highest damage potential here. He's now queuing up Divine. So Divine Rapier for Ame. Already in game Smoke one. breaks on Ame. Ame. Crit rolls in. It's a bit late and doesn't land. Try and jump on him. Soulbind. BKBs go out immediately. XXS and XM. Both able to reset with Wind Wakers. No problem. But the jump back in from Skeeter goes straight for the slaughter. And it's an Ag Static Storm. The static Storm, though. He is dead. He's caught inside of this one. And so is Maureen. Maureen glimps back for just an extra bit of timing. So that's one hero that's not coming back. Skeeter does, though. Inkswell trying to help him out against these disables. The chain bashes. XXS. He gets a bash of his own to stall up Skeeter. Just enough that XM gets the distance. They kite out Skeeter. They kite out the troll. They run down Snake. Making extreme another high ground hold another team fight okay. that they can actually win i mean this game is not over yet maybe falcons thought it was but dy gets that ags done and finds the catch on malreen after the refresher b can be committed seals his fate that is a, another tremendous team fight from them that is not easy to win here is I mean, that's just a beautiful static storm field catch gets two in there you waste ages, mm -hmm. you finish off this Razor. But the biggest question mark to me, Austin, in all of this, you took a four on five fight in the enemy base without Doombringer. ATF was dead this entire fight. Like, why? <laughs> why was yeah. that the play? You can't help but feel you're... like they got baited a bit. And now you're potentially going to be forced to use some buybacks, though. There's still a tier two at top. So if Extreme really wants to get the buybacks out of them, they have to get through this glyph, hit, kill the tier three. That's another glyph. They have to try and threaten Throne. And this is dangerous, because if you die, you lose Divine, no buyback on Ame. Doom is but still if you want to win, fresh. Oh, they're you gotta for go it. for it. I mean, you this gotta is go for it. No buyback this on the Troll. This is how you win some Dota. Amar blinks in immediately. The Doom on the Clinks. I mean, he has dead. been targeted. Ame is guaranteed dead. It's just a question of how much damage he can get out. Now he's going to buy back. Maureen XM, can he buy. live? Wind Waker over the cliff. He's getting away from Maureen. Oh, Managed it's... to break that link. Oh, gets him on the plasma field. Divine Rapier on Maureen gave him the damage. And I mean, that's just, that's got to be the game here. Yeah. And all the in buybacks push. come out from Extreme, but they don't have enough of them. And they've given Divine Rapier to Maureen. Maybe they felt like there wasn't going to be a better chance to win this game, and you can't blame them, but Maureen and ATF are just way too rich for their own good as they both had buyback for that push. They both committed. I mean, if XG somehow wiped them here, you, you win the game, but this yeah, looks near not... impossible. Ame and two supports without his divine rapier already spotted by the sentry the glyphs are gonna go down but they cannot wait long enough for the rest of the course to come back alive the tier four is dropping fast and amar he'll take the first strike uses up the doom the falcons they can go for throne if they want to and that's exactly what they plan on doing the static storm is just shrugged off they just lay the damage into the throne in the game and take game one of this best of five grand finals well i mean that got a little spicy at the end i think it's good that XG brought it back in in terms of their morale for the rest of the series. Because if you just get stomped, it's a lot worse than hey, you know, we fought. Maybe we almost won that game. You could you could copium yourself back. <laughs> no, you know, it was close, yeah. guys. We almost base raced them, even if it wasn't. But still, a very dominating performance from Falcons. Not the cleanest laning stage we've seen from them in terms of the snowball. But once they hit their stride with this Doom and Razor, 
just very hard for like a two core lineup between the Death Prophet and the Clinks to deal with it because some somebody's getting linked, someone else is getting doomed, and then you still have to deal with Troll plus an Earth Spirit in there, plus this Enchantress spoiling you and dealing all this extra deeps on top. Just very obnoxious lineup to deal with if you're not ahead because the anti-carry potential is so strong. And then at the same time, you're building into this late game. We're starting to see that Clink's damage get there. We're starting to see the Static Storm get there. But there's answers to some of these things. You have the Geomagnetic Grip to pull someone out of field. I mean, that's yeah. just, maybe it's, you know, they picked the Earth Spirit into the the uh, Disruptor that they saw first, so they know they're going to have that tool if it gets to that point. You have BKBs on everybody. You have five BKBs in this game. You have the ability to start the fight on your terms. Nothing that XSG we're scaling into is easy to execute here. And a lot of it felt reactionary, right? To me, it's yeah. XG itemizing and playing to try and deal with what Falcons are doing to them instead of doing something to Falcons. And that is the position this team puts people in. And it's a reason they are continuing to win here against everybody in the world. Yep, Falcons take the first step in the fights and they're going to take a first step forward to winning a best of five. But there's just one game of potentially four more to go. Extreme, plenty of things to talk about, plenty of things to talk about for that game one, especially. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our panel is going to follow that note. Thank you very much, Cap and SVG. A very volatile game one that probably ended just as much as we expected, just how we expected that with Falcons taking game one. However, um, the lanes, they started off pretty well from our extreme gaming, didn't they? Yeah, it started out really nice, especially the off lane for Extreme, where Slardar managed to find a kill there early. We talked about how the lane against Troll is not that easy. This is already a bit deeper into the game. We see the highlights here at like 30 minutes in. Then things were looking more grim, but the start was fantastic for them. I think a problem, though, is this Blink Rush Slardar with face boots against the Shiva's Doom. So you have no attack speed in your build, and you have minus attack speed from the Doom. He just wasn't <laughs> able to hit anything. Yeah, that was uh, that was definitely one of the problems, no doubt. I mean, yeah, going back to that Slardar lane, I think, you know, heading into the game, kind of expecting that to be the most important one, and you get two kills, right? Feeling pretty good, five minutes in. And then right away, though, he recognizes, like, hey, the Ink Swall, it did work, but I still can't fight this troll, because it is still troll. Like, if we get these perfect combos, we'll get these kills. So he starts pulling the waves instead. Zin Q goes back to stack. That's a great decision, because you're still you're gaining net worth. But it shows why the power of that troll pick is there. Because despite like stomping that lane pretty early, they can't continue to pressure the hero. So they have to go and do something else. That was successful. Slider goes down the river. They, they can pick up a free kill into Snake King. But the reason why Snake King was there is he kept going into that Radiant Triangle and just messing with that camp. He like Zinky was stacking it. Snake King would just come up, grab one of the creeps he'd been stacking, and go farm somewhere else. So despite how good that lane went, by eight minutes, there's a troll who had died twice in his lane. By eight minutes, was still a thousand gold ahead of the Slardar, and the Enchantress was ahead of the Grimstroke by like almost a thousand gold as well. So, the one thing that was looking pretty good for XG, unfortunately, still wasn't enough to carry them through. And then this whole like playing behind the Death Prophet, this idea of using the early exorcisms, that also didn't mm -hmm. really come to fruition for them. Yeah, very unfortunate for them because looking at the game, they had set up their lanes fairly well. Uh, there are a couple of mistakes, right, around the Wisdom Rune, in which uh, they, I believe, feed a triple kill to the Razor with an Arcane Rune. Yeah. And then the move as well, after the first exorcism in the Dire Jungle, uh, where the the first time you we could notice just how strong Doom is into XM, into DP, just Dooming her and making her pretty much useless throughout the fight. Uh, all things said and considered, guys, looking at this first game, there were still some silver linings to be taken to that we can look at for extreme gaming. This Clinks and Slardar combo did dish out a ton of damage when they could. Ame again, of course, dying with this rapier in the end. Yeah, there was definitely like moments when things looked really hopeful for them. Here we see kind of the moment that hope left as the rapier goes over to the racer. And at this point, it was just kind of game over. You have three heroes against the, the refresher uh, doom being available. Uh, but yeah, there were moments where things looked really promising for them. I think maybe if they managed to hammer down more onto that troll and pressure him in lane, you know, maybe even bring in the second support and try and really win that lane, then they could have prevented all this because losing top tower just stunted all their momentum. They lost top tier one, and that meant that DP can't make a natural tr rotation to take the enemy safe lane tower, and Slardar just didn't have a home anymore. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's uh, but like the way they played, the way they defended high ground, they had some excellent high ground defenses. The idea for going for the YOLO push at the end when things were just completely broken and like it's megas, but they still went for that. Those are all good signs, I think, heading into the next game. So, definitely not a team that looks super defeated heading into this best of five. And already, like you said, there have been some bright spots, so they just need to like really yeah. focus on those and try and make them a little bit brighter. It's still very early, they can still make it a lot brighter, but uh, one thing that I was thinking about is something that SVG has stated. These heroes that Falcons are playing constantly make you react to them. Like you're playing into this Razor, you have to build some sort of a distance maker, right? Like you don't want to be too close to that guy. Um, same goes with the Doom. If uh, ATF is playing the Doom, uh, like you have to get some sort of a Lincolns or uh, itemized for him. What are other ways of dealing with these heroes? Like, come on, we, we're we're a bright panel as well. We got the spotlight on us. Like, can we can yeah. we get some heroes against that? Can they can they can they uh, draft against that, or is it just the itemization? I mean, ultimately, it's it's about both lane punishment and about the fact that Falcons, you know, they you know that they're gonna take the Razor if you give it to them, and Razor is very very physical damage and right click heavy. So maybe they can find themselves into you know, some sort of draft that does better against it. They didn't really have any armor buff. I'm thinking like maybe, you know, if you can have a matchup where Sven can be good against the off lane of Team Falcons, then maybe that can mitigate the uh, impact of the Racer. I've seen Racer uh, picked against Sven sometimes, and it's a horrible matchup. You, you get blown up by Sven's ulti before you can really static link him down uh, from full effectiveness. Yeah, I think we had uh, some major finals going that way, Trent. Uh, mm, yeah, yeah. If I if I recollect correctly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those matches where you're like, yeah, it should be good in theory, and then it gets in practice, and you're like, oh right, okay, I understand. Especially once Sven got the eggs too. I think that really killed that one uh, for poor Razor. So, I mean, like you said, we're a bright panel, but unfortunately, all the brightest teams are still struggling to figure out these guys. I mean, they they're taunting <laughs> at this point, right? Malrian's like another Grandmaster hero. Try and ban them all. He's just like, he's got like advertisements up over the city. It's just like, don't forget about this one, this one. I got a Pango too. So they, there's yeah, a reason wanna, they keep winning, right? I don't want to be a coach that opens up his Dota buff and uh, has to think about the bans uh, that they have to utilize against Malreen and then ATF on top. But let's see. They're a very bright team. Um, let's see what they can do in game number two after a short break.
a pretty short break welcome back we are in the midst of the grand finals of elite league right now game one they're up team falcons not something that uh, was let's say unexpected so far they have won versus extreme gaming before in the playoffs they have won uh, against them in previous tournaments and the score is looking pretty damn difficult for extreme gaming to change however this is still game one it's a grand final, so it's still a best of five. There's a lot of room to improve, maybe brainstorm some new ideas for extreme gaming and maybe come up with something that will finally be good enough to take down Team Falcons. Guys, is there anything different so far in the bands? Definitely one big thing standing out here. The Razor is removed by Extreme. They're like, you know what? Uh, we're done with this. We're not going to try and counter <laughs> it anymore. Just ban out the Razor. Too annoying. Too much flexibility for Falcons as well, how they utilize it. Like we've talked about, they can actually send her all three core lanes, uh, particularly mid and off lane, but they could even put her on Skeeter if they wanted to, and you can carry with it, worst case scenario. Yeah, uh, good choice, I think, heading into this one. And uh, it will be Falcons with the first pick this time, so that perhaps why we're changing things up a little bit here in terms of uh, our bands from Extreme. But I will say, you know, talking about how they keep losing them in terms of these multiple tournaments and stuff, it's definitely getting better. I think there's no doubt about that. I feel like this is a, a better looking matchup. Like they're improving in some aspects. They're improving the laning stage. They're just like, every time it feels like there's just like one thing that they haven't quite got down. Like that time, I think it was trying to play towards XM in that situation on that death problem. Like I feel like they had a pretty good solution in the side lane. I didn't even mind the fact that they sort of ditched the troll after the two kills, as long as they could have then used XM. But, you know, you lost your tower, DP doesn't get rolling. Those those kind of things just don't take place. So, hope for something better. And uh, for the first time in a while, we will get the Falcon first Timber Saw. Mm, that's a, a hero that has been kind of ignored in the playoff stage, hasn't he? Like, mm -hmm. from most of the, these last few series that we have watched, I'm not even sure that he has been banned. But, of course, you are playing into Falcons, you are playing against the Mar. Um, Razor, of course, has to go. And then you have your Mars, you have your Timbersaw. One of these heroes will be picked by them this time around. They choose the Timber. However, uh, do you think that there's a flex between Timber offlane and Timber mid? Same like Razor offlane and Razor mid? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's there, exactly the there same. There definitely but... is. They have the same potential there, so same power, and uh, it's just another obnoxious hero to try and deal with. You've got to think about what you want in terms of supports. Also, Falcons banning out two heroes that are pretty damn nice against the Timber in the Disruptor and the Viper. So, uh, setting himself up for a good lane and good start to the game. Extreme Gaming, though, they go back to, uh, you know, what's tried and tested for them. What's been working out, the Phoenix hero that they didn't get to get their hands on as uh, Falcons banned it last game. Hmm. Yeah, the uh, Nullify we'll Refresher Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Do you like this Phoenix already into the Timber trend? Like there is some dot damage, some percentage based damage, or does Timber not care about Phoenix at all? I, I think it's it's pretty solid, right? I mean, Timbers these days like to try and avoid as much reactive armor as possible, pretty much in any role. So that, that, uh, that change to the build, I think, has helped the matchup for Phoenix quite a bit. Just because before you you do have to like commit with the damage over time previously if he was just sitting in the wave anyway like you needed that help from some of their cores and stuff but now you should have an easier time softening him up or if you don't have an easier time it means you had to force him to augment his skill build which is a good thing because then it's going to lower the kill threat he has on you and your allies so win win and of course just overall the comfort level they have with this hero is definitely uh, been mm -hmm. proven so far in their matches i think the important thing about the matchup as well is that timbersaw just is basically a minus one hero for destroying the egg. So yeah, it makes it yeah. very easy for uh, DY not to look for those good eggs in team fights and puts a bit of pressure on Falcons for their next few heroes to have a solution for that egg so they don't just get bullied in 5v5 engagements. Mm. Well, they do have a captain who's, I hear, very proficient on a Mirana. Is that maybe a hero that uh, can be picked up against the egg or are we looking at any role basically? Uh, Murana, yeah. I think, has been a go-to for a while, for sure. Like, it's... Uh, I mean, I'd even consider it worth a ban, considering how well Falcons played the hero anyway, and she's one of the best supports for dealing with it. Uh, I think that would be totally fine here from Extreme if they wanted to remove it. 
Yeah, definitely agree. I think it's, you know, you got to look a little bit towards protecting the Phoenix now that you got to pick it, uh, even though you have Timbersaw against you. Uh, you still want to make the game a bit comfortable for him. But most importantly, I think extreme gaming, think about your lanes, think about your matchups. What's going to lane against the Timber? What mid and safe laner are they going towards here? Because mm. you need stuff that can actually deal with it so you don't just get uh, destroyed early on. So going through most of these games right now where I see the Timber, he stopped being picked when we started getting heroes such as Disruptor Luna against him. So a lot of magic damage in the lane, a lot of burst potential afterwards, but so far from Extreme Gaming we get neither. We get a Phoenix and a Shadow Demon. Shadow Demon uh, is an interesting one, like the poison does hurt, but is it enough or, and how well does that break come into play later on once he gets the Aghanims? It's, I mean, it's, it's the combo decent. that they've been going for, right? They they love the one-two combo of Phoenix and SD, and we've you know had questions, you know, both us on the panel and casters have been talking about how this mm -hmm. combo is a little bit wonky in some ways, doesn't really set up kills that easily, but uh, it, it is their comfort zone. They love how these two heroes function, um, and it, it's an okay lane, uh, okay hero against Timber. You can you know disrupt him and give some space for people to run away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with Extreme, the way that they tend to look towards the Shadow Demon tends to be more of a, a passive and slow style, like we've talked about before. They you know, they have had some success where they actually make some aggressive moves, but for the most part, Zinq is pretty happy to take the Shadow Demon and get a bunch of stacks going. So trying to get things set up for maybe we'll get an offlaner or a mid that can take advantage of that, or perhaps an, an offlaner that at least is really survivable. So it gives a lot of space to the Shadow Demon to go ahead and make those moves. It's Trent, isn't this the same exact uh, set of supports that we saw in some previous game? I remember one of you two basically saying, look at this Hoodwink and CM. They can go with anyone and make kills happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can rotate on any lane. I, I against I, the Shore Ray, yeah. I, yeah. I called it yesterday right? that they had a really nice ganking setup, yeah. Uh, it was Team Falcons. They picked the CM Hoodwink. They then had the Pango, Mars, and Lifestealer. So not going to be a repeat as we have both Lifestealer banned and, of course, Pango also in the band but yeah i love the combo of cm and hoodwink they, they just bring so many spells yeah and like you said lizard the luna comes out like she's been gone for over and over again with a timber saw and they kind of set themselves up for it anyway by taking the shadow demon themselves so with a lot of teams you see shadow demon luna almost immediately comes to mind for extreme it doesn't necessarily guarantee they're going to go for it i'm sure falcons were ready for it though with this like hoodwink kind of an idea of like we want to try and pressure her maybe hunt her a little bit into the jungle um also one of my favorite things uh, never get rid of the Crystal Maiden attack speed talent. The amount of times where his <laughs> common clutch for me is a Crystal Maiden is just ridiculous versus these the Phoenix and he's undying. Dude, it's so good. <laughs> like the late game Dragon Lance, some, sometimes you just need a little bit of help from your support. So <laughs> obviously that's where we'll get with this one. Just yeah. get on top of the egg, hit it. But uh, guys, like right now, what I see from Extreme Gaming is two very passive supports and Kunka not the most active of a core at the moment as well. Um, Am I seeing something wrong about the Kunka, or do they need uh, maybe something with a bit more playmaking? I think he can. Stage? I think he can play pretty active, but this is again how Extreme like to go, just team fight orient. Look at it. They have the Kunka, who's going to go for that Aghanim Scepter for Torrent Storm. They have the Bolt. Mm -hmm. They have the Egg. Now they have Luna Ulti, and you get some nice small combinations here, like SD plus Kunka. You get the disruption into Torrent combo. Um, so I think they have good stuff for them, and uh, Kunga doesn't do that poorly against Timber either, since uh, you mm -hmm. don't have to hit him many times, you just do one big Tidebringer. And uh, they're going to bring out the Alchemist, which is a hero that uh, one of the few losses they've had this tournament was uh, <laughs> courtesy of their Alchemist. <laughs> Didn't go too well for them uh, versus OG. And, uh, you know, it's actually, I was looking at Falcons, you know, because this team is relatively new, obviously, and they formed as a uh, pretty spectacular squad. They currently have a 76% win rate, <laughs> which is pretty disgusting. Damn. But... Yeah, their overall win rate is gross. I was looking at Hero Win, and I was like, oh, they're really good on CM. Wait, no, they're just they're really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're playing in these qualifiers. They're, like, kind of crushing the qualifiers. Then they're going to the tournaments and crushing the tournaments. So I suppose it's not too surprising. But uh, that, another hero who, I guess, you know, we just haven't seen all too much. Uh, I feel like uh, the Alk kind of disappeared for a little bit. And uh, now he's going to come back in here. Works really well with supports like Hoodwink and Crystal Maiden. It's one of those heroes that, you know, you can just be doing your thing and farming. But if the supports are rotating and there's anyone nearby, you can really quickly just go and uh, Grievel's Greed on uh, a hero instead of a creep. 
Is this maybe an answer to the speed that Luna brings to the game? Like, I'm just gonna out-farm you faster and I'll be online with my Blink BKB and whatever is the farming item. Yeah, and I think, I think it, it's also a little... Yeah, per, like, they don't want to fight as extreme a lot of the times, too. And I, I feel like Alchemist, you can really force those fights. Yeah, also, I think Alk, the big thing about having this hero is that, you know, he, he needs a little bit of space and then gets gear capped very fast. And Timber is a great hero for the 4v5 type uh, gameplay. So you can give that space to your Alchemist because Timber plus two very good supports for fighting. And then you have your last pick as well into this. Um, I could easily see Team Falcons generating space for their Alchemist to find that farm. Okay, and now that you see their carry, of course, versus Luna, we've discussed the matchups many, many times and how to counter her, what to do. She came out pretty late into the draft, so no counters yet. Um, what do you do to an alchemist? How do you, how do you, well, first and foremost, Falcons will have a pick, so we can talk about that. Most likely an offlane for them. Uh, that's at least what uh, Extreme Gaming is expecting. Yeah, because I think yeah. since you've removed the Viper too, like you're not super concerned about throwing this timber mid and like, and then being like, oh, it's Kunkka off lane and we picked some hero. Like, I don't really think there's many things left in the pool that are going to ruin a Malreen timber as he's very, very experienced on the hero. So they're comfortable enough just hopping into the uh, the Amara Central Warrunner, which again, uh, you talk about this 4v5 Dota when the Alchemist is off farming doing his thing. Stampede can be a really powerful tool for someone like Timber, Hoodwing, Crystal Maiden, and he's also just got that additional damage to help boost in like these this is a brawling foursome of heroes that can really battle it out with what extreme are showing right now i think overall the centaur will bring bring more you know tempo to the lineup and should be nice to play into these combinations here the centaur hoodwink cm have a great time setting up for each other and extreme gaming though with the less shark last pick here it does look like that's going to be XM, and they put that Kunkka towards the offlane. Mm. So they are doing a bit of a switch up, and Lesh is, you know, probably not going to destroy Timber by any means, but he should be having a very good time before Timber hits level 6. Yeah, I, I think, think you can maybe... Mm -hmm. I was going to say, Long I think shot, the main concern might be the idea of enabling your Leshrac this game, but that, that comes down to like pretty much the stacks and stuff. I mean, you'll have Cleanse later with the Shadow Demon, which can be pretty handy for the Leshrac hero, but we don't have any of these like really solid saving aspects to, to give XM a good time. So uh, it's it might be, you know, you might really want to be hitting that boat, for example, uh, as XXS, perhaps a little bit more onto your uh, Leshrac that you might have to worry about with some of your other allies. They got to they keep this guy up to pump that damage into Malreen and Skitter. Yeah, I have seen a lot of teams make a ton of stacks for Lesh, especially now that you have Shadow Demon and then he smokes up, takes those stacks with Pulse mm -hmm. Nova. Maybe it's something that they can go for and it gives them some continuous damage without cooldown. Um, Vaga, do you like the last pick and the Kunkka being on the offlane? Yeah, I like it quite a bit. I think Kunkka is really good against Alchemist, to be honest. I, I like it due to his harass from the Tidebringer. It works pretty well to keep check on that Alk. And you also have combo to kill him. And primarily, I think this Lesh brings a bit of tower damage to the lineup early game before Luna is really farmed. So they can actually maybe get rid of those tier 1 towers. That's been the big thing. Falcons, their tier 1 towers never really die in the early game. Maybe we see a difference this time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Twin Bro. <laughs> Trent, <laughs> you have a, an extra thought as well. Uh, no, just extreme. You know, they, they've set themselves up with Shadow Demon Phoenix again with Akanka. This looks like a, a lineup that is definitely ready to like collapse in. Like, if you're trying to bring this Pressure's Falcons onto the towers and you're not really careful, that's where you can get got. I think that's how this lineup has worked in the past. Like, some games it seems like we're able to just criticize it really easily because they never get aggressive and make any moves themselves of extreme and then they mm -hmm. get out farmed. But when it does work, it's from teams trying to get aggressive, failing at that, and those quick defensive moves from extreme. So, we'll see if that works out for them again. Okay. Well, thank you, Trent Vaga. Take the reins, Cap and SVG. That we will do, Lizard. Welcome to game two, everybody, of Extreme versus Falcons, with Falcons having a 1-0 lead in this best of five finals. Uh, Avery, I wanted to kind of talk about Falcons in general uh, and just their dominance these last few months. Uh, you were You were a captain of a team. You played up against some of the best teams in the world. You played up against, you know, like, prime og uh when you look at a team that is the best in the world and you try and break it down like how do we beat them if you were to do the same with falcons what would you uh what would you kind of come up with i mean the first thing you realize is you're not going to stop them getting what they want like when teams are in their prime they're on the top of the world 
it's because they get something that they're happy with every game, and you're not going to stop that. You can't go in these games as XG and be like, well, we're just going to make their draft unplayable. And they, they're they're going to not know how they got there. Like, they're going to first pick a flex field. They're going to get a Razor. They're going to get a Timber. They're going to get a DK. They're going to get a Doom. You can't stop these picks coming out. You can't stop the comfortability factor. And I think sometimes it's very easy to just be like, why didn't they just prevent Falcons from doing this, you know, when they, you know they're going to do it because they're the best team in the world right now and they're executing at a very high level. So I think a lot of times it's better to look almost inward, you know, instead of being like, oh, let's try and play versus this. Let's try and play versus the Razor. Or let's try and play versus the Timber. Pick something you want to play that you think the they maybe don't know or aren't used to or is good versus a certain pool of their picks and try and assert that instead and just play to your strengths as a team. And if it doesn't work, then you, were the, you weren't the better team. But I think it's very easy to get very reactionary because you're trying to defeat a Goliath when sometimes it's better to just try and become the next Goliath. And first blood. So XG, straight back into the fighting. They're definitely not going to give up in this series, even though they have lost, what is it now, seven games in a row to Falcons? I believe after that one. <laughs> yeah. Definitely it's... gets in your head a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the record's going up there for sure. Uh, it's funny because we, we, we first were casting that series and talking about, you know, that kind of record. I was thinking in my head, you know, like, Hope Extreme isn't the one to match up against uh, against Falcons in the finals because I'm not sure if they can get over that hill. But then we kind of, as the tournament progressed, it really did show that Extreme is the best, uh, is the best team to go to the grand finals to match up against Falcons and certainly better than uh, Azure Ray uh, as Azure Ray's performance against uh, Falcons was also not that great. So the thing is, who's as good again, you're, you're asking these questions like who has a good win rate versus Falcons? Nobody, mm. there's only really nobody who does. And that's just why teams are, are the best. So again, well, it's not OG. about, <laughs> well, yeah, outside of OG, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what that says, but, you know, lack of focus, as Skeeter put it, I don't know, whatever. Yep, yep, but yep. The thing is, again, you can't look at these things, you know, oh, we lost to them seven times in a row. That means we're never going to beat them. Like, everybody's lost to them seven times in a row. So it doesn't mean you're worse than anybody else. It just means you have to get, you have to raise your execution level. And that is what XG have to do if they want a chance of bringing down the Kings here is raise their execution, be crisper. I think we saw like glimpses of what this team can do in that game one even though it was a very one-sided game right the late game comeback fights they they took advantage of some sloppiness that falcons showed it was not a 100 mm -hmm. clean game from them either and it means if you can up your level of execution if you can take bigger advantage of some of those mistakes then you can find yourself in an advantageous positioning maybe gain some momentum but you can't make as many mistakes as you did in that game one and expect to win and that's really what Dota comes down to, especially in these BO5s. Like, they develop their own draft meta. You're not as concerned about necessarily what was broken in the tournament as much as what's going to be good in the series. And then you have to be able to make less mistakes than your opponent. Well, we'll see uh, how that progresses with this set of heroes as uh, XXS and Jin-Q already off to a decent start with that first blood that they got on the bounties. They've got this disruption into torrent combo, which is pretty nice, though Skeeter has done a good job protecting his support when he can. Uh, mid lane matchup, we got the Timber Saw versus Leshrac. Uh, once again, Timber mid, I mean, I've heard enough complaints from like Quinn about this hero. It's just really hard to stop this guy from being able to farm. Uh, XM is getting him low, but it's just the base damage of Timber Saw is pretty hard to contend with when it comes to CS. But if he lands another Split Earth, might be able to actually keep him out of range of some of this CS at some point. These lanes are going well for XG. And I think they, again, did a pretty decent job in the draft of mitigating the potential damage, forcing the early flex pick. This time it was the Timber. Last game it was the, the Razor. Forcing this hero into a position where he's not going to have a straightforward lane no matter where they put it. He, this Timber yep. would have had to go against a Luna dual lane, arguably the best carry against this hero, or the Leshrac mid, which is a very good matchup for the Lesh in the lane, but also the, the mid game. Decent amount of spell bursts that can come out from this XG lineup to deal with that Timber saw. So I think once again, they put themselves in a position where if they play this early game well, like, it can be very good for them here. I would favor the mid matchup for XM. I would favor Ame top with this Luna, at least, you know, mo mainly free farming. He's not going to disrupt ATF and what he's doing up here, but it's a Centaur, so 
you can't have too high expectations for last pick centaur here. And you know, this Kunkka was like your earlier flex pick in the draft, and XXS is free farming down here. So you can't really ask for much more. Again, I think the drafts have been fine for XG. It's just you have to step up at some point, and Falcons are going to continue to put the pressure on as they do have some very strong kill combinations in this game. I think that is the strength of this lineup to me. You have Centaur Hoodwink, you have CM Alk. These are very strong dual kill lanes, but as we go into these fights, just a lot of long range damage that can follow up the stunners here. You go in with a host stomp, you go in with an alchemist stun concoction. Radiant Suddenly, Timbersaw goes in, deals a thousand gear damage. Hoodwink shoots you with 600 magical damage. CM throws some nukes. It's a lot of running balling down power. heroes. Hey, so the, the bottom lane, they saw the opening where uh, the early go from Skeeter, he used Unstable Concoction and Acid Spray, immediately X success, wanting to get aggressive. They're like, all right, those spells are on cooldown. It's time to jam. They finally found that opening on the Crystal Maiden. Mid lane XM got Malreen low enough that he actually had to timber chain back to base. Uh, so now the lane is kind of reset and Malreen will probably be fine for the rest of it. Um, but, you know, obviously that gives uh, XM the experience advantage. He's going to hit level six first. And uh, then we saw Falcons also be able to get the kill at top lane as well. So they also found an opening on the support. I mean, XM's playing this lane really well. This is a, I mean, this is a lane less should free farm, but he basically got a full level advantage here. He's up a decent amount of CS, and it's going to create a gank opportunity. I don't know if they have the damage for this, but if they get a TP rotation out of it, I think they're happy with this outcome. You know, they have some catapult damage going through. They have edict damage going through, and now XM's oh, going to try and run, run down, down crit. Support. He's going to run out of mana soon. Has a wand to be able to refresh it up. Crit. Okay, they Dang. get him on the poison that Jin okay. Q pops. So. They not only force the rotation, bring Mal they get a lot of tower damage, uh, but they also get that kill after the rotation occurs and will be able to secure power rune. So that sweep did so many things there for Extreme. Yes, it did a huge amount. You continue to push Malrin off the waves, you get the tower damage, you get the deep ward as XM placed that OBS behind the tier one there. That's going to pay off later. You get some extra mm. support XP and that amp damage rune, like you said, it's a nice rotation from XG and they're not losing too much on the sides here as you know you're giving solo xp to a luna and a kunkka very happy about that to try and push towards some fast level sixes here jin q gonna make some space and tp out even so look at dy he's gonna try and sneak it the crit sees him coming oh no dy gets the ward down so he's not gonna show himself until last second he's gonna try and dive for the wisdom rune shows himself on the courier he now goes for the dive crit intercepts him with a perfectly timed bushwhack and he'll take the wisdom rune Ah, man, that was that was a fun little play of actions. At least it doesn't cost DY his life. You know, no harm, no foul. Crit, yeah, happy exactly. to secure that as do not want to lose both here with arguably the faster support duo. You want to be ahead with, if you're this maiden hoodwink, especially going into the later portion of this game. So far, I think XG very happy about this early game. Very happy with the position XM is in, and they're going to rotate him bottom with that amp damage room. Level 3 edict up already. This is a nasty amount of damage. And I don't think hmm. Skeeter wants to really fight this. Like, he has ult, but he can get bursted in this fight if it develops. Marines coming in. They're going to go straight for XM. They're going to blow him oh, up. What a rotation. Get that kill. Nice kind of rotation from Malreen. Is Extreme just trying a bit too much to force things? I don't think XM wanted to do that. I think he was very happy just taking the tower with his amp damage. And yeah. uh, Jin Q and XXS forced him to make a move that was not comfortable. I mean, I think that move's okay. More smileys coming out. I mean, yeah, they are continuing to put the, the mental strain on XM here as he returns the favor. I think that move is okay, but I think it's... If you're diving, you have to be going on the, the Alchemist so that he can't return the, the concoction damage into your, your Leshrac and then set that kill up for Maureen. Because I, I think Lesh can kill Skeeter here if they go on him first, but the way that gets set up, you're basically just trading Maiden for them to go on your Lesh, and that is... Worst case scenario, that cost XM a lot of momentum there. And when I talked about execution, these are the things that wins, win and lose you games versus team right now. Falcon's going to take advantage of it, make a move of their own. Stampede to run down Ame. TP's coming in, XXS coming in with the Torrent Boat. Can he land any of this though? He put it all on Ame and they actually backed away. Now they did get the X on Amar and pulled him back into his doom, but they didn't get the catch on any of these other heroes. Oh, never mind, Jin Q. Hits the disruption right before Crit is able to get the TP out, so they'll run him down while XM does end up dying in the mid lane. Coming back, Maureen, big hit! 
Oh, what a whirling death. That did some damage right there, and he'll get Jin Q next, too. There's not much to stop him here. His disruption's just not going to be up in time. Double kill for Maureen as they tried to chase down Crit. Couldn't even get that kill. Uh, a disaster in the end for XG as they turn on the kill on Ame, but Skeeter with this crazy rotation mid just catches XM off guard. Not expecting this Alchemist to be ganking him mid with a Maiden. Super heads up play by Skeeter to make that happen. Making XM's game even worser, who had the, the best start. This guy was a thousand ahead of Maureen, and he's now tied. Radiance bottom tower is under attack. As Skeeter is super far ahead now. He got so much gold off some of these kills. This will be a huge pickup, but not enough damage. Not enough damage. Maureen actually going Maybe in? some of those deaths. Man, Maureen thinking about going back in at him. That is bold. Snaking. Uh, snake. Part of the reason why Snaking sets up the kill for Maureen to collect. They they just need to bring more heroes around XM right now. Because Falcons are bringing the numbers behind Maureen and he is getting the job done. Both these mid heroes are going to function similarly. They're big damage outputters, but they need help, they need setup, they need stuns to make that work. And right now it's just a little cleaner from Falcons. They're getting there a little faster. The stuns are a bit longer range and more reliable than the Phoenix Shadow Demon right now, too which is helping out. And the whole time all this is happening, Mr. Alchemist is putting Grievel's Greed to use as... I mean, this is an insane pace Skeeter's on. Now, I know we say that a lot about Alchemist, but he's already at 600 GPM. He's at 7,000 net worth at the 11 minute mark. This is going to be an 1130 Radiance here. Radiance bottom tower what? is under attack. <laughs> what what yeah, is this, this kind dude? of net worth before your farming item? Yeah, he's just going to accelerate faster and faster unless Extreme can find a way to stop it. Now, part of the way they're trying to stop it is put pressure on objectives. They finally take that mid tower. Snaking doesn't want to let him get away. Hit the frostbite. They hit the follow up shot. And the Chakram is right on point. Maureen giving him a hand down to the fountain. Dude, XM's game is gone at this point, man. Whatever game he thought he was going to have here, the all chat. Put a nail in a coffin on it. I mean, this could have been a game where this Lesh is highest net worth having taken tier one men and tier one bottom by like 10 minutes. And yeah. then you imagine the trajectory difference that Skeeter would have been on if he'd lost those towers, didn't get that mid kill on the Lesh. Maybe he gets killed by the Lesh. These are the things that just set these games up for such different paths. Next year, you're going to have to make up for it somewhere. Try and get XXS XO involved. Torrent. Just to blow up uh, Snake King, but they're still getting kills. Still Maureen, finding opportunities. Just on a rampage here. From a rough laning phase, he's still made the openings happen. Five and zero for this Timber. I guess you could say the same for XXS, who's honestly maybe having the best game of any, anybody on XG at this point. He is pretty strong on this Kunkka. He's made some good moves, found some boat connections, is rushing the Ags. So if XG get a fast Torrent Storm here, that's a... That's a powerful spell versus Falcon's lineup here. They don't have a lot of early BKB rushers outside of Skeeter. And this is going to be a fast Ags. Like, he's a thousand off it. If you can fight around that Torrent Storm, that could be a way to drag XM back in this game, along with some stacking action. But these are stacks that, yeah, XM's happy to take them right now, but Ame would have been happier. Skeeter's up here farming away. There's three heroes up here, but they're not really, uh, they don't really have much kill power between them unless they're immediately grouped up or something, some sort of disruption. But really, just putting yourself in a, a possibility that Falcons finds you, runs you down, and they'll get them on the bushwhack. Pull them back in. Frost, uh, sneaking, looking for a frostbite opening, doesn't find it. And now Falcons will go back to take that tower. And Extreme, yeah, it, it feels like they're going to default to their same mode that they've kind of been in Falcons in their upper bracket series. And now, and we saw it in game one as well, they're just going to have to kind of default to letting Falcons do what they want to do until they hit the time of the year talking about, probably with that Aghanim Scepter on Kunkka. Yeah, it's got to be the Torrent Storm here. XM timings are just going to be way too slow. Maybe Ame can join the fight, but he doesn't have the levels for the Eclipse points yet as he's just farming it up. So right now, Falcons can dictate some of the pace here if they want to. They have a lot of what they need. I think they're just looking for the ATF blink 
and they're going to be ready to, to make some aggressive moves as he went the blade mail on the centaur so if you put a blink on the centaur on top of that blade mail he's gonna be a real nuisance going in the fight you don't want to eclipse him you don't want to output your lashrak damage on him it's a lot of space and a lot of time he's going to create for Malrin to get in there and start dealing some damage. And yeah, that deep this, obs uh, might pay off later for sure. This support duo, man, just sets up like Amar is always. I think about it to like XXS Slardar, where he felt pressure to go this blink danger. Just it shows that Amar never feels pressured to go for the early item, uh, the early initiation item. He can always go for the the item that allows him to scale a bit more, farm a bit more. Uh, every single time. I think of the same that was like Skeeter versus Ame right now. Skeeter is just loving life. Ame scrounging around in Ancients and stuff. We're doing what he can, but the game oh, is, is set up for Skeeter's jump. success, and he's going to show up with a Blink Dagger Radiance and just take it straight to Ame. Immediate disruption. Try and dodge some damage. Supernova right in the middle of this effect with the boat going out. A really well response from Extreme. That was fantastic. They saw that game coming, I think. They had it well planned out. A disruption plus supernova that breaks Falcon's initiation. You know the craziest part about that is he... XXS did not even pull the trigger on Torrent Storm there. Wait, like, <laughs> really? How? He had it for this fight. I mean, he got bushwhacked, but... I, I almost would have just thrown it out the second Skeeter jumped, but they didn't need it. That's very close, but that's a hard jump from Skeeter without BKB. I think the strength of Alka in this game is he can get a fast BKB and then your damage against him kind of goes out the window for a while. To make that go without it is... I mean, that's a that's a lot of momentum swung back the way of XG because now this, this Alka is having an insane timing. It's going to get slowed down. You're going to give some time back to Ame to catch up. XM got some decent gold out of that. Top tower is under attack. Felt a little Kill forced. combo of Crit and Malreen going for the pickoff on Ame. Got him on the bushwhack. Cuts him down. Does a lot of damage, but Ame's decently tanky. And now the punish is here once again. Extreme. Once again, with their reactive play style, might be able to stop Falcon's aggression. They're going to get the kill on Malreen. He goes through a timber chain completely with no trees to get him out of that situation. So damage, not enough right now for Falcons. Trying to make these two or three kill combination plays that we're used to seeing from them. Falling a little short. And XG, again, they have their defensive support line up here that we've seen work pretty well for them. This Phoenix Shattered Demon, they've played it before. A lot of turnaround potential. Disruption to buy time, boat to buy time, egg sunray to buy time. It's not that easy to just go in here and commit on a hero. And then you have multiple stun interrupts for this Timber Saw on the back end. Maureen unable to escape. Doesn't have his defensive item either. Is going that Eternal Shroud. I mean, these are moves that Falcons are making. I don't think they had to make them. It's costing them a lot in terms of their timing getting to the, the big survivability here. Just being maybe a bit overly ambitious. Maybe the, the lead that they have taken over Extreme time and time again makes them feel like they're stronger than they actually are and not as patient as they should be. Just waiting for those items that allow them to be able to survive through the uh, the reactions of Extreme. And those items will come eventually, but as you said, they are delayed. They're not going to hit quite as hard. That BKB is coming up at 1,000 gold. That's a very short amount of time for an Alchemist to get. Uh, that Eternal Shroud, it's uh, it's coming in right now, so he's got that item. But those are two moves in the last, you know, three, four minutes that you just delay him two minutes and you would have had a much bigger hit. An Alchemist is probably the hero that you do not want to mess those windows up with because he's very sensitive to having those item timings work. There's a hero entirely based around net worth advantage and what you can do with that. And if you mess they those moves go. up, it really hurts. This is another Extreme. hard jump. Extreme are baiting out XM again. Yeah. And if they went on it, it would have been terrible. Because they would have disrupted XM. He would have come back with a Bloodstone and a bunch of damage to throw around. I just don't think they would have bursted him. So good read by Falcons not to take that bait there. And he's recovered in this game. So we're talking about these moves not working. The the big downside for Falcons, maybe in a normal game, you know, it's not that bad. But they kind of gave XM a, a chance back in this game. And now he's tied for highest level along with Skeeter. He's the highest net worth basically on XG. This is a hero that can come back easily. They're going to make a poke on Ame, but it's <laughs> just not they afraid. Don't e yeah, they're, they're just straight up. They're just like poking at him to see if there's heroes behind him. 
And there there kind of wasn't. There was just Jin Q who's walking along. Uh, the rest of the heroes are all in the triangle. But you can see Falcons, are, they, they have adapted and that they know that Extreme is playing very grouped up and they're putting cores out there. They're putting Ame out there. They're putting XM out there and, and trying to get Falcons to bite. And it's one of those situations, you know, fool me once, shame on you. They got fooled a second time. Hey, that's shame on Falcons, but <laughs> you can't get fooled again, surely. Look for crit, and they'll get him here. Blink on Jin Q guarantees the catch. That's a nice little pickoff. In the end. Strike down. I mean, okay. We're, we're at a point now where we're going to hit the 20-minute mark. This game is dead even. You're against an Alk, and you're dead even. XG has lost seven games in a row to this team. This is a very decisive moment, because to me, this is the best chance they've had in any game to actually win it. I don't know what's going to happen from here on out. I mean, they might just lose horribly <laughs> and nothing goes well for them again. But if you look at this game right now in this state, like I think they're I think they're favored, honestly. Small Rain is all over the place. Man's in deep, desperately trying to get away from the Kunkka. But as you said, there are a lot of different stuns that mess with Small Rain's uh, Timber Saw and XM. I've been waiting a, a minute to get that tip out. Yeah, I, I don't Finally think XG it. are as tilted or maybe on the back foot as falcons want them to be right now that's how i'm yeah. feeling about it like I, I think xg are kind of just playing their game i don't think they're playing too bad of a game here again i think this is maybe the best chance they've been in to put themselves in a position to win one of these games because i just don't think this alka is gonna scale tremendously well over the next 10 to 15 minutes here i think if ame gets to bkb you have disruption you have egg you have boat to buff this Luna up in the middle of the fight. These are hard targets for the Alk to jump. And Alk's kind of like a survivability carry. Until the six slots come out, he doesn't just shred an enemy hero. He just wins the fight by surviving and burning you down in acid spray and radiance and creating space for his other heroes. If this Luna can stand his ground, if this Lesh can stand his ground and just burn the Alk down, a lot of that goes out the window for Skeeter here. So he needs his next set of damage items. Like that BKB timing. We have not seen it put to use yet. I think some of it is just, like, who do you jump here with this lineup? Mm. You, you have a bunch of defensive items. You have two Eternal Shrouds between this Timber and Centaur, and you have your Alk BKB, but you can't force the fight. That feels a little bad right now for Falcons. These are not farming items. They're fighting items. And in which case, it gives extreme if... if Falcons isn't able to force it right now. It gets extreme their chance to get their BKBs. In which case, you know, BKB for BKB. Okay, if the fight goes long enough, our BKBs both go down and then the magic damage from this Lash Track starts kicking into play again. And it, you gotta remember, this Lash is a hero that a lot of teams were first picking. Uh, this is a hero that Liquid first picked for most of this tournament. Like, this is a very powerful hero in the right game and they got a last here. He has some buffs to go with him. He doesn't have like an IO or something, but it's a hero that generally scales very well versus the Timber versus the Alk. You can get to that very late game where you have the armor item, you have the Shiva's Guard, whatever you want to go. They've been trying be real hard to catch this Hoodwink, and they smoke him to turn back the aggression back onto DY, not onto XXS. It's not the person they ran into. XXS now has a Bloodstone complete. Skeeter's going to end up stunning himself. Are they going to go back in on this? They do. They slow him down with the purge, get a bit of damage. Stampede goes off. X, not thrown out by XXS. Knows the BKB is going to last a bit too long, but the time is played oh, out. Mari's back into play with a big whirling death hit. Split Earth goes out from the last strike. They identified the last strike, but he got the Bloodstone. The Bloodstone keeping him alive through the blade mills, and Ooh, there's the Shredder of Ame. Cutting Falcons down to size. Maureen, of course, gets a kill on his way out, but he's way out the door, down to death. And that is three cores dead for Falcons. That was, I mean, those were just nasty torrents from XXS that allow XM to get back in there with a very clutch Bloodstone activation. And that's all she wrote. I mean, that that potentially was going to be very bad for, for XG because they committed so much on the Alk BKB. But again, we're seeing oh, the amount of damage the they can pump out. And yeah, you're, you're not getting away with that. There is no way you're getting away with that. And that is going to be the full five-man team wipe into Roshan for XG. This is a very solid position for them. That was a very 
very important team fight to win for this Roshan for Falcons if they wanted to snowball this game with an Alchemist into not an easy Alchemist anti lineup. Like, you have to deal yeah. with Shadow Demon, Demonic Purge, and Disruption. You have to deal with Luna, who can get items that outscale you at a certain point. Phoenix is a hard hero to go on because if you commit on the Phoenix and he eggs, then you're stuck there wasting more of your BKB duration. This is not going to be an easy game for Falcons, and it's not going to be an easy game for Skeeter to find his footing. As we saw there, like, his biggest value in that fight was baiting spells out. <laughs> He's not killing people. He's just trying to create space for his other two cores, but if you get caught on the backside, it's a oh, nasty Maureen. amount of damage. He just timber chained forward. No BKB for this guy, so stun after stun and the damage that gets pumped out. The Sun Ray mixed with all the magic damage of XM. <laughs> Eternal Shroud, there's, there's just not enough magic resistance in the world to deal with that. His team fight is becoming incredibly strong for XG when they're together. They have very strong scaling supports and this Kunkka, man. XXS is just, he just played an incredibly solid game. Found those yeah. openings in the early game with Boat. He he's also punished the mobility here. This X has been pretty damn value versus the Timber and the Centaur. Goes back to that meta where we had all these offlaners being traded out in the first phase. There was a point where a lot of teams were picking the Kunkka against the first big centaur. Because it's one of these heroes that can control you through the stampede, create a team fight situation where, okay, yeah, Amar is gonna go in, he's gonna blade mail, he's gonna double edge you, he's gonna be tanky, but you're not winning. Those spells are not nearly as strong as you getting Oat Torrent Storm and you're stuck there. The XXS has just been dictating this game and Falcons looking for answers for the first time against this team. Like, how do they solve this problem right now? And yeah, they now they're the ones time? trying to ride out side lanes with the Alchemist deep in the enemy jungle with Crit taking a, a tier one tower for himself and it's extreme saying, yeah, go ahead. Take those objectives. We'll go for the tier three. Oh. We'll push high ground. We'll force you guys back. Like what you've wave. done to us time and time again. Nice bushwhack. Maureen jumps in for a bit of damage on Ame. Just trying to threaten him. See if they can take this Aegis for free and not let Ame continue to take towers. I mean, XG do not want to back here. They have everything they need right now in terms of all these timings syncing up. They have their two bloodstones. They still have Aegis for 230. And where's the saves? Oh, BKB and Bloodstone are about to be up with the Supernova underneath it. XM, he does not die, and they push forward. Running down with the Torrent Tidal Wave, pushing back Skeeter. Not good enough, though. It's just a bit. Ame still got a play for this one, as he does still have that Aegis. Torrent X pulls back onto jump in. Malreen brings down the first life while they trade out on the Hoodwing. Oh, Jin Q wants Skeeter. And they continue to take this barracks, though. No BKB. Pull him back in. Yeah, they pulled him into the Torrent Storm with a Tidal Wave. Skeeter has nothing he can do about that one. And it goes from Elena Barracks that Falcons try to pull. And XD immediately coming out from Jin Q. <laughs> they know they are on the precipice here of taking Falcons down in a game two and evening out the series. The first time that they will win a game against Falcons in this season. Another Tidal Wave pullback. Another pick off on Falcons. It's beginning to get a little bit sloppy. Disruption goes out. XM, Torrent into a split earth. They're just feeding kill after kill, pick off just after collapses. pick off. One lane of barracks has turned to two, has turned to throne potentially as Falcons. <laughs> they have just fallen apart in the last minute. I mean, they're going to X the Lesh to base. I don't know if they're done here. Like this is, this is the definition of blood in the water right now is XG are just feasting on Falcon's corpses. Just one after another. Just no respect for the initiation range on XXS right now. Every single tidal wave, every single X has led into a kill. There's only one BKB carrier. So all these mini stuns, all this spell damage is just guaranteed. And so much of that fight on that high ground push came down to a perfect disruption from Jin Q to, to bail out that XM rush track. Because if he goes down there before BKB Bloodstone, you, you can throw a lot of this net worthly back towards Falcons, but the fact he gets disrupted, BKB Bloodstone, you can't all in him. That's the downside of this Alchemist lineup. You don't have that physical damage to punch through the BKB here. It bails out Lesh, and I mean, this game continues to snowball. They are not going to wait for Roshan here. This is a team that they are resilient. They are showing it. Did you trash talk them one too many times? The silence from the Falcon side. 
Yeah, where's the Bit alt deafening. chat now? A push is coming and extreme. Now we have seen teams try and end games in this tournament, Avery, a little bit too early. That is absolutely true. But I, I don't know, man. I mean, there's something to be said about when you're feeling the momentum, when you're trying to get your first win against this team ever. <laughs> you cannot play not to stun lose. Goes you have trying to play to, blow to win. Up XM. XM disrupted. Skeeter forced to go for a stun on somebody else, but now he's been purged up, and the damage from Ame is overwhelming the BKB. No he's got the physical damage to be able to cut him down. Maureen tries to jump in, do what he can, but Drag the BKB's like, what a play from XXS, man. These Torrent Storms and Tidal Waves just do not stop. They push Falcons over the edge and take them down in game two, and that will even up the series. Uh, what a what a comeback game from XG. Uh, you lose that game, you're probably just out of this series. I, it's too much morale loss, but they get some comfort picks. They get a support duo that they've proven works for them. They play a really nice early game on terms of the lanes. They throw a bit of it away. That 10 to 15 minute period was very scary for them. I was worried for XM, but they gave them the stacks. They gave them the recovery. They trusted that Ame could find the farm elsewhere on the map. And then the second XXS gets that Ags and you fail that initial mid-fight with the Alchemist blink timing, it just doesn't feel like there's a way back into the fight for Falcons. XXS yeah. way too strong, way too much of a brick wall. Tremendous game. Had the boat rotation top, had the counterplay mid in the right place at the right time. Torrent Storm's on point. Torrent Wave's on point. This mm -hmm. man was just a beast. It, I mean, if I'm XG, I'm giving this man Kunkka again after that. Like, goddamn, yeah. you know? Now, there were some factors that helped him out. I think Alk is... A decent lane for this hero if you don't get killed level one or two i think he's just free farming mm -hmm. down there he doesn't need much help jin q can then stack on the shatter demon and set that game up really well for the other three cores but a very nice game from xg and again i i this is a type of lineup from falcons where you want to put them in this position where you feel like you can actually outscale them. yeah maybe crit's getting yeah. this glaipner on the hoodwink he's becoming a fourth core maybe atf's getting a lot of farm but it's on heroes that if you hit your BKB timing, if you hit that five man, they run out of that physical damage and suddenly they fall a little short instead of you. And you're asserting something against them, which is this Lashrac Torrent Storm type lineup that they maybe haven't seen in a bit, right? Like, where's this Kunkka Ben in this tournament? We haven't seen him a lot. This is a hero that fell out of the wayside, but still a very powerful hero against these other spellcasters like the Timber, like the Centaur. Just a very clutch pick. And I think this is uh, really important for a couple of reasons, right? It, Extreme stuck to a reactionary play style when, you know, uh, I think a lot of criticism was coming for, you know, you're letting Falcons set the, the tempo, set the pace, uh, but them responding to Falcons plays uh, worked very well in this game too. Uh, and obviously there's one, I mean, there's a lot of hype here, but uh, for, for them being able to win a game because the expectation for a lot of people was Falcons probably 3-0-ing whoever showed up in the grand finals. And Extreme being the one who has played Falcons and had the hardest time being able to get over that hill. 0-7 and seven going into this game. Being able to write that chip uh, says a lot. Now that is just one game the best of five. All they've done is tie up the series. <laughs> that is true. But <laughs> it shows that they can take down Falcons. Will they take them down in a full-out series is an entirely different question and a question we're going to pose to our panel. The gods can bleed. First time this season, Team Falcons has lost to Team Extreme Gaming. Extreme Gaming, they win and they win with some fashion. They win in their style as well. And they win on this Kunkas boat, just like Cap said. Guys, is XXS the MVP and the sole and main reason why they won, or what else happened here? Nope. I Waga? was gonna see ah, if you go. wanted to say something about that trend. Oh, sure, sorry. I'll, I thought uh, we kind of had like a Waga uh, was going right. first, then sure, I was sure. going okay. thing. So I, uh, I just thought it would okay, make it I'll, easier. I'll, I'll break it down. I'll break it down. So definitely, I think the Kunkka was huge. This is one of the rare times where Kunkka was not banned in the first phase against Extreme Gaming as well. And they pounced on the opportunity to say, OK, we'll play that. And we can see how well it worked out for them. They have this huge team fight draft. And here is pretty much the turning point of the entire game, right? This is the deciding factor. This bloody Torrent Storm right here with the Bloodstone buff from it, it just decimates all of Falcon. 
Yeah, that was actually terrifying. I, I thought that their decision to go in when they saw Skeeter stun himself was going to be bad. Like, I, I actually thought it was going to be total disaster because then the stun comes in immediately after from Amari, and you're like, oh, there it goes. But that Torrent Storm bailed them out completely. And what I really like is that they kept the, the pedal, like, just going down, like, full on, full gas after that. Because previously, we've seen some teams take a lead versus Falcons, but when they have some of these heroes, like the Centaur and the Timber, like, these real signature heroes, they can bring it back in the late game. Now, in this case, I would say the match is probably pretty good for Extreme anyway if they want to go late, but they didn't really have to worry about that. They used this Aegis to the full potential, and they just, sw like, just swam right through this game. I mean, Lord Poseidon himself here, XXS, just absolutely bailing them out of this one. It felt like in this situation right here, a lot of teams would just decide to concede one of the sides and maybe split push uh, with an alchemist. Instead, Team Falcons, they decided to fight. They decided to go in, almost took down the Lash, but almost is the factor that mattered the most, right? They mm. didn't kill him, and because of that, most likely, they lost the game afterwards. Do you guys think that maybe there is some overconfidence as well in play for the Falcons? Well you have to remember that it's been uh, almost six days since they lost. Uh, actually, it has been six days since they lost the game. They don't actually remember how to defend high ground since they haven't had to do it in a while. <laughs> um, yeah, they've been the crushing the game so hard. They were like, oh, right, yeah. So that, that was probably the issue. Yeah, no, I think, you know, the high ground defense, I think it's more of a symptom of the problem than the problem itself. Like, you already found yourself in a situation where the steam... Steam Machine came from Extreme Gaming, and once they hit your high ground with a Luna and a super strong five-man draft, at that point, it doesn't really matter much what you do. It's super hard to defend against. It's more about what happened before that. They chose to take <laughs> fights into five of Extreme Gaming when their Alchemist didn't really have the full gear cap that he may have wanted. So yeah, that was uh, that was a tough one. Man, when you're getting the, the line of the bomb screen, just like, they won a game! Woo! <laughs> that, look, look, the look, champagne's you, usually, out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're parsing, yeah. The meme, you know, when the third place yeah. is just using the champagne. Anyways, um, guys, usually what I would ask right now is... Uh, what went wrong for for the losing team? How can they adjust to the next game? I'll I'll t t turn it upside down a little bit. How can Extreme Gaming repeat this? Because this is only the first win out of what seven or eight games. What can they do to actually take a game off of Falcons again in this series? I think they showed beautifully here that once they're in their comfort zone, playing heroes that they all deliver on usually, you know, like they get the SD Phoenix, they get what they want, they have the XXS Kunkka, they deliver really, really well. And the important part was the first five minutes. Every single core was ahead of their counterpart in net worth. Even the Luna was ahead of the Alchemist in net worth, which is, you know, a huge uh, thing for her. So I think the big thing, again, we've been talking about a lot, Focus, focus, focus on that first five, first ten minutes. And then, you know, Extreme Gaming, they know how to execute team fights. We all know that they, you know, play those really well. So for them, it's just survival. I think that early rotation from XM was also really nice to the bottom lane. It unfortunately it resulted in them getting triple killed, I think. But I thought the idea was great. Using the rune, coming down, attacking the tower. Maybe not dive so far behind the tower in that situation. But I was just happy to see them actually trying to get that early aggression going down there in the first place. So I'll take that as a win, even if that part was an L. But then they eventually got the win anyway, so it's fine. Mm. And when we talk about momentum, when it when we talk about the the spirits, I've seen some um, XDs in the chat. Do you guys <laughs> think that they're in uh, really good spirits after this game? I think Zinqiu is. <laughs> He's feeling himself after that game. Uh, yeah, that was it's great. It's great to see a team, you know, uh, not not seem to get demoralized or fall apart from the uh, you know some tips and DMs that we might see from Falcons, but instead step it up and here punch back a bit so i'm super hyped for the next game it should be a lot of fun yeah every time they're on the camps they look very cheery over there on xg right and the start of the game as well we had malreen and xm just trading i think he said uh, xm god at the start of game one so you know some, some fun <laughs> some respect back and forth here and uh we, we will get ourselves a third game yeah malreen did a lot of tipping uh in this not not necessarily in this series but through the playoffs well to be frank it's not only him on his team that does it i didn't see anything written after the xd of zinq so maybe they're saving those replies for game number three which will come back just after the short break
Quick little break and we're back to the grand finals of Elite League where Falcons are matched pretty evenly, at least against Extreme Gaming at the moment. 1-1 is the score. The last time Falcons lost against Extreme Gaming, well, this season never, but they have dropped some games in round robin group stages of the tournament. Most importantly, I believe they lost 2-0 to OG and they did drop a couple of games here and there from different teams like Heroic and I believe Team Spirit. So they definitely can lose, it's not extraordinary, but Extreme Gaming definitely had to pull out their best stuff in order to accomplish that in game number two. Can they accomplish the same thing in game number three? It looked very promising and it looked uh, very strong from them, didn't it, boys? Yeah, I think more importantly, this game too, getting a win here, I mean, first of all, you, you keep yourself away from being the oh one game and you're you're out the elimination uh but more so the mental healing right you play against falcons they they love getting under your skin i think this was a big win for extreme gaming just to you know get that one in there get a nice win pretty quick win too 29 minutes and very dominant fashion they never died on their carry um i think mental healing was the the biggest boon here from this second game now it's time to go on the offensive. I want this game to start. I want to see tips flying out here, right? The second we're crossing the river, you know, we're going to go check out some runes and stuff. Like, let, let's get the tips absolutely flying here from XG. They, they've they been dabbling a little bit. Falcons got really quiet. I, I think it's time to, to go on the offensive with the mental trash. So no more you, so no more waiting for Malwin to ask you if you're exactly. going to tip him or not. You instantly, the moment the game loads, you're like tipping him during the draft yeah. stage. You're spamming voice lines. In there. Five tips. Except you well, don't go look, for Malreen. Yeah. You just all tip snaking at the start. You, you got to throw them off. Like, why are they tipping, <laughs> why why are they tipping me? You know? You got you to go for the quiet one. Wait, I, I think guessing. there was an interview. I can't remember with which uh, player, but they said something about... I think Liquid, yeah. I'm not sure. But they would tip Puppy every time Secret would lose, and everyone would be like, why the hell? Uh, oh, Celery, I think, was talking about that game in Gladiators. Like, they would be tipping Puppy and everyone would be why are they tipping Puppy? And it would bring confusion, so maybe some mental aspect uh, that they can bring uh, to their orders on the side of Extreme Gaming. But if they continue playing the way they played in game number two, I don't think they need a lot of those kind of games to help them out. Um, and if they, of course, manage to get a similar draft. We are in a draft, and uh, Chen, Phoenix, so far in a Dragonite. No Kunkka, which is something, Vaga, that you were uh, talking about in the green green room, let's call it that way. Yeah, a hero that I think can, you know, be very important. Uh, Falcons, importantly, they did choose to have second pick here. So they want to put Extreme Gaming in the position of having to first pick. If you first pick open with the Kunkka, there, you know, is potential for some, some counters to that. I mean, worked out really well in last game, but that's because he had a lot of lanes he could have gone to that would have worked well. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe this is a bit of a bait, leave it in. They do get rid of the Phoenix, though. The most important factor, I think, for these team fights has always been the Supernova. 
Yeah, I think that there's a chance it might have slipped under the radar against some teams and been like, oh, you know, it was the Conca that was so important or like that late Leshrac. I think Leshrac probably will be banned out in the later stages of this draft if it still looks somewhat reasonable here or maybe picked up by Falcons themselves. Who knows? But uh, I definitely like going right for the uh, the Phoenix and they're even just going to double up. Get, still get rid of the Phoenix, still get rid of the Conca. Uh, let's really try and push extreme back towards uh, some other style. This is something that you guys also talked about, right? Like, if you won against the team so many times in a row and now you lost to one certain strategy, you can just uh, dismantle that strategy in the drafting stage already by banning out some of those heroes. Is there anything that Extreme Gaming can do here when it comes to Team Falcon's bans? Do I mean, they, they still get the Disruptor adjust? at least. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, yeah. I think that's nice, right? Like, that's a super solid position uh, position 5 opener right now. Probably one of the best heroes you can take first overall at the moment. Doesn't give anything away. They are going to remove the Razor themselves. That was the other hero that, you know, Falcons obviously will go for that straight up. I don't know if Extreme necessarily would. Yeah, I wonder if they uh, give thoughts to Shadow Ooh. Demon, though, instead of Disruptor. And there it is. The Shadow Demon, I think, is more comfortable for Extreme Gaming. And while the Dis Disruptor is something they did in the game 1, it didn't really work out that well for them. Uh, and if I Shadow Demon was banned too in those situations, right? Just like you're saying, like they, yeah. they still, I think it, to their eyes, this hero is more important. The value and difference is that Disruptor, he's great early on, but once those triple BKBs come online, you feel a bit awkward, where Shadow Demon's still great. You can still save people with Disruption. You can still ulti someone and slow them down during their BKB. So uh, I, I actually approve this choice by Extreme Gaming here. Hmm. Seal of, seal of approval by Vaga. By the way, disruption, speaking of disruptor, not disruption, if Falcons take it, Shadow Demon is kind of fine against him, isn't he, Trent? If they take what, sorry? If they take disruptor for Falcons, is it Oh, Shadow yes, Demon yeah, if they immediately answer back. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, that is just, immediately you have your own answers there. I don't even know, have Falcons even gotten to play disruptor? I'm like trying to picture a Falcons disruptor. How do you, uh, they have picked it up a couple I times, but. It, I wouldn't be surprised that there's just not a lot of opportunities be, mm -hmm. based on like the draft and how often they end up shit, like handing the first pick over to this this flex, right? It's kind of hard for them to get their hands on someone like Disruptor because they want to get this 2-3 flex hero instead of the opener. Mm. One thing that I need to say is I love seeing something like Razor band out, maybe even a Slardar in a different game because it opens up the draft a lot. Like When there's a Razor or a Slardar in a game, so many carries are just like you can't play them anymore, right? But uh, I feel it's way more open now for XG and Falcons. Yeah, and keeping it open by banning out the Lifestealer as well. That's also a hero that just demolishes so many of your options for Extreme if they want to offlane something. You know, we've seen it time and time again how independent the Lifestealer is. He can just stand against most offlaners very well. And that's what Falcons want. They want uh, side lanes that can be fine on their own so their support duo can start running around together. That's how they play, that's how they always want to play. So uh, getting rid of, you know, Doom and Lifestealer, two heroes that uh, really operate well for that playstyle. Mm -hmm. Worth noting that uh, there are two losses to OG. They were second pick and they took Timber on this pick before. Uh, and they, they lost both of those games. And then of course they haven't played the Timber since then. Many teams banning it or Falcons not opting for it, unless it was late stage. Uh, they did grab it at the very end of one of the drafts, but they never opened with it again. And that game they just lost, obviously, was a first overall pick, Timber, but they're going right back for it. So they're not wanting to shy away from the Timber because it is one of their better flex heroes, but I think it does show that maybe this is a good answer. Compared to the DK, compared to the Pango, the Razor, these three flexible heroes between the mid and the off lane, the Timber seems to be the one that struggles the most to actually dominate the whole game. Mm, and they still do get the Disruptor, so they don't care about this Shadow Demon save. Um, I guess uh, the, what's nice about having this Timber and Disruptor is Timber is very offensive and that's the kind of uh, game you want to be playing, right, Vaga? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, Timber is Timber's going to be very good at giving you vision as well for the Disruptor to get the glimpse off on people. Uh, is an important thing, so he can always go in there and find the catch. But these heroes do really well if you start winning, if you start chasing down your opponents. Uh, and that's assuming that they get that upper hand. Extreme Gaming, though, if they get to play that five-man style that we saw last game, then, you know, it, it can backfire. Disruptor doesn't really do too well when he's getting run at. We saw it in game one. No, what kind of could thinking. extreme gaming here get? Yeah, the trends that's 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 gonna enable them to run at them against the disruptor. Is this still <laughs> a Luna game, by the way? You have the Shadow Demon. You are playing into a Timber. 
Yeah, 100%, yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, maybe you don't want to grab it this early, but I mean, this is where the drafting stage, we have this nice big long stretch where there's no bans, so you don't have to grab the Luna now because you can get it at the end of the phase unless Falcons snag it for themselves, but there's also a lot of heroes that maybe could give uh, Luna a little bit of trouble when you already have the Shadow Demon. It's like kind of like a soft ban out, and then you get like an additional hero to grab it, so I'm kind of wondering if they're going to pick like a classic DY hero because he can't get his Phoenix. I don't know if the Bane would be my favorite but if they're gonna go for the luna they can maybe get a clockwork or an et perhaps yeah i would like something like et or clockwork can go in uh, anything that can jump onto the disruptor you do have to think about your offlane duo though if you you know want to run the shadow demon on the safe lane then you have to have something that can work well together with the mars um mm. but I, I wouldn't even be against seeing the you know post four marcy come out Ooh, snap. Oh, actually. this is an old classic. This used to be the, the duo that we saw every single game for so long. Yeah. Snapfire, Mars. It's not as potent as it was, you know, quite a few months ago, but uh, it's still a strong duo. Brings a lot of burst damage. Mm -hmm. A couple of nice games, actually, uh, in Elite League, in which Snapfire did fairly well. Um, uh, nice cookie saves, of course, with the Mars, the nice setup. You are playing into Glimpse. Long range disable that can mess your ulti up, uh, but besides that, they're not really giving a lot away. And it is a fresh pick in the series. We haven't seen her, I, I mean, maybe even once in the playoffs. I'm not sure, but I feel like she wasn't really picked. Yeah, I don't think so. I think this might be the first one in the playoffs, at least. Definitely saw her in the groups, but uh, this yeah. is uh, this is nice though for extreme gaming. They, you know, show the Mars Snapfire pretty hard lane to counter pick into. If you think about heroes that punish Mars, usually, you know, it, it's not that easy to get to him when he also has the Snapfire backing him up. Um, so e even stuff that's good against melee heroes kind of struggles mm -hmm. since Mars can push you away. They played it, by the way, zero time. Um, extreme gaming, at least. Yeah. It was played by other teams. Azure played it, but uh, Extreme Gaming never. It's also a hero that they'll play on both DY and ZinQ. They both have a history of playing it. So there is, I mean, obviously, yeah, Mars Snap, really, really strong. But we've also seen the importance of the Shadow Demon and, and how solid ZinQ is on it. So I wouldn't be too surprised if, like, if there's a good combo in lane, maybe DY just wants to grab the Snap since he's also played a lot. But the, speaking of combos, I mean, one of the things that we've criticized xg4 in the past has been this idea of like what they can do in kind of like the earliest parts of the game with their passivity and everything i think snapfire is one of the heroes that is the absolute just like brain dead stupid easy to just get those first couple kills like you hit six on snapfire it's not as crazy strong as it used to be but if you have any semblance of decent control like the kisses are just crazy right so uh, i definitely like that as an aspect for what this team could utilize and in combination with the faceless void they're super well set up here for their last mid hero it can just be like all out damage there's really no need for control but a little more control is never going to hurt either. So I, I kind of see like the wide spectrum of heroes all opening up here for XG. Yeah, I also like uh, what they have now. Getting the Mars Arena and the Faces Void Chrono it is, you know, exactly what they enjoy drafting. Big teamfight spells, but also the, the Mars Arena blocks some of those auto attacks coming out from Gyrocopter. So it's not so easy for him to deal a ton of damage. The lane might be mm. pretty good, but it does uh, mess with the carry gyro quite a bit. And Void can always time walk through the homing missile, which is pretty annoying in that matchup. Uh, you don't get stunned, you can just keep fighting. I hear you, but uh, before what you were saying and what we've heard from our casters, other analysts as well, is Team Falcons, you need to do well against them in the lanes. That's where they crush you usually. Are we worried for the Disruptor Gyro into Mars Snap or Mars Shadow Demon or... Can you play around that maybe some creep skips or are you maybe even good in that lane i think that lane is fine i think that's completely manageable especially if extreme gaming play as well as they did in the previous game i'm almost more mm -hmm. concerned that the uh, shadow demon faces void lane doesn't have the most aggressive capabilities um but sd is a strong lane support so maybe it's still fine Man, they took a long time to ban that Zeus. I mean, they've banned... Has that been their ban, like, every game? They've been just making sure that, that those two heroes don't get through. Like, ever since game one, like, the TP went in. It looked pretty good. Obviously, even though they didn't get the win, you can see this idea of, like, how XM plays uh, the hero, and he's pretty uh, experienced on it. And then game two, they just banned DP Zeus. He played Zeus two games in a row this morning versus Azure for the win. Mm -hmm. But Falcon's still, you know, making sure they're using all their time here for that last pick. I guess making sure there's not something that could really mess them up. 
there was one hero that went through, not banned out, and they usually ban out it when they're picking timber. That's the Viper. Yeah. And XM Viper was pretty strong in the last few days. Is this maybe an option for them? I think so with the Lena th ban, right? Like, what other yeah. heroes are you really worried about? Yeah, I think they're in a good spot to just take the Viper and say, okay, mid is a solid lane, and we're happy here. And there you go, genius guys. You're calling it. Uh, I love this draft so far from Extreme Gaming. We'll see if Falcons have a good response, but I mean, Timber doesn't want to lane into a Viper. It is not fun. So this kind of forces him to have to go against that SD and uh, SD and uh, Void lane instead. I'm yeah, not sure which also against Viper here. It's not great either for the Timber, right? Because like you can't yeah, utilize time the first damage that well. Yeah, and time dilation. So you got time walk and time dilation. So like doubly bad time here. And now they just have to think of, like, what's a good hero for the game that isn't going to get wrecked by the Viper? Because you can't necessarily assume you're just going to win it. Um, and the support rotations mid aren't... It's not like these incredibly active heroes that can kind of stomp anyone. Like, we've seen the Ench in the past that can help solve these things. Whoa, so, it, it, it's a bat. Lion? <laughs> Is it a lion? Oh, okay. Imagine. Yeah, okay. It's going to be a lion on the bats. Yeah. It's not... Send yeah, the yeah, lion yeah. mid. Go. Okay, so they're flexing in the, the bat rider. This is another one of Malreen's most played heroes. Very comfy on that hero as well. Um, it is a pretty good matchup against Viper, even though you struggle to CS. You have great kill potential with any rotation. And sometimes, even without a rotation, you could find Viper overstepping. And I think the and DY the shift... Lion. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll say DY shifting to the snap too with the timber being put into the lane. I think it's even better because the, the Mars Shadow Demon, still a good combo, still has setup and plays that they can go for. And then Snapfire and Faceless Void allows a little bit more aggression with Faceless Void to maybe get an edge on some of these heroes. So I uh, really like the lanes here from XG. That, that's the main focus and they look good. Yeah, like even uh, the switch up from Lion for me on the other side is kind of good because you get a lot of bursts, right? But I don't know if I'm the biggest fan of a bat mid. Vaga, like you're our mid specialist here, you play a lot of it. Uh, Bat right now is more of a support for a reason, right? Yeah, he is, but it's still pretty damn strong. And if you're, you know, if you're a Grandmaster spammer level on it, then I think you're still pretty happy in this patch if you get the matchup uh, against the Viper here. Um, it, it's not a super easy matchup, but the kill potential with rotations and Falcons being very rotation heavy of a team, I think you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, definitely a pretty even situation here overall, I would say. And Extreme Gaming have no reason to feel unhappy about this draft either. Okay, our panel is pretty evenly split, I believe. Let's see what Cap and SVG have to say about the game. All right, getting into a game three. We actually have a series on our hands. This is Extreme managed to take a game two against Falcons. Can they keep the momentum coming here? Uh, Avery, you've done it once, but you've done it one time with one draft. And I've heard so many different people say Dota is a best of three game. It's a double bracket game. You know, you got to give uh, some leeway for these slip ups. So in your opinion, was game two a slip up of Falcons or was it extreme becoming the Goliath that you talked about in the David versus Goliath? I think they definitely asserted some stuff. We saw the Lesh and the Kunkka get banned out here. They gave them the timber saw again, which means Falcons felt the strength of those heroes against this first big timber and what it was trying to do for them. And the fact that you had to ban Lesh and Kunkka that XG asserted against you means that XG had some more openings in the draft. They get this Faceless Void, they get this Viper, some some of their signatures that otherwise might have just been free bans for Falcons if they didn't feel pressured to deal with the Kunkka or the Lestrak with this first pick Timber Sagan. So honestly, yeah, maybe some of that was Falcons. They had an awkward draft. They couldn't scale as well as they liked to, but I think it was XG figuring some stuff out and they're going to go back to the same idea of, okay, you can have your Timber Saw. We're going to pick some really seconds. good answers to it. Some good stuns, mini stuns, time dilation, a Viper matchup. Not going to be the easiest Timber game, and we're just going to meet you there. And honestly, I feel like I'd rather have XG's draft this game purely from, I think the scale is guaranteed. I think if this yes. game goes really late, XG do not lose this game late ever. I think Faceless Void is just an absolute beast this game. You get to the five or six slots on Ame, you're going to win this game. It's not a question of if, it's you will. Time dilation is way too good here. That's the other scary part. Like, time dilation destroys Gyro outside of BKB. 
absolutely decimates bat outside of BKB, ruins timber outside of the BKB. So Falcons need to play a fast game here. They, they want all three cores to get early dispels slash BKBs to be able to deal with time dilation. And they know they're getting outscaled, so they really need to snowball these lanes. When you last pick Lion, I mean, that can mean a lot of different things. Like, <laughs> last pick Lion can mean uh -huh. the draft was absolutely abysmal and you didn't know what to do, so you picked Lion. It can also okay. mean, to me, that Falcons realized there wasn't really a pick there that was going to go up against Viper outside the bat that Mollering wanted to play that was going to give him that scale. So you have to have a pick that helps you snowball this game. And I think Lion, in theory, can do that because it's one of the supports that can open up the all-in on the faceless void. Is the hero that can hex him, it can stun him, and let you all in the void as Snaking gives away first blood. XXS continuing to dominate this lane. But if that happens for Falcons, then you can start to snowball Amar off this lane phase. And that's the idea, right? Because you need fast items on these cores. You need to put them in a position where time dilation isn't a factor, the Viper isn't a factor, and you can run XG over here. But honestly, XG, if they've shown one strength so far, it's, they're a pretty hard team to run over. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I'm looking at this top lane since we already have the first blood for XXS. I mean, so important here, right? The XXS had an outstanding performance on the Kunkka. I mean, his start was fantastic, and then he followed through with excellent game pro gameplay. Hit a lot of really good tidal waves and torrent storms uh, that were very game winning for them. If he can show the same kind of performance on another hero, and another important point is the fact that it is an Amar hero specifically, right? Then that leaves an opening where they can, can keep this hero to themselves, keep it out of Amar's hands and in the hands of XXS and have just as much effectiveness as Amar does on the hero. Yeah, it's huge. Like, th this series is a lot about the offlaner impact. And if you can match ATF because he is such a dominating player, you have to find similar impact in your lineup, find ways that you can shut him down, pressure the enemy carry, Crit getting a lot of pressure does have fairy fire he will live but this is not the type of sideline trajectory falcons i think we're looking for in the first couple of minutes here gyro disruptor was also one of those lanes where they want that lane to snowball too this is a high killing snaking going down not what they were looking for and crit getting forced off the lane early not what you want to have happen on the early waves with this timber line this is a very powerful lane the, the first three levels for these heroes is it's a lot of cheap harass a lot of heroes that can get the region back early, it's tough. This is a lane that we saw that old Bet Boom VP squad spam, I think, like 10 out of 15 games in a row. Just every game was Lion Timber open. It was absurd for a period there. So it's still a lane that a lot of these teams are very confident playing. And I mean, you have to get the value out of it because you last picked Lion, right? Like, <laughs> this was <laughs> ultra last pick in the draft. So if it doesn't get xg here xg are going to be really happy with how this draft meta is developing for them because it's just not the that scary you, the way you say that makes me feel like by the end of the game that's going to be one of your points again if extreme wins it's gonna be you know <laughs> they won because falcons last picked lion or falcons wins is going to be they won and they last picked lion i mean because it's crazy in a, a patch where there's so many good cores there's there's so many crazy gotcha picks, there's cheese picks, there's, you know, especially with XM's hero pool, where that mid matchup can mean a lot. As we see Malreen, he has to TP out of mid. This bad yeah. Viper matchup is just, it, it's not that one side of a matchup, and Malreen's not getting the better of it. He's just going to have to stack and try and play catch up in the jungle. Like, you didn't, you didn't have some option. They could have counterpicked this Viper, and there just wasn't anything. So, oh, look at that. XM already making the read, trying to slow down Maureen. Now he doesn't get close enough to really get major poison attack stacks. So Maureen would still managed to get the pull, but a little bit of damage done for Maureen's efforts. I also think Maureen has to have a hell of a game here just because, sure, he has some interesting matchups versus the Viper and the Mars being able to, like, all in them with Disruption heavy magical spear. burst. Okay, Skater, actually gonna get getting them. a lot of poison stacks here. If they can get a fourth and maybe a fifth, no, the, the, because the levels, level two shadow poison, just four stacks is enough to get that kill. So the off lane of extreme gaming continues to succeed. And and also probably equally importantly, the safe lane of extreme is not letting Amar get that momentum nice and early either. I mean, Jin Q is just looking like a beast on the shadow demon. If you can win the lane this hard with shadow demon reliably, there's almost no downside to this hero. 
he just provides you absurd things in those later fights. The save potential, the heal potential with cleanse that's going to be amazing this game versus that Malarine Batrider. That's the X Factor, right? If Jin Q gets really fast Arcane, Blink, Shard, is Malarine's impact going to get shut down a little? That's a, a huge back. factor here. Chance for a bit of revenge on XXS, but he TPs all the way back to Fountain. Now, it's a little close, but he does live. I mean, honestly, I feel like this XG offlane has been overperforming in like the last two or three series. They, they've really just been playing well for the heroes they've been given, which aren't really these... They're not playing these like insanely fast dominating lanes. They're kind of playing these, these duos that are set up to own the fights, but they're winning the lanes anyway. Like even that game one, we saw this Sardar take it to the troll early. I feel like XXS is just getting the better of some of these laning phases. Putting them in a solid position. Six minute power rune. Jin Q tries to make a break for it, but it will be sandwiched in the river. Now the Viper's coming across. So maybe Jin Q can buy himself some time here to even set up with the disruption. Yeah, XM, it's going to force an immediate TP out of Malreen. So he Almost continues to stay out of lane, just shy of level six. Yeah, this lane has gone well for XG. Side lanes are playing ahead for Falcons, though. Is, I mean, they just have so much kill threat. It's. Hard for XG to stay on those lanes and, and contest the CS, but Omni is doing fine. And that's, I mean, that's scary. You have a Faceless Void who's like free farming the laning phase against a Gyro. I think we all know how this carry matchup goes. It's not one Skeeter can just punch through on his own. There's no way around it. This carry matchup sucks. It's like 90-10 Faceless Void. You never outfight him at any point in the game. You can't deal with Chrono. You can't deal with Time Dilation. All of your damage gets timed walk because you're not really a burst oriented hero. This is a position Ame is very comfortable in if something doesn't disrupt his, his game flow here. And that's the question. What disrupts the game flow here for the faceless void on the side of Falcons? There's, I feel like it's just the supports. Like it has to come down to Static Storm and the last pick Lion is <laughs> gonna hex him. Gonna get the glimpse point. back. And that last pick line will show up for a rotation. Get the kill on XXS. Not much in Q could do to stop that. Solid XP. I mean, Falcons just want as much XP on these supports as they can get. They want to start yeah. roaming, running around, getting kills. They have level five on snaking. That's enough to set things up with a high level glimpse. And that TP rotation means only one Ooh. support can rotate, but the gyrocopter is going to try and help out. He TPs to the tier two. Now that Sinking is behind XM, he He's says, we've well, got all. the guaranteed glimpse. We can isolate this Viper and maybe bring him down. Bracken to the lasso, not let him get any more damage onto Skeeter. Jeez. Now, the Disruptor does die for that effort, but a big move from Falcons. Uh, rotating support up the top to get a kill there, and then immediately gyrocopter repays the favor to the mid lane. XM getting a, getting a little too cocky here. I mean, he was doing well in the lane, but that was a bad time to die in a bad overextension because you gave that haste rune straight to the bat rider, and that's going to be a huge rune for Malreen here. Maybe the best rune on bat in the early game. If he can get his fast bots here, make a side lane rotation, just use that haste to power through onto one of these cores and get another core kill, suddenly he's just going to be highest net worth in the game. Yeah, that's his that's potential recovery for him as he's continued to have to do stacks here. It was also very deep from XM, which meant, okay, Falcons rotated three heroes to kill him. XG also brought three heroes to that mid lane, but they can't help the Viper if he's behind the tier one. The Falcons very happy about that overextension. Surprised we did not see some, some smileys get thrown out, but I guess after you get that score tied up, not as easy. Yeah, back to serious business for Falcons. Leave the trash talk for uh, when they're a bit farther ahead in the, the best of five. You gotta pace yourself. Something to be said about that. Jin Gyu trying to get the body block and the surround on snaking doesn't work. And they're gonna pull him back in where Malreen's gonna make use of that haste rune from earlier. Got him inside the arena. Can they do anything to this bat? It would require the spear to land. Now they don't have a stun, but they do have the damage. No low ground misses for XM. They finish up Malreen and punish him for his move. Man, XM making that rotation. That, that's a hasted bat that dies. Oh. And there's the tip. He knows it. He's like, bro, you were a god on the map. And you gave me a kill for it. Huge setback for Malreen. I think that was... Bit of his recovery potential out the window. This bots is just getting super delayed. And I don't think his 
I don't think he's happy about where he is right now relative to where he wants to be because he is going up against that potential cleanse. He is going up against that time dilation. This is by no means a free Batrider game, and he is the lowest net worth core right now. Yeah. It's another game that it just feels like Falcons are a little off and not able to make the aggressive moves on the enemy carry that they want to right now as they're just going back to jungle while Ame, I mean, he's chilling. This guy's mad chilling. Hasn't seen a an enemy gank for 10 minutes. He doesn't even know what's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, it's a good life for Ame. They uh, <laughs> farm up the ancient stack for the Batrider and that gets him to his boots of travels. Uh, Amar was gracious and let Malreen have just enough to get his bots and then took the last few hits. I mean, honestly, that. I don't I don't blame him. I'd rather have the Timber Accelerate here than the Bat. I think there's, True. there's a chance Timber can slay some of these heroes if he gets really fat snowball this game. He had he has the best laning phase out of everybody. They committed to that. I have more faith in his ability to do that than this Bat Rider at this point. And I think Falcons are going to need it. They're going to need a hell of a game from Amar here. Because somebody's going to have to deal the damage in the fights, and I don't see it being the other two cores as reliably. Time for that offlaner to step up. Him and Crit are uh, currently eyeing this timber saw a little bit. They do have level six on the line, so the burst damage is available. They want to make a move around that somewhere. They're going to smoke off of the attempt on Jin Q, but he lives. Gets salved up by DY, seeds of Serenity from XM. Maybe keeping him alive there, and they have the ults. They have Mortimer's Kisses here. They still have Chrono up. I don't think Amar feels confident enough to push this Void off the lane with the threat of the Kisses and the Chrono. Double damage. They're going to bait it. They're going to bait it. Catch Malreen on it. Now a glimpse back, sends back XM, but they do have the Kisses. So if the Kisses land, or if Ame just claims the last hit, there we go. He's going to take that one and go for oh, crit as well. He He's going to go for both. He got both support, and he got the Bash to back it up too. So he will take get a double kill off of that one and get three kills for his team. Falcons once more in trouble this game as these small moves are working out for XG. They get Ame involved for a double support kill. You get the finger on Jin Q, but that is a consolation prize as Malreen gets punished on these rune battles again and the skirmish power, it's just not there. This Viper is just manhandling these supports around the runes. They don't have fast physical damage to put into XM this game, and that's generally where Viper thrives. He just play, he's just playing versus a bunch of spellcasters. XM's like, whatever, man. You, you guys can go on me if you want. I don't I don't really give a kick. damn. I got corrosive skin. You're going to pay the ultimate price. And if you don't go on me, I'm going to slowly kill you. Feels like XG got what they wanted here. XXS, soon to be Blink Dagger. So Extreme have just been kind of chilling on lanes a bit reacting to what Falcons is doing, but they can soon be the aggressors. They get that uh, Blink Dagger around the same time that uh, Kisses is back up for the Snapfire. They'll have a deadly combo. Let's we'll see what they do with it. But Amar is still maybe the strongest hero in the game right now, and he's punishing whoever shows up in the bottom lane. He'll collect a kill on Shin Q. I mean, this is Falcons knowing they, they have to start making some aggressive moves in this game, even if they're not in the position they want to be. They have to start bringing these towers down. And cleaning up some freebies so they can accelerate their cores the way they want to right now and get Malreen back in the game. Definitely not an impossible task. You just want to play a faster pace right now, especially with Disruptor. So it's not a hero that you want to just stack jungle and farm with. This is a hero you want to start slaying, taking the fight to the enemy. Mm -hmm. XXS doesn't want to let Snake King get these drags for free. Snake King has to Static Storm to protect himself. And he'll have to TP out, seeing XM making his way across that tower. So, extreme. Yes, play. They're going to give up that safe lane tower and try and take this one real quick. I wonder if there's a world where Extreme think about uh, going back to stop Amar from taking this tower. Because one thing about Timbersaw is he doesn't take towers the best. Uh, so, this is a very slow push. Absolutely will, because Chrono... Back up in 10 seconds, which means Ame doesn't have to go down there to defend that tower. He just has to have the capability of TPing there, and that fight looks hard for Falcons. They've got Amar. Amar. He can't TP out of this. Can he get... They just need the vision to make sure Amar's not TPing. Somebody will close him off eventually. He gets into the base, goes to the TP, the spear lands. 
It stops Amog from being able to get out. He'll timber chain to just create a little bit more time, but he'll die to the tower. I mean, that, is, that is worth the chase for XG. They do not mind trading out some farm on the map for the biggest kill in this timber saw. And the whole time that's happening, you got a faceless void free farming. Yeah, Maureen's clearing some stacks. He's catching up. He has his blink. He's going to have to do something with it. So this is going to be another smoke move probably from Falcons. Try and use the Batrider blink. Get another finger kill. Ideally, they want to kill somebody around this bottom tower to convert on this objective and open up the map. But look who's making the move first. It's XXS. Bringing XM into the play. An oh, instant they run smoke. right into a smoke from Crit. Now, uh, Falcons is quite lucky. Maureen... For his sake, he manages to get away from that move, but uh, still, it's a loss of resources on top of a support kill. They're looking for more now, and they spot snaking XM. Now they're gonna they're try and kill the Ame Viper, in. but XXS is right in the midst of this, and he already got the spin on, on the Skeeter, and Ame is gonna come in, and he's ready for the Chronos here. As soon as that silence wears out, he now has the freedom to throw it down, which is why Falcons immediately try and retreat. Snake King can't, can't get far enough away, though. XM will claim his life in the end. So one kill turns to another one on Gyrocopter, and another kill on uh, Snake King. And look at this ward by DY on the clip. They're pinging mid. Falcons felt like there was vision for XG there, and they're correct, but they guessed wrong. That high ground ward did work that fight from DY that he placed earlier. Just sets everything up, allows XM to walk in, have great positioning. And once more, you cannot go on this Viper. It's just no way that this team fight ends well for you with all of your early spell damage into how tanky this hero is. XM is impenetrable right now. Didn't even have to use Chrono for that fight. And a sick Another time that we've XXS. seen uh, a Viper look really, really bad in the offlane, but in XM's hands, it seems to excel. But they play around it well. Like, this this guy is the turret god or something. I don't know. It, it just speaks to him. <laughs> yeah. He understands how to sit there and right-click better than anybody else I've seen. <laughs> I mean, there is an art to it. It's like being in the right place makes a huge difference, you know? Taking these little angles, being behind an enemy, knowing your HP limits. And that's yeah, another you're an immobile hero, so game. therefore the where you place yourself is all the more punishing. Right? Yes, hundred percent. If you step up too far, you know it's a lot harder to uh, to reposition yourself in the correct spot. Yes, two thirds of the BKB already done. He is the highest net worth. That is the other big factors. Like, if you can get this much net worth on Viper, it's, it counts for a lot because the hero he just doesn't accelerate the farm that fast compared to a lot of other heroes in Dota. But he uses it damn well. They're gonna scare Skeeter off some, some camps here, but won't yield anything. Falcons, they have the blink on crit, so they have another initiation mechanism. Not all in on Mallory now. But damn it, if they're struggling to find some openings in this game. I mean, it feels like every smoke has just run into an absolute brick wall. Next G have been ready for it. BKB. Or the timber saw is here very very soon. Yeah, that's. Huge. Do you think that changes things? It definitely lets him go in again. The BKBs for Falcons are the biggest deal in this game because it's their way to bypass the time dilation, the the Viper stacks, all of this, and actually commit in a fight. You still have to worry about Chronosphere, but there's no way around that. But it's again XG making the post. gonna break right into crit. Crit gets off the hex, gets off a good stun, but he's probably gonna die here. This team backs away once again, just accepting the, the loss of their support. In exchange, they say, okay, another smoke has been blown. Let's just try and find more time to farm. Try and get like this was, Ags on Skeeter up. Like that was Falcons trying to set up a move. XG has just really ruined their tempo in this game. All these, all these little smokes have messed up their, their Blink Lion timing, the Blink Bat timing, this BKB Timber timing. Every time Falcons have gotten one of these items, they want to make a move with it, XG are already there. And maybe they're not getting some full team fight wipe out of it, but it really is messing up Falcons' game flow. We just can't put a, a solid move together to regain some map control here. They have the wards to do it too. They have really good dire vision on Radiant side of the map right now. They would love mm. to be able to smoke to it and use it. 
They see Ame mid. Oh, it's they, another they, smoke for Hastrin. Maureen. Oh, he didn't get the haste and he doesn't get the lasso either. And Jinkyu was very ready for that play as well. I mean, he was too ready. He almost killed him. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think Jinkyu is some. Jinkyu's asking why he didn't get lassoed there. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's living life. It's like, damn, I almost griefed my carry, but I got away with it. The smoke continues, though, and may still find its mark. Ame. Oh, the faster he clears this camp, the better it is for him, but he doesn't get it in time. He gets hit initiated. Hex, Static Storm, Finger, very dead. Nice connection. I mean, this is what they've been looking for the whole game. Just make some clean move on Ame. Put that Hex to use. Get the big juicy kill that you wanted. That was a streak as well. Try and get the fight. Rune. They're scrambling to try and get there in time to take this fight. XXS is already on it, though. Mar jumps forward with his BKB. Starts putting some damage on XM. XM responds with his own BKB. Lasso in the back to stop Jin Q safe. But Jin Q saves himself in the end as he doesn't get bursted down. Skeeter's in this arena, and it's a dead arena. They are in a nasty spot, and they're not going to be able to get it out. And XXS Ooh. hunts down a Mar. Triple kill for the Mars. These arenas have been absolutely disgusting. Like, sure, you have Timber BKB, but if you can't even escape there. I also cannot believe Jinku blinked forward to take that Wisdom Room as a Shadow Demon. That is insane <laughs> to me. Like, that could not have been the right play, but that just shows you the the balls and the zero fucks that this man gives. <laughs> like, it's like, I'm going to take your rune. I don't care about positioning for the fight. And I, I was guess very it works out. I was wondering how he got where he was. I was yeah, like, he, he knew what he wanted. <laughs> He knew what he wanted there. He got it. So, oh, you shit. know, props to him. Like, goddamn, like, if the Shadow Demon blinks into you and you're, you're still not winning that fight as Falcons, you got to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? So, it's got to be BKB for the bat. It's got to be BKB for Skeeter, and that's going to be your best timing in this game. It's going to ignore a lot of the damage from X XG. The biggest question is, is this triple BKB timing too little too late here? Because you do have to contend with the Chrono... You have to contend with Demonic Purge. The Viper is going to trade his BKB. The, the Mars is going to trade his. I think you have to be able to start the fights if you're Falcons. I think the biggest thing for now in this game is finding the jump. They need as much vision as yeah. they can get. They need lanes as deep as they can get. They need to put XG in a position where XG have to like contest Roshan and go through their wards so that they can jump Ame, they can jump XXS before the big spells come out. Kill them in a lasso, kill them in a hex. That's what this Roche is designed to do. And guess what? If you don't contest the Roche through our vision, we're going to get a free Roche on. And then we have Aegis on a frontliner to deal with the Chrono in the first place. So this is this is what Falcons want in this game. They're going to get it. Next year, you're going to trade Tormentor for Roche on and just rely on their Faceless Void scale, as they always do. So, doesn't need a Satanic. Wouldn't have one this early, but Gyrocopter has that second life. So now he doesn't have to worry as much about the Chronosphere. Will that provide a big enough opening for Falcons to take a fight? Because you said the initiation is all important. Uh, and that initiation is very tricky, right? Like you have these BKB heroes, you have Blink Hex. Okay, that's a big counter. But there's this save here on Shadow Demon with who now has Demonic Cleanse as they took the Tormentor. So there's disruption and demonic cleanse. It means they have to hit they have to hit a, a two-pronged attack, right? They have to be able to hit an initiation on someone like the Faceless Void and stop Jin Q from saving that person. Well, they have high ground vision. Mark and the they got step. XXS. Oh man, XXS. That might have been an arena that caught a lot of heroes. But look at that. Skeeter is... right there in the front lines with an Aegis. They'll take that down, but on the second life, Falcons, they'll keep fighting. They see an opportunity. They want to go for it. The lasso. Manta goes off. Dodged a little bit. Now the disruption. The pullback into Skeeter. Can he do enough damage to deal with XM? It doesn't look like it. Now without a BKB, the second life, it doesn't mean Holy anything to him. A cookie dude. on top of him. They turn back to XM. XM demonic cleanse heals him up. There's no way Amar can deal the damage. And the now they've slowed God. down Snake King as well. They have just shut down Falcons on a timing that Falcons thought they had the momentum that they had the <laughs> advantage with. <laughs> The tips, the tips are only going one way now. From XM to you as the Viper God makes his presence felt. He, he stands his ground. He presses the right click. <laughs> Damn, does he do it better than any other Viper I've seen in my lifetime.
Jeez, the damage into Skeeter when he the stacks build up, he doesn't have the dispo yet, he doesn't have BKB. It's just disgusting. And that was honestly a pretty good setup for Falcons. They baited them into the high ground ward. Instant stun on XXS from crit. That was mm. beautiful in terms of this Mars got nothing off, didn't get BKB, instantly bursted down. No gameplay from XXS that team fight. And then you get to fight on your vision. You trade the Aegis and Disruptor for Chrono and BKB on Ame. Honestly, not the greatest Chrono there. He was just going in blind. But the tail end of that fight is just all them going into Viper, over committing on Viper, and then you're in trouble. Throw that Mjolnir charge on him. He has BKB. He has cleanse going in. XM's just a beast this game, man. He is absolutely a beast. And now XM will use his turret hero to take down turrets. Tier 2 tower on mid. Going to be exploited here. It'll fall. The first of the towers to fall. They could start taking the outpost if they want. Taking even more map control. Snaking <laughs> in a very precarious position. Finally spotted by XXS. And uh, slowed down enough. The rest of the team will catch up. Sander Storm goes out. But it won't save him from the spear of XXS. And now they've got crit. crit as well, so they're just getting pickoffs all over the place. Nice hex TP out though. Well played by crit. Oh, that was nice. I mean, they're just trying to create any space they can right now. This game has got to go really late for Falcons. They need to get to a point where you get probably divine rape your gyro. I don't really know what else is gonna punch through. I don't think he wanted to have to use his BKB so early like no. this, but. Uh... He gets, he gets down found. to six seconds. And he's still looking for some sort of tank item in the fight. It's going to be Shiva's, but... Man, is it going to be delayed here. Quick little Tormentor pickup. All right, crit shard. That's that's decent value. If you can if you can stand in the fight, get some mana drain on these heroes. I mean, that's one way to potentially mitigate the damage. Draw this Viper out of mana. Draw the, the Mars out of mana. Not sure how re reliable it's going to be at, at this point in the game, but you got to try and make this stuff happen. Yeah, especially as the uh, physical damage is ramping up for uh, Extreme. Because that, that was a big part of their lineup, right? Is that they were very heavily reliant on magic damage for the first 20 minutes. The BKB timing of Falcons could have been very strong. Yes. But now, obviously, Ame is coming online. That's one, but also XM. Just purely the fact that he has so many of these various stat items. His magic damage is a bigger component of the hero, but he's still outputting good physical damage as well. And he's about to finish Scotty. So that is also... That puts him in a position where, yeah, you're bkb but the second that runs out, you're, you're dead in the water. You just can't move. You can't do anything. And like you said, his stats are so high on this Viper. Can you all in him? Do you want to try and all in him? When there's that blink shadow demon save and if he gets that off that's the scary part you have the bkb viper you have the bkb void if they get shadow demon disrupted they bkb out of that there's not much you can oh, do with oh they spot him got the shadow poison on him can they get him out they've got a chronos here so they can blow it out if they want to they see the tp they hope for a bash and they cut the bash Ame trust in his rng no need to use the chrono here i mean oh my god he knows when he's gonna bash Oh, it's impale for the Lotus deal. Oh, crit. <laughs> crit making some moves, but XXS making some bigger moves. Got the pin, Skeeter's dead. Uh, this is looking like a game Gyrocopter just cannot carry. Uh, there's there's no way. There's just no way he's going to carry this game. XG very comfortable with their position. And I was wondering, like, is Ame even going to feel like he needs Lincolns this game when he has Solange for some status resist and that disruption save to guarantee his BKB, but he's just going to go it anyway. Feels like they have the damage. And I kind of agree that Lincolns is just going to make him immortal. You do pick up an Ags on the line, which is interesting. Yeah, He's just going for the big jump. Yeah, we said they, they kind of needed to be able to grab Shadow Demon and get an initiation. That Ags may present them an opportunity to get both. Uh, it also is a way to get around the Lincolns. I just don't know if there's any damage follow-up really. Like, okay, you're gonna if you catch two heroes, you drag them in. 
There's some chain stun potential with the lion. But is Skeeter doing enough? Big question mark. This Viper's got 3,500 HP. Void's got 3,000 HP. I mean, these are tanky goddamn heroes, and they're going to smoke on smoke. So these teams are posturing for Roshan. You know it's bad when the, the squishiest core is the Mars. Yeah, you know it's also bad when this tier 1 mid is still up at 30 minutes. Falcon's yeah. movement capability is just getting restricted here, and they're just going to have to run towards the pit. They get scanned. They got the scan on him. XXS. Pushing forward. Glimmer Cape put on him. See if he can get the vision. Misses the initiation. Crit gets it instead. Onto the Viper. Trying to blink himself away while the arena. Oh, spear. spear or two. Beautiful spear with the kisses on top. They do have to hit the stun on DY. Stopping that bit of damage. Ame gets controlled up. Disruption goes out. But they don't even need Ame's damage. That's how far ahead Extreme is at this point in time. Falcons do their best to get out of, out of the way. As uh, Snaking did manage to TP back. But... That fight, it's still Falcons keep on thinking they have a timing, have a window, and every single time they run into the brick wall that is the arena and XM's Viper. I mean, that was an incredibly fast play by Crit to even get out of there and find something off that, basically blind. But XXS, man, that is, that is just way too good of a double spear on two cores. And by the time you BKB, the damage is already done. There, that team fight's over the second that spear lands, mm -hmm. and that is that is a big problem, really big problem. Again, the vision for Falcons. How do you get the vision to set these jumps up when you're just running in blind, potentially into high ground wards? Nobody wants to go first and place that obs either. Like, is is snaking just supposed to run up there and place that high ground ward? Is is crit supposed to do it? He's trying to, but then one of your initiations goes out the window. It puts more pressure on Walreen to find that jump. I mean, XG, they just know how to play these types of lineups. They know how to play around the saves and these tanky frontliners. And the tips... You can... What? <laughs> uh, I missed it. What was that about? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get an explanation at some point. Yeah. All right, another yet another smoke. smoke up, head for Roshan. Something that extreme, I mean, it goes to show that they, they don't need Roshan and they're playing like it too, uh, which is really weird. I mean, I understand for the first Roshan, but the second Roshan, um, it's just like, nah, guys, Lincoln's is more important than having a second life. Look, look who's sitting there waiting for him. Now this is the Hex for Amar. This is the big item Falcons are smoking with. He wants Ooh, to find Amar? the Hex initiation. He's gonna find his smoke broke on a high ground. XM the Viper. One do you want to go on the Viper? He's looking for the back line. Maureen is trying to get this damn shadow team and the Glimmer Cape goes off to get the Static Storm on him, but the Chronosphere from Ame. So focused they are on stopping the shadow team and that the real threat it's comes in in the end and an early GG call and a fitting one too. There's no way Falcons in this lineup can have a chance at a comeback in a game like this. I feel like that was... I feel like that was the most unfavorable draft we've seen for Falcons in a long time. I think they were very uncomfortable in that game. The scale was Man. just an impending doom. The team fights were difficult as hell. Uh, like, where was the upside there? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I was just. Uh... A rough go for Falcons and now Extreme. Now, the question we, we had after game two was, okay, you did it once. Can you do it again? Can you do it a third time to win out the series? Well, they've done it again. And they did it even more dominantly than game two. And they did it in a way that maybe there's a, a thread here that ties between the two, but I felt like this time they were very proactive. I felt like they were aggressively going out and taking fights to Falcons. And, and maybe it's just all about just knowing falcons in that 10 to 20 minutes and how important it is for that team uh whether it's responding to their aggression their attempts to to go for these pickoffs or it's getting in their faces when they want to go for the smokes i mean avery you called it like there were several times where they went into that triangle at the same time falcons was looking to make a smoke move and use the certain items that they had like the blink dagger signing i mean those little plays are huge for their for their type of game because again they they're confident in the void viper out scaling here so they just kind of need to mess up what Falcons wanted to do in that game, and they're extremely happy. Where the the onus of execution was heavily on Falcons to do well on the side lanes, snowball those lanes, get early triple BKB, snowball Malreen, 
and almost none of that happens. Snake King dies top in the first blood. XXS TPs out. He finds a pretty good laning phase. Ame felt no pressure in that game pretty much at all. He was free farming the safe lane for 15 minutes on a faceless void. That's the dream. This Viper bat matchup, Maureen couldn't get anything done in it because his supports are having trouble rotating into this Viper, something we've seen this hero do before. There aren't good matchups against this hero outside of like the Lena snipers of the world, which he also plays. They're the other turrets for the turret god here. It's like you're trying to combat his hero with his own hero pool. Very obnoxious. XG are finding a lot of momentum in the series and they're figuring out what's working for them and starting to push that back against Falcons. And now it's a question of you're going into game four. Are you picking this timber saw again? Are you confident in this timber saw that's been your go-to hero? And if you lose faith in it, where do you go from there as Falcons? Because then you open up a lot of draft room for XG if you're not willing to pick that hero again. It feels like there are now a ton of advantages for Extreme heading into this next draft. All the more crucial uh, for Falcons to be able to get a good one. Another loss means that Extreme will take this best of five finals in Elite League. But will that happen? We're going to turn to our panel to break it all down. Thank you very much, Cap and SVG. A very volatile game number two, which went Extreme's way once again. Now, I need to start from the draft. Vaga, as this game started, we saw the mid lane. We're not going to see the lanes in the highlights, but <laughs> you were the only one of us believing in the bat. Now, okay, what I, went wrong say, for him? <laughs> say it like this. I uh, said we're going to throw him under the bus. Matchup. I didn't say, wow, he countered Viper, all right? I want to... You know, mm -hmm. not be uh, going down with the ship here necessarily. It's an okay matchup. Like I said, you can gank towards the Viper. They never did. Not a single rotation to try and gank the Viper with the Batriders. There was a lot of attention towards the other lanes. And honestly, Extreme Gaming played a really strong laning stage again. So Bat was kind of left to his own device to try and recover in jungle. Mm -hmm. And it's just not as fast. But it's a volatile matchup that can go either way. I think XM plays extremely well in Viper, though. Like, SVG was singing his praises the entire game, pretty much. And, yeah, oh, I man, think it's fair. The, the man was literally a turret. And I wasn't really throwing you under the bus. I, just, I actually did see the bat a couple of times here on mid. It Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, obviously. In this case, it didn't look that great. It even helped out XM in this particular situation. And speaking of this Viper... Trent, mm. is this something that you have to ban out against XG or can you draft against it? I think the problem is that uh, they, they got stuck in a situation where they ended up banning the DP and the Zeus. And honestly, I think this game could go really similarly with either of those two heroes. Like, it, it wouldn't have just necessarily been the Viper. Maybe Viper is one of the harder ones because of the lane matchup and it's hard to find anything that, like, really crushes him. But, like, DP and Zeus, kind of similar situation. There was just so much control up and available for them that this mid laner was just, you just needed a turret. You just needed some helpful damage to carry things through. But the Viper has the added aspect of being super tanky and very hard to deal with with their lineup. I think that fight was like their last good chance for Falcons there where they felt forced to try and like keep it going. But then you just end up dragging a Viper into killing your own gyrocopters. That was pretty depressing. Uh, it, it was a really, really well played game by XG. And again, XXS too, I have to say. Like... You really can't ask for much more when it comes to the initiation throughout this game. It felt like they barely even needed Chrono this game. They weren't using it in a lot of fights. And if this man wasn't spearing one hero, that's because he's spearing two, like in this situation. And he's pretty much solo winning the team fight. I don't know. I think Amar has found his match on the offline XXX, of course, from the Chinese leagues. Like he came one in. 2017, I believe, Kiev Major or something like that, and he's just a super talented and still very very young player. Um, so, a lot to be expecting from him in these future series and games from uh, Extreme Gaming, but speaking of this series and speaking of the next game, like, we have a full-on series now, and this is the closest that, that, closest that Falcons have been to a possible defeat in the whole tournament, in the last couple of tournaments as well. Um, what do you think about SVG and what he was talking about with Timber? If you ban him, you open up a can of worms. I mean, it's what I we think... said about before the game started was like, that's where their losses have all come from. It's the early opening Timber. They have now lost four games where they're picking Timber in the first phase. Straight back to back. So I, I think XG have definitely found a great option here in terms of like what to leave. 
It's definitely one thing that, you know, you have to question a little bit, but I wonder if that's even really the, the biggest problem. Another big problem that I saw here is just letting that void slip through, right? Like the previous game we saw, mm. it was impressive and there was no, uh, you know, no void in that game. But in this game, this is the first game in, uh, in five games in a row against Extreme where Falcons do not ban void on the 10 or 12 uh, ban. And it's really important, I think, because it's mm. so nice uh comfort for extreme gaming to know they have you know the penultimate or the, the actual ultimate uh carry hero <laughs> towards late game also super strong in just team fighting so the moment they got the void there it feels like this this can be rough like falcons have to play well, super high tempo that, what led to this trend though like i i have a feeling that maybe um their focuses during the drafting stage are on the wrong heroes is that true or is there there's just too many to ban out against extreme gaming uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily on the wrong heroes. Like I think we're still covering a lot of the basic ones. Uh, to me, it feels more like XG are kind of stepping it up and finding some new ones, right? Like this, this Snapfire was a pretty solid option. It actually gives them a little bit more aggression and burst damage. Mars has been sort of relegated a little bit past some of these other heroes like the Kunkun stuff. Like if you had Kunkun instead of Mars, this game could go really similarly. Uh, I, I think that they're just playing super well. And Falcons themselves, I think, faltering a little bit compared to what their usual playstyles are. Like, this, uh, the inability to take that bottom tower. There's a moment we were all talking and watching the game, and they sort of, like, come down to the bottom tier one, and they're like, it's totally open, but they're still too scared to actually just fight at it because of XG's, well, well-known defensive capabilities, where they, they want you to come to these towers. They want to jump on top of you with their big team fight, and that fear... Mm. Maybe they didn't even like they didn't even get a trade for their tower. They're just too scared. They're just running back and farming, and then they miss those key smoke ganks that you're going to need with this lineup, and that, that's just kind of okay, all she wrote. Okay. And, and t talking about the fear uh, and the morale, do you think Vaga that uh, Falcons are feeling it a little bit here, or are they still very confident? I think in that game, this was the first game where I've seen them just be uncertain, uh, where they definitely previously would play with great confidence. Because, yeah, like like Trent was mentioning there, we were talking in the green room about when they pushed the bottom tower, they got the clean kill on the Shadow Demon, and then everyone just ran away and said, no, we're not going to push because they were too worried about the team fights. In Extreme Gaming, they will always draft a strong team fight. You have to kind of force those long cooldowns, you know, playing, it's like playing against Enigma. If you don't force out the mm -hmm. Chronosphere in some way, then you're just never going to do anything really because you can't teamfight them. Yeah, and he wasn't even pressured to use Chrono for the majority of the game. In any case, Extreme Gaming, they are only one victory away from taking the Grand Finals off of Falcons in this Elite League. We're going to take a short break and when we're back, we have game number four.
another really quick break i hope you guys got your time to hydrate maybe gra grab a couple of snacks and come back to watch this game number four of elite league grand finals now game number one stock standard something that most of us have expected game number two and three however a little bit more of a quiet match raga just a couple of xds here and there in the chat um do you think that that's something that has to change coming into the next game i mean i, I feel like uh falcons have been very quiet now ever since the second and third game you know they they have been very loud throughout the entirety of the tournament but extreme they're just playing so damn good now that falcons you know you can tell they're full serious mode they can't really clown around and all chat this is not an easy matchup and I think for them, they got to go back a little bit and really think about what's going wrong in these games. I feel, from my point of view, it's, they need to enable their plus one and get value out of him. In the Alchemist game, we didn't really see much from the carry Alchemist. We didn't really mm -hmm. see that much from the Gyrocopter either. He did some damage, but he was always going to be behind the void. Um, the game that did work for them, they had him on troll and he was looking monstrous in that lane. Mm. So I think focus on, you know, Skeeter getting a good lane matchup and getting a good hero here is important for Falcons. Uh, yeah, how do you do that, Trent? Is, are, are, are there some bans that you need to use to protect Skeeter or do you play against the Shadow Demon or anything? Uh, maybe it could come down to just like at what point he's being picked. Like he... Uh, the carry to carry matchup like he did get the alk picked into the luna like they knew the luna was there they went for the alk but last game you know he had to pick the gyro and then the voids there and that i think that's a pretty hard matchup overall like for a gyrocopter mm -hmm. this is one of the yep. worst things that can happen to you like you really don't want to be locked into the middle of a fight because you have to expose yourself to deal your big damage and the void's just gonna wait until you're ready right and he's just gonna chrono you so Perhaps uh, they could find something a bit better. Unfortunately, because um, XG took the first pick, that is one of those situations that unless you give the last pick to the carry, it's very unlikely that you're going to have the good carry-to-carry -carry matchup as Falcons. It's a bit funny how, uh, you know, they they want the first pick and Falcons want the second pick. So uh, <laughs> it's they're, they're getting the order that they want. Both the teams are saying that, you know, this is the preference, I guess. So ultimately, you could choose side more, though, uh, more importantly, if you get the choice. Yeah, but look... Looking at the bands right now, one thing sticks out, like DY's heroes are just gone. Like, or, or at least they're trying to get rid of some of those in queue as well, like Shadow Demon and Phoenix. Like the two heroes mm. that we have seen together and individually in different games. Uh, we, we're we not going to get them for XG. Yeah, oh, sniper didn't, heroes. Ban, uh, didn't ban the Chinese sniper. Mm. Interesting choice here. We'll see XM probably thinking oh. about, oh, they go Racer. And but sniper, sniper is still in. Yeah, don't you go sniper is... now? I think you do. I mean, are they baiting? Know... I... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you kind of have to, right? As Falcons, and maybe that's what XG are saying because they have played it, but it, I don't think it's like been a really common one for them, right? Like he's got his heroes he wants to play. We all know that about about Malreen. We also know that it's probably not going to be an off lane sniper. So hey, at least if they throw it in there, you know where it's going. So they're saying your sniper sucks, basically, right now with this pick. That's what I'm hearing. Is that the correct read? Yeah. Yeah. Th I mean, this surprises me a lot because they not only skip the sniper, but also pick a hero that gets countered by it. So this is very, very interesting. And sniper is also a risky hero. I mean, they're one game away from being eliminated here on Falcons. If they pick it and then there's like some spear breaker or stuff coming in, like you can definitely counter sniper. There are ways. Teams are and just only... not used to doing it. You only have one ban too, right? In this phase. So like if you go for the sniper, you get to pick one hero that you ban after, and then that's sniper's game. Mm -hmm. And they, they have played against sniper today twice, right? Like in the lower bracket uh, finals. So they're very well prepared for it. Instead, first and foremost, we're going to see the doom for Team Falcon, something that worked for them in game one. If it's not broken, well, if it's broken, pick it. That's what I should say. <laughs> yep. That's Dota for you. It was a last pick Doom uh, when they picked it before. Now it's a first pick, so kind of uh, revealing here. Last time he was really good to counter out the healing from the Death Prophet, and you know it was really useful hero. Obviously, they can play it great, so I, I don't think it matters so much what he plays into. Well, Man, yeah. this is so good this for XG too, because like they they maybe they'll flex it XXS, but I think most likely this will be the XM Razor. Like he used to be the Razor player, like when a lot of people weren't really into it. Mm -hmm. um, he was someone who would actually bust it out a lot too. So 
Uh, it's not a hero they've gotten a whole lot this tournament either, especially not into the playoff stage, because obviously the hero is just such a high priority when it comes to the band. So, man, with one game to win, I really like this opening so far from XG. Yeah, it's a, a nice nice setup for them and they also have like a lot of options for what they want to pick into the the doom lane here since the focus on bands are not really towards the carries the uh interesting I... they go for the cm band though i think compared to some of the other heroes like disruptor is still in which i, I think you know not necessarily the best situation for for razor sometime um uh, the maybe the hoodwinks a bit because like you have a break and stuff which can be kind of helpful you have the bushwhack when you're just running in there I feel like that's also a pretty solid hero the Falcons have been good on, but they've just recognized the power of the CM in combination with the Doom, and obviously, you know, you're just getting like slowed and frostbitten. I still just see the Zeus and the Sniper still left in the pool and untouched. I'm thinking if you are XG and you get this Razor on the offlane, you're probably not getting um, Sniper, right? Like these two on the same side don't feel as strong. No, I don't maybe think so. some. Yeah, so are we expecting something more of a playmaking, either for their offlane or mid, depending on where this Razor goes? A little bit of both, I, I think. think. <laughs> yeah, I think it will be... I agree that, you know, Razor mid is probably the most likely from Extreme. So then we're looking towards, mm -hmm. you know, what offlaner they want to run and how they want to play it out here. We see Ench now, so that kind of deters the, uh, the Slardar a little bit. And also Falcons like playing Trolls, so I don't think they're going to go for that option here. Yeah, I do like the Dark Willow answer. I'm not sure if it's just an answer to the Enchantress or if they wanted to pick it regardless, but it is a decent hero into her. Like, you get that Bedlam to work with. We've seen just how much they can do with the Bramble Mazes. Um, we, we've seen some really nice vacuum walls with the Bramble Mazes with these kind of heroes. And you guys mentioned um, these Spirit Breakers. Are they... Is this hero still an option for them, something like that? Or do you just play it if the sniper gets picked? Yeah, I think it's a little it's risky. Most, yeah, it's like, mostly if there's something susceptible to it. I think mm -hmm. Centaur is basically just the safer brother of Spirit Breaker in a lot of situations. <laughs> like, just gives you Stampede. You don't have to go in alone. Mm -hmm. And if they go for these... Because most heroes that counter Razor are susceptible to Spirit or to a Centaur Warrunner. Disruptor. Yeah. They're still going back for the Disruptor here. So Dark Will and Disruptor, a lot of stuff to put on the ground. The Static Field, the Bramble Mace. Now you really mess with the ability of Team Falcons to run around here. And that can be dangerous when there's a Razor chasing people. And that still leaves in the potential for these uh, these catching XXS heroes like the Stampede and the Center Warrunner. Uh, the Faces Void, again, is still in right now too, which is pretty solid with Dark Will and Razor. So quite a few options here right out of this phase from XG. I have to see what Falcons have uh, to prepare for this. When you look at these two heroes on supports, is there a hero on the mid lane that doesn't care about what they do, Vaga? Mm, I mean, it's it's hard not to care at all about them because I feel like they, you know, they're, they're heroes that are so disruptive. Once you get your BKB, you're pretty happy on any hero, so kind of has to be mm -hmm. one of the BKB heroes to me. I don't know if you're hinting at something, but uh, I, me, I'm not really. <laughs> I, I was yeah. To to me, they're I, always pretty oppressive. Yeah, I was maybe thinking about one that's banned, Dragonite. But even on him, you need to get that hmm. BKB, and you would be picking it into Razor. But we do get the Faceless Void now. This has been the answer to Razor in the lane, at least in a lot of the games that we have seen. Uh, is this enough damage on Falcons, or do they need something extra in the Chrono? I think I a mean, little bit more still always go... helps. Right. Yeah, they could still go back for a sniper themselves as well, or something like that to get the damage. Like, uh, it's definitely possible for them to pick it late. You know, they didn't first phase pick mm -hmm. it, but that doesn't mean that they don't want it at all. It just means that they the are not picking it until they're sure it's good. That's the draft they lost to, by the way. They lost to Faces yep. Void and Sniper, I believe. Yeah, Team Spirits, uh, Faces Void, Sniper draft. Mm -hmm. And they got the Hoodwink again. Again, comfort zone here. You get something to lay into the Chrono, because that's what their lineup is missing on Falcons right now. And sh I mean, once you get Hurricane Pike or something, yeah, she can do damage in Chrono. But Doom doesn't really do it. And Ench doesn't do it that early on, at least. So Hoodwink, you get a nice ulti there. Throw in the Sharpshooter, mm -hmm. some, some Q and W combo. 
Yeah, yeah I love the Naga pen as well, by the way, because yeah. of the faceless yeah. void. Uh, and th th one other hero on that position one that comes to my mind is also bad against Doom. That's the Morphling, right? Like into into Faceless Void, but you're playing into a Doom, so you can't really pick it. Uh, but with this Centaur, it's still a position one that we're waiting from XG, right? One would assume, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, Ame, of course, does love these ranged carries. Maybe maybe he can find a way to go for the Razor in the lane versus the Doom, but we're not really expecting that. Uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of looking more towards the... Uh, the more classic Ame hero so far this tournament. That Naga Sire that you said is certainly the number one hero you would hope for. Uh, I the don't know Naga if Siren. they want to do it. Yeah, Gameplay. I mean, it will be the best. There's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, not going to be allowed to get their hands on that one. I'm interested in what he wants to play here on Ame because, you know, it's, like you said, not a very clean uh, clean Morphling game. And you have to have a hero that survives the, the initial jump here of a Faceless Void, potentially. Because you don't have built-in saves. Can I throw a crazy one out there? It's been picked once or twice in the group stages. Raid King. Is, is that Ooh. an option at all? Like, you don't care about the Chrono, you don't care about the Doom. I mean, if he's ever good, this is when he's good. I just yeah. don't know if he's good even <laughs> in this situation. He's just yeah. so unpopular right now. But I do believe... That this would be a fantastic game, like just based on draft for the hero. Oh, I think maybe even if you want to play even meta, they ban it. Yeah, they actually ban it. I mean, it's it's I mean, Skeeter, right? The same as you. <laughs> He's like Snake King. Trust me, this is the best Wraith King game you're ever gonna see. I know my hero. <laughs> Snake King is like they won't pick it, and he's like, yeah. dude, if they do pick it, <laughs> it will lose the Wraith King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Grand Finals losing to Wraith King probably would be bad for your morale, so. Getting rid of him is uh, justified. Is there something else that uh, we can see? Something similar to this? or To me, Sven looks pretty solid here for uh, extreme gaming. I mean, brings up the tempo a bit, gives them a ton of damage for uh, pushing and more stun combo to burst that void. Um, and if you get the Agnums, you can always get on top of the Hoodwink quite easily. If he shows for a split second, you're on him. Guys, what about? Oh, I'm just. I threw the Braid King, and uh, it was correct. Maybe this one is, is even more off. But what about some Anti Mage? Wow. Like, it's <laughs> Chaos Knight instead. Okay. Just the CK. Okay. Statistically, one of the best yeah. heroes versus uh, Faces Void. But uh, kind of yeah. interesting. Not Nothing we think of too much, right? Outside of Falcons. I mean, they're kind of the team who you're almost expecting to pick it more often than anyone else. So uh, maybe they have some good ideas here out of the mid. I love the Queen of Pain ban. I think that would be a. Pretty solid way to round this out from Falcons, right? They already got a decent amount of control. Just want a little bit of damage. Yeah. Um, I think the CK is... pick is beautiful here. I, I think it's really, really good against Void. And he doesn't care about Doom, which is one of the big factors here. Hmm. Yeah, good lane, right? But does Shiva's on Doom make a difference? And uh, could they pick a Lash for Malreen? Or is that not hero you want to play here? Oh, never mind. This guy. Ah. He wasn't yes. banned. Now, now, that's the example of what happened before, right? Like, they have one Timber game still lately, but it's when it comes way later in the draft, when they have their time to look at it and be like, okay, now it's good Timber game, not forcing it onto their opponent and making them try and uh, juggle it around between the off lane and the mid. And that is indeed pretty solid versus the Chaos Knight, but still some concerns about the overall control and going into the lane versus the Razor. But, yeah, this, uh, I mean, it's Falcons with a Timber Saw, so they obviously know the hero better than anyone else. Okay, I think so this, we have... uh, this brings mm -hmm. the necessary damage for them. So Falcons, I mean, they, they have some competitive uh, spells as well into the team fights now, importantly. They have the Doom and they have the Chronosphere. Previous games have been decided by Extreme Gaming just having way stronger team fighting. But now Falcons, they got something for themselves here. And I think they have a pretty competitive lineup, both mid game and late game. So uh, yep. looking a bit more balanced overall from them. Yeah, definitely a little bit more balanced. For me, the worries for Extreme Gaming come with the BKBs on um, on Falcons. Are there any ways, Trent, that they can deal with those BKBs? <laughs> well, we know the one big way is uh, if DUI gets himself farmed up, but that, that's a little bit later on. Uh, part of it would just be being ahead before that timing, trying to do really well in your laning stage, uh, trying to make the most out of your earlier rotations. I think how do they get XM farmed up would be a question for me. Like, are they going to utilize a lot of stacks? Are they going to try and get a little bit aggressive? Because they have Dark Willow and Disruptor. You know, you can do a little smoke plays, run in with the storm, try and steal some stacks, get some good vision down, and then capitalize on that with the Stampede. I think those kind of plays would be excellent from Extreme. 
but obviously those all present a risk when you're up against the chronosphere in case uh, the backup comes in. So lo looking to see a little bit of aggression from them. I don't, I don't know if you can get away with being too passive with this lineup. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm hearing that Falcons have got a better sh shot this time than in the last two games. But without any further ado, this might be a decisive game. It might be the game that Extreme Gaming take the championship, the Elite League with. So Cap and SVG, take it away. Now, a lot of this series has been talking about how Extreme is going to be able to take on the Giants of Falcons, seeing as they have struggled to be able to do so until this series. But now, for the first time ever, Extreme is actually the favorite in this series. They are leading the series. They are up 2-1 to one in a best of five grand final. And one thing I want to talk about, Avery, is the tip game. And... What I kind of want to talk about is the fact that I feel like when Extreme first met Falcons in the upper bracket, they're getting tipped. Not a whole lot of responses. And I feel like in, you know, I think maybe it was almost a mental change. Uh, they came into this one. They lost that game one. And XM just kept tipping right back. He said, you know, he was just kind of like he just kept putting up with being taunted over and over again and just responded in kind. And now Falcons are down his game. And they're the ones getting tipped, and we don't we don't see those responses from Falcons. Do you think there's a there's a, a, a sign here seconds, that Falcons may be a little bit tilted at their own performances here? I mean, it's easy to shrug off OG being getting you 2-0 uh, in a group stage game that doesn't matter to you, and just say, oh, it was a loss of focus. But uh, this this has much more serious ramifications. It's definitely an interesting spot for them. I, I don't think they're tilted. I think people overestimate how much players give a damn about anything in all chats, to be honest. Like, you know, it's, it's just not the first Dota game these guys have played. They played 100,000 pubs with people flaming them every day, tipping them all the time. Like, honestly, I don't think most pro players care. They just see it in the chat and they're like, that's nice, you know? And then when they're feeling good, they throw it back because, like, it's more about them feeling good. So they want to do it mm. more than what it does to the enemy. But it is a spot that I don't think Falcons have been used to lately. And that is definitely going to throw them off. And honestly, I kind of feel, I've been thinking about this, but I feel like every time we watch these player games, every time you look at XG, Jin Q is just laughing. This guy just has the time of his life playing Dota. Like every series, you're down a game, stuff's rough. This guy's laughing. That game one they lost, they almost thrown them. After that game, he's laughing. He's, he's bringing up the team. Those types of players that can do that in those situations are insanely valuable from a team presence standpoint. And I think it's the reason they find themselves here 2-1 is, yeah, you know, sometimes that stuff tilts you, sometimes it doesn't, but what's more important is the team morale, how you're feeling about a best of five as a whole. And so far, it just feels as though XG are more confident in what's happening than Falcons at the moment, who are maybe starting to question some of the early picks, think about what's going on. To me, after that, that game three, they definitely had a talk and said, we are not gonna get outscaled. Like, yeah. we felt like we were under a lot of pressure that game to make moves. They weren't working. We don't want to end up in that position again. They took Doom first, which is a very hard scaling hero for ATF over something like the Timber that fell a little short. And then they took that Faceless Void in the second phase ahead of where I think XG were thinking that hero was going to go. I don't think XG were expecting them to just take it like that. And it's giving Falcons a lot more liability as this game goes deeper down the stretch. They aren't going to be as pressured to make moves. And that's going to be a big switch up here because suddenly it's putting XG in the position where can you snowball a game a bit? Can you deal with the faceless void doom that are farming? Can you make your counter picks work against Falcons who all of a sudden maybe aren't going to just run into you with some like blink alchemist at 15 minutes and, and play into your style? So this is going to be Falcons trying down, to switch that'll that That'll be your first blood for crit. And once more, the momentum shifts a little bit again as... This is not nearly going to be as easy a game for XG as that game three. They are not as in one side of the position, I think. And the Falcons are not a team that is just going to lose confidence in themselves to win a, a grand final series here. Tips, tips or no tips. Done, uh, done it a number of times now. And being a first blood and being in a position where they have the better late game. This will be the, the final test, really, in, in many ways for Extreme. If they fail this, they still have a game five to be able to play to. But uh, to be able to go into it and, you know, like 
it felt like game two they're very responsive game three they were being a bit more of the aggressors but as you said they they had the better late game in hand there's something that is you know very assuring about that here they need to be the aggressors and maintain aggression to a point of ending the game otherwise falcons will turn this whole thing around it starts winning lanes it starts with being able to shut down this timber saw which the later pick timber saw a lot more potent than this early pick one and right now maureen's having a great time 16 and 5 uh, though xm is right there with him at 15 and 6. I mean, he's a ranged hero so he's going to do okay versus timber but it's definitely not as one-sided a matchup as that lashrak or something like the Viper that he's been playing earlier in this series. It's going to be difficult for him to find those openings, whereas they were a bit easier in those other games. I think a lot of this might come down to the CK faceless void interactions. Like, how much does Ame get done trying to play a faster, more aggressive carry and take the fight to Falcons with his timings? You know, this armlet, BKB, heart silver edge whatever he wants to go to try and deal with this void find him in the fight lock him down and get that burst because that's what you're looking for here and at the same time you don't want to just run into some shiva's doombringer who messes up your attack speed slows you down you get doomed and then the fight's just easy for skeeter i think both these teams are really going to be wanting to find these carries and shut them down in the, in the team fight there's some symmetry there and once more jinq he's just having the time of his life man i'm telling you he's got <laughs> I've never seen a player enjoy <laughs> Dota so much, even when bad stuff happens to him. You know, like this guy watches his lane partner's courier get killed and he's laughing about it. <laughs> he's currently he's dealing the with uh, the Frost Ogre, so he's the Frost Armor constantly on the Faceless Void, so they can't put any damage on Skeeter. Laughing away. Ami's also having a bit of troubles in his lane, just the constant pressure of the, uh, the Hoodwink is beginning to amp up a little bit. The Chaos Knight has some self-sustain in the Chaos Strike and the heal that he gets off of that one, though it has been nerfed a bit over time. Uh, but it's uh, it's getting to a point where they, they might be able to go for a kill, not just on the support, but the actual carry soon is the... There it is, the Bushwhack coming in from behind, staking with the Enchant. Ame, nowhere to go, has to just fight back, and he does manage to get the kill on the hood. Mm. Can he get out? The Blood Grenade on him. He's ticking down, but they need a hit to finish him off. And they're just not going to get that, it seems like. He Staking will have to try and get the kill on DY instead. Ame is one hit away, but Ame, he's going to pop in, get the stun, and finish <laughs> off snaking as well. A gank that gets turned around by Extreme Gaming. Uh, that was a very heads-up glimpse that just stalled so much of the damage going into the CK there as it sends Amara back and gives Ame the space to find a couple crits, gain some HP, get two stuns off. Huge turnaround for XG. Not a move I think they were expecting, but one they reacted very fast to. With Jinq coming up here protecting his carry, they know the importance of Ame having a good pace here. They want to secure it. We'll free up some openings mid as that rune gets dispelled and XM going down. Nice very pickup. Easy. And Maureen, of course, immediately with the tipping and the smiling, <laughs> and XM responds right back in kind, stun onto Amar. They make that move to shut down the mid lane. It leaves the other lane open, but we could see this is what Falcons seem to, they have this trend of doing Ooh, this. Oh, the nice chain goes. And the chain is gonna come right back into play. So Maureen, he's not sent away by DY at all. He comes back in with the timber chain after the glimpse. That, that was sick. <laughs> I don't know if he was anticipating it or he was just trying to chain through to get the damage. It felt like more he was just trying to chain through to get the damage, but that is a guaranteed interaction if you land it. Timber Chain is, is not stoppable. That link stretches to infinity. Nice little pickup for Maureen, making this game a lot faster for him than that other Timber Saw game as he leads the pack here. And yeah. some nice rotations from Falcon supports. This was one of the factors that really makes this team strong is the early game pressure the supports create. It fell off a little bit in that game two and three, but they're bringing it back here with some Enchantress gameplay from Snaking. He's already ganked two lanes, made his presence felt on all three. This is exactly what you want with the hero. Force the enemy supports to react to your moves. Put them off bounce a little. Even if it doesn't work, you have to just keep looking for the next play with this hero. Can't just fall back. Falcon bringing some heat here. I really like, one thing I really like about Falcon's early movement is that they seem very fluid 
Uh, maybe part of this is just like the fact that all three of their cores tend to scale and stuff like that. But when the supports make these moves on a lane, especially if they have the TP to do so, to try and react to some sort of gank or something like that, the enemy team naturally tries to make a move because it's like, oh, the supports can't be here. Let's try and kill this offlaner, for example. And the cores always cover each other when that happens. When the supports don't have TPs, which crit will uh, find another TP as he dies here. But XM's going to be slowed down. Malrain gets the chakram on him and Skeeter joins in once again. Cores coming to help out when there's pressure on the lanes. Falcon's really prioritizing this mid now. They know that's where a lot of the momentum in this series has been. Bringing everybody to this wave, getting the D-Ward, snaking, finding the enemy obs, removing the vision from XG. This is a really hard area to fight around. Seems you lucky to get out of here alive. Okay, we'll just Never throw mind. the Proto Sphere <laughs> to stop him. I mean, that's, that's well worth it there. Because he has to walk out from base. It's going to open up this mid tower. And XG, can they find a punish anywhere else? They're going to find a Doom. The Doom XM coming in with Plasma Seal to make sure they can finish off Amar. Amar just desperate to put as much damage on the Chaos Knight as possible, he so he'll him. die and he will in the top final two ticks. I don't think Amar's too sad about that. No. I mean, you're missing out some XP, but again, slowing down the Chaos Knight here. And man, Ame has been slowed down. He is falling pretty far behind. His early fight's not working out for a hero that is supposed to be really strong in that laning phase and be able to take the fight to the enemy supports like we saw in that gank. He's just not securing him too much CS. Once more XM being pestered by snaking here. He is not alone. Yeah, it's more than just a pestering. Sampede goes out. Malrain going to be slowed down and surrounded by heroes. He's going to have a hard time getting out of this one as the Timber Chain stops halfway through by the explosion of the Cursed Crown. DY now looks for more with the Kinetic Field holding in the heroes. Only got snaking off of that, barely missed out on Amar. Who, uh, he is looking around for another Glimpse target. Won't find it, though. Really important response from, from Extreme there. You let XM go down to that casual two-man gank again, his game is just ruined. Instead, they get big turnaround kills, and suddenly XM is having a decent game as he gets the... The big kill on Maureen, a huge amount of XP. They kite this out pretty well. Just an overextension from Falcons, underestimating XG's willingness to rotate to these plays, but we've seen them amp that up as this tournament's progressed. I think they started this tournament out a bit slow in the support reactions, the support rotations, letting a lot of these European teams get away with more aggressiveness. But as this tournament's progressed, I think especially Jin Q has been willing to TP and turn these plays around at a pretty frequent pace which i mean you just have to you can't let your cores get abused like that so that's going to even out this early game a lot in fact it's yeah. going to put xm near that top with malarine despite his tower being gone here and particularly if uh falcons has the enchantress because that that is the hero that seems to enable their aggression so much around that like you know the laning phase kind of begins to fall apart around six or seven minutes and this Absolutely. period where enchanters roam around with this creep allowing them to dive towers allowing them to to once they get a kill to take a tower it just amps up so much pressure extreme gotta be on their toes when it comes to this uh five inch and Falcons getting a bit of their their read back on the game will dodge the smoke top they had double triple stack on this triangle that Amar just cleared through so that's a huge gold injection into this timber cell he is he is big now or sorry Malrin cleared through they gave it to him so he's gonna have a fast blink after this Kaya and this is the this is the type of buildup you want on the mid timber because he has all the levels to put into the spells to use this blink Kaya build and if you get away with it you just decimate the map because you're just running around you blink chakram chain back it's very casual very very free a huge amount of burst damage you can combo it with the hoodwink really nicely or he's gonna be coming huge stress but met by the timber saw again here with the burst damage coming in the stampede trying to get away from the shot of crit crit finally releases it and it will miss they'll go for the kill on dy instead here as uh little little lag pause but it should be the disruptor dying nonetheless uh, xxs also <laughs> god does he have a muted probably yeah uh, yeah another reason the, the the all chat you know some of this all chat isn't going through to everybody i'll just say that there's, there's probably <laughs> been some mutant in this between these two teams another reason amar probably has Mal muted as well that's probably what's going on here is yeah 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 
<laughs> Need support? You can? Damn. You can win four versus five? We already four versus four all tournament, bro. Four versus five. Who, what? <laughs> Who's Amar talking about here? He's definitely talking about Maureen, dude. He's making fun of his, <laughs> his boy here for sure. <laughs> uh, that's good. I mean, the real question is you were talking about the tips. Let's say yeah. Falcons lose this series. If you lose to the clowns, <laughs> then what does that make you, right? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, the, the trapeze the artist. Here, uh, that's right. You know, like, how far down on that totem pole are you? So there's there's some pressure. You know, that, that chat goes both ways. There's some pressure that Amar's put on himself here. When you call somebody clowns, you better beat those clowns. Otherwise, the clown was you all along. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's taking a little bit. They'll get, they'll get this kill on DY, but it took a lot longer than expected. Everybody from Falcons just uh, left it for Skeeter and went about their business collecting things out of the jungle, a bunch of neutral creeps and such. XM, meanwhile, doing an ancient stack to try and get himself to his SNY XXS, his Blink Dagger online, and Ame, soon to be an armlet. I mean, Ame is recovering, and honestly, Skeeter... He got that, like, one Dark Willow kill, but he's poorer than I thought he was going to be. Not that Faces Void should come off lane really far, but a lot of those stacks and everything went to the Timber. The lane farm went to the Doom. So Falcons are, are trying to push their damage dealers, their Temple Creators ahead here, and Skeeter will catch up on the backside. But that means if they're the ones getting ganked, it really sets you back. As XXS already has his Blink Dagger finish, they have the Bedlam combo, and they see Skeeter. That is a beautiful connection for them that is exactly what xxs wants with this two-man kill combo with the blink reveal he finds his mark again this guy has just been so consistent for them in this series yeah and that's gonna, that's gonna be a, a crazy amount of magic burst damage uh when he gets to veil right like he gets to veil he gets maxed out double edge you put a bedlam on that centaur that that can hunt you to zero a lot of heroes, unless they've got a lot of magic resistance, which nobody does right now. Doom's going for the Shivas, and Maureen, I'm sure, will eventually go for that Eternal Shroud, but he's going for the damage of the Kaya Blink first. It's a really good combination. I think Dark Willow does a lot for Centaur in these types of games where maybe you're feeling a bit of the pressure in the scale. All of a sudden, it does a lot for this Hoof Stomp initiation. It's not just you get Hoof Stomp Double Edge. You're getting Hoof Stomp Double Edge Bedlam, and there's a threat of the Terrorized Chain Stun. So yeah. those jumps on Skeeter are not... Like, you can't just tank that hoof stomp in these later fights and say, I'm going to live and then BKB after. You might get 100 to 0 like that. And that gives XXS a lot of freedom in this game. The team make aggressive plays. They're looking for crits. And get the glimpse. They got a lot of damage on that Razor, so Maureen... You want to be careful here, but he's not deterred. He wants to keep looking for more because he's got Skeeter behind him, itching to use a Chronosphere. It's another fight, he doesn't find that opening. And meanwhile, Ame, he's just doing Ancients. XG pushing out the waves, finding another quick kill with XXS, and back into the jungle. Maureen trying to make this blink work. He should find a quick pick off here, and we'll do so. So more momentum for him. Still highest net worth in this game. Yeah. Him and XM. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, the battle of the mid laners. Very often, heroes that end up with the highest net worth around this 15 minute mark, but uh, so much of the momentum comes through these two players. TP down to bottom lane, going for the Centaur. Centaur, is he going to be able to blink away? Nope. Crit keeps the damage on him. And Maureen finished him up. They got the Timber Chain actually hit XM in the mid lane as he Timber Chain back through. For those of you guys who were wondering how that works, if you hit, if you throw out the Timber Chain and it lands after you get glimpsed, the Timber Chain will still latch onto that tree and then it'll drag you across the map. So it's just all about timing. It's something that just a small bit of practice and you could do pretty much regularly as, as Glimpse is kind of having the same timing most of the time. Maureen? Pull back into the brambles. Ame getting active. He's been Damn. AFK in the jungle for a little bit. Oh, but and his they got first the appearance one. in a while get, nets them two kills around a power rune spot. Dude, that mid obs is out of range of two sentries here. Wow. For Falcons. That is 
Alright, and Crit is wondering where the hell the vision is on this mid lane. That is a that is a very well positioned ward. Another move on XXS. XXS gets his blink dagger cancelled as Amar shows up with the scorched earth. Had a very easy kill, despite uh, some of extreme gaming being around here. Can do nothing. So Shiva's Shiva's already done. Such a powerful item here. Needs some mana regen to sustain him, but that is going to be a really strong item for a long time. Negate some of the CK presence. Negate some of the Razor impact with Eye of the Storm. Amp up a lot of the spell damage that Falcons are outputting. It's an item they can rally behind right now as they push towards Maureen going Ags again on this timber. Just wants to frontline. Yeah, I mean, it's it's more AoE damage to help clear out the Chaos Knight uh, Phantasm. And he's got physical damage burst to be worried about, not just magic damage burst. So the Ags, uh, as long as you're able to get it off every time, can kind of cover you against both sources of damage rather than the Eternal Shroud. There's definitely some value in it here. It's just always an item that is dispellable. You always think about if teams can get to that point, you just negate all of the, the net worth feels bad. It feels a lot worse than BKB. Okay, he is going BKB, so I think BKB is definitely more reliable here. I mean, who who can get uh Well, the, the thing on the other thing about this Ags is it doesn't Ags doesn't help him get through all of the garbage he has to get through to deal damage. Like he's going to have mm. to push through these brambles, the terrorize, you know, cursed crown, glimpse, kinetic fields, hoof stomps, CK bolt. Like you don't want to not be a damage dealer in this game so bkb also guarantees that when he goes in with his blink he can follow it up for another eight nine seconds and just slay something sure. i think that's a big deal instead of just sitting there and being tanky but you're not actually killing anybody because you're perma stunned that that makes you know, a lot more sense is, to me jin q will this, get off the terror eye, so he might actually live that's a perfect example like okay he lives but he doesn't get that support that he wants to burst quickly still looking for him We'll find him. And now XG are going to try and respond. They get the glimpse. Yeah, got the glimpse on him. First crown. Timber chain breaks the chain. That's going to be important to slow down the damage. But it looks like just too many heroes from Extreme as Ame joins the field. Do they have any stuns for Amar? No. Somehow, very nobody heads has up a disable TP. for that man. Very, very heads up TP. If he goes down there too, that is just an absolute disaster for Falcons. And giving up one of these momentum-based cores is, is rough enough. As once more, it just feels like every time Falcons go deep, it does not work out. Yeah. Next but, are just happy to take these turnovers. I mean, isn't there a point that Extreme have to be the ones to go deep on Falcon's side of the map? I mean, Extreme seems very adept at being able to respond when Falcons tries to put pressure on them. Uh, but what's the timing for Extreme to turn the favor back around, to be playing on Falcon's side of the map? I mean, I don't think the scale is as one-sided this game as it was the last one. Like, I think this okay. Void Doom is scary. I think there is a world where Skeeter is the ultimate beast in the late game. But CK can make that matchup weird with, like, Phantasm, maybe even late game Ags Phantasm. You send Illusions in, you have a lot of vision. If you ever find that Void, he just instantly disappears. Uh, it can get weird. You have Terrorize to maybe bail out vo the Void Chrono if his BKB is out. Razor can become a six-slot monster. Like, there's a lot of scale here for Extreme. It's just, yeah, there's a Chrono threat, and you don't have a save versus the Chrono. But we've seen people itemize for these things, too, right? Like Wind Wakers. I mean, even yeah. random things like Book of Shadows at the 60-minute mark. Like, nothing is impossible to counter in Dota anymore if you're on even footing. So I don't think, I don't think XGR... This is not like that last game where I think Falcons had to make... They had to make all those smoke plays they did. There was absolutely no chance of winning that game late. This one is definitely winnable, though the the chrono threat is is always going to be there. Hey, I, I mean, Aegis for you. Aegis is strong in this game too. If XG can get early Roshans, do you think Racer's Eye of the Storm, which does not work on Roshan anymore, do you think it should work on Tormentor? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> well, my point would be, if it doesn't work on Roshan, then why should it work on Tormentor? Well, because Roche is, I mean, Roche is way more susceptible to minus armor reduction as a concept than the Torment terms. Well, I don't know, think in that's entirely like, true because the the more minus armor you have on the Torment, or the less damage is reflected back to you. Okay, I, sh I shouldn't say susceptible. I mean, like the 
So when you have a huge minus armor lineup, you can do Roche in like 10 seconds. I feel like that's a way bigger deal than you being able to do the Tormentor in five seconds because you have a bunch of minus armor. Mm. Okay. I I'll think it's more it. impactful. So I feel like Eye of the Storm working on Roshan would be just be a way bigger deal for this hero. I think we've seen that over time too. There are certain heroes that have had mechanics that worked against Roche. Yes. And it made them like first pick in the meta. I mean, CK was one of those. The patch where CK yeah. was first pick was partially because his crit did 4x or whatever damage to Roche. And this hero could just solo Roche on with like a level 1 or 2 Phantasm. It was insanely yeah. stupid. That's that's my example. Of like when heroes can do that, it just breaks some of the heroes. So yeah, I mean he was also one of the heroes that it used to be illusions didn't work against Roshan at all, and then they changed that, and then they also gave him that that crit damage against yes. uh, creeps, and it, it all kind of compiled into a monster. But there was a there was a patch where Underlord could do the same thing. Firestorm percent burn worked on Roche. Yeah, and that hero yeah. became first pick because he's just soloing Roche with Underlord. So I think there's your answer. They're gonna find Snay with. Quick little Bedlam combo. This is designed to be able to kill this hero. <laughs> you have to use the Terrorize, not the Stampede. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, okay. I mean, it's a short cool. It's not that long cooldown, 90 seconds. Yeah. Trying to get aggressive. Trying Got him. Force the BKB. The long the range BKB. of the Thunderstrike lands onto Amar, and as soon as you get that damage, because his choice of going to Shiva's, and still not considering, oh, it got BKB flying out to him and just didn't yeah, get to him in time. That's what I saw. I thought it got delivered, but that was him putting on the courier, so. Yeah. Just a little too slow for that capability. That's going to open up the Roche, and this Roche is, this is where I think XG can feel confident going into those late games, if they get Roche on, because Aegis, Aegis is a problem for Falcons. Particularly on this chaos, it means he can go in, be hyper aggressive, create that single target burst threat on these cores, and you don't want to chrono him. You don't want to doom him because he has that second life. So it's a really important item for Ame if he can get it, but they're not getting it too fast. That CK Roshan nerf, no eye of the storm either <laughs> coming into play. I you have to take I the love fight. moves like this when you smoke into them and it's still a four versus five, but they don't get that opening. They do not get the jump that they wanted to. Don't even get the BKB out of him as he's desperately trying to hit that glimpse and he does hit it. But now Maureen, oh, the tree got cut down, but it's still DY dying to Skeeter. Skeeter gets jumped on. He has a BKB of his own. Amar pushes forward with the Shivas on him. Triple BKB timing. Falcons, this is why they so badly wanted to be able to take this fight around the Roshan pit. They go for the Chronosphere on XXS. The Centaur is going to be able to get off the Stampede and gets away. Skeeter almost gets popped by Ame. Does manage to get the time walk back away. Meanwhile, Maureen, Maureen. hunting in deep, goes for the kill on XXS, commits his BKB for it, gets the kill, but has to TP back to base. Oh, that, is a, that is a nice edge team fight for both teams, honestly. The Chrono was yeah. just... It's not good enough there, I think, for what Skeeter wanted. But he was having issues getting in deep on these lines as XG are backing up. And I mean, like you said, the BKB timing is super important for both teams here as they're trying to bait it out. The second you commit, though, green light for XM and Alme to come into this fight. You get the Doom on the Razor, but I don't think XM cared. There's no damage going into him. Alme did have issues sticking on the targets. He, he finds supports, but that's about it. He does not have to commit his BKB, though. That's big. These types of trades do favor XG if all things are even because your Chrono's on cooldown, your Doom is on cooldown, and those are the longest cooldowns in this game. Which means yep. if they want to take the time, they can just force the Roshan now, and there really is no option to contest here from Falcons. So even though that's a pretty Radiant's even team fight, it does hurt Falcons here in terms of contesting that Roshan, which is what they wanted out of that in the end. It's going to be Ame soloing it. Not as fast as it used to be, but... Still doable, I guess. Yeah. The rest of his team was pushing onto the tier one tower, see if they could take that objective away. Uh, a little pine cone caused some problems, so they go back to the pit where Falcons are clearly not contesting. Is this where XG's lineup's gonna hit its stride? His next 10 minutes here. Falcons are really gonna have to play crisp on the map, and they're gonna have to use their cooldown as well. Yeah, why not? I mean, I think at this point in the game, you're okay with either. I think the later the game goes, I want it on Ame more and more. But yeah, we'll see who plays more of the front line. I mean, if they're willing to just run the Razor in and like trade his life for one, one Chrono or one Doom, then okay. That's a way you can take the fight. 
yeah, they're both heroes that I would say Aegis is the best on, uh, just due to the fact they're so reliant on uh, a certain spell to get out damage. Phantasm for Chaos Knight, Eye of the Storm, and Static Link for Razor. So the second life is going to be less effective. But yeah, for I sure. mean, if you're able to, to use it in some frontlining scenario, or uh, you know later on, maybe we see some refreshers start coming out and things like that. Blink Dagger for the Doom, and then the Hoodwink is also scaling up with the Maelstrom now. I think as I talked about earlier in the series as well, these like anti-carry heroes that Falcons were getting a lot of extra Dyer's worth out of. This ra XGR creating a situation where Skeeter's team fight isn't that straightforward because he has there's this Orchid on Ame, which after his BKB is gonna hundred to zero him. Mm -hmm. And there's also this this static link with Shard that if XM ever gets a link on the razor post jump or around that jump, you just remove all the damage from the fight. This is a big pickoff if they get it. Yeah, he's got BKB, but even if he got it off somewhere in there, Damn. probably the physical burst comes through anyway. So, and the tip, a big chill. The tip, the <laughs> smiley, they keep on rolling here for XM. The man you're telling has me found if, his mark. If Maureen sees this, you're telling me after you just clowned <laughs> on this guy for the last, you know, four, three, four games over and over again. I, I don't know what their problem was with the XM specifically, but man, they really, really tipped him over and over again. And you start getting tipped back, you start getting smiley back, and you kind of look like the fool. You're telling me that doesn't affect you at all? I mean, it might, might be affecting him a little bit at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's definitely getting frustrating. You can feel it in these games. These are not the rollovers that Falcons have maybe gotten used to in some of these previous tournaments. And they're on the edge. They're on the edge of getting eliminated here. Shinkyu so might be able to run into some heroes here. Maybe get off a force of BKB. No, somebody was taking the Lotus. Throws out the Bramble. And Amar, he wants to play it safe. He's going to have the BKB TP out. And in fact, he wants to go for the kill on the Dark Willow first. And then BKB TP out, but uh, Shadow Realm protected uh, Dark Willow from any damage, so won't die to the Doom, that's for sure. It's a Doom on cooldown. Still yep. two minutes on this Aegis. If XG want to try and push their map control, look for a quick smoke across the map. His play options are available now. Yeah, Snake King's really doing his, his best AUI impression right now. He's got a Seder bottom lane that's going to cut the wave. He is putting his hero on the line to, to be able to push in mid. Like, they have these long cooldowns, but they also have the enchant. This is what I uh, is so annoying about Enchantress. Yeah, it does lanes and makes these rotations early. But then it does things like this. So if you have long cooldowns, it helps you recover from a bad move or a bad play. Absolutely true. Snaking is very good at this map manipulation. So this is not a team that's just going to let you abuse that opening too easily. Both supports are pretty good at ratting here. Both supports are always going to find some farm in this game. See if they can use them as this game progresses. Get that hoodwink to like that fourth core level. It could make a difference here down the stretch. Or if Snake can just get to like Hurricane Pike and you Got never know. It's just Pike this Razor in a fight. There's, oh, must not have been in range. Crit has a chance. They need the vision to be able to hit the glimpse, and they got it. They got Chrono the vision. Anami. Crit. He'll die. Ame caught inside the Chronosphere. The drain onto Amar. Ame's going to take a lot of damage here. XM is the one with the Aegis. Ame trying to fight, but he can't get the life steal enough to be able to stay alive. XM with his extra life. He's pretty free to chase down heroes, but he doesn't have the lockdown per se. The Glimpse back. Maybe they do. And with no BKB left on Skeeter, they'll be able to trade out supports now. Huge and maybe even run, run down Snake King as well. Snake King just wants to take away his Aegis from XM. And XM says, you can have it. You could take it with your own hands. It's not quite the case, though. I'm burning on no, this tower. Can't. 30 seconds left. I mean, that's efficient. Yeah. Really big glimpses by DY to, to finish up what was kind of like a weird engagement by Ame. I mean, he was trying to solo kill this Doom, but he only had like one illusion hitting him in the tree line. Gets Chrono. Just super awkward exchange for him, but the team is able to convert on it. And it's a four man wipe. And that is also a four-man wipe with Chrono being used, so 80-second cooldown on that. Again, every time these spells are on cooldown, it feels like XG owned the map. Particularly behind XM, who has just been a beast this series overall. Top three network cores all belonging to Extreme Gaming right now. Yeah, they, they're playing like not... they know it. When they're ahead like this, it means it's not just going to be a Chaos Knight show. 
XM, once he gets that refresher, and if he ever gets that level 25, those are big, big numbers. Big items, big talents to get to. That'll help you scale up quite a bit, and that'll help you keep pace with uh, the Doom or that Timber Saw. We just saw execute DY with the big healthy heap of uh, burst damage. So we saw Malreen pick off DY, and that's going to lead them into a smoke. Even with Chrono on cooldown, they're going to try and make the play without the Void. This is dangerous if it goes already deep. Active. Bushwhack lands. No BKB. They go for the cut onto XM. But oh, that terrorize. Allows him to get off the BKB and monster terrorize. Ame just calls it quits, though. They say they're trying to make a move here. Best for us no just fantasm. to back away. BKBs, no Phantasm, no Disruptor. Just a retreat is called for. I mean, if he has Phantasm there, they might take that fight with the, the huge terrorize. But you, you just don't have the damage without it. Which is a, it is a big... It is a big component of this game. Like, if Falcons get the jump on Ame in these fights, if they can start the Doom or Chrono onto the CK, a lot of that damage goes out the window. And then you're you're very reliant on playing a very long fight or having XM just go ham. That type of setup can be very good for Falcons here, and they, they have the Shiva's Doom to go in and give the vision for that type of setup. Hoodwink can shoot an Acorn. You, you can send some Edge Creeps. They have a bit more options this game than the last time around. Smoke across. Chronosphere. No BKBs on some heroes on both sides. But with the Chronosphere, Falcons feel confident. And it's good for them. But it's only if the smoke lands. Right now, it looks like they may just run into some supports. Not their real target in XM or Ame. Keep on trailing really them. They spot a Jin Q. Ame, he's going through. Skeeter. Oh, that oh, bushwhack. bushwhack. The Shivas goes out, the Doom is already there. And now Ame, he has to make a run for it and try and TP out somewhere. It's just not gonna work if Skeeter's hot on his tail and Maureen has with the Chakram to slow him down. A get the smoke kill. What a bushwhack from Crit. That is, I mean, that is just pure intuition to aim it like that. Get both barely on the edge as Ame's trying to portal. They get gem out of that as well. Jin Q is carrying that. That is a huge pickup here, and you didn't even have to commit the Doom or the Chrono. Oh, you committed the Doom, but like, you still have this Chrono up to contest some sort of Roshan battle. ATF is scouting it. If you get Roshan in this game as Falcons, you're feeling pretty confident at that point, because you don't have to battle into the Aegis with your big ults, and Skeeter can play a lot more aggressive without getting all in bursted. Dyer's top tower is under attack. Falcons Awkward. strike back. Awkward timing for that extreme. They get caught on a smoke. Big play for Falcons, but Roshan not up and won't be up for quite some time. So extreme have more than enough time to be able to reset and get all five heroes and get some map control before that Roshan actually does spawn. And I feel like the only scale they're building into that next fight is going to be the refresher for XM. I don't yeah. think Ame is really going to get another item here for a decent amount of time. Radiant and I think XXS, he's eyeing that Wind Waker to help deal with the Chrono, but he is a very long ways off. You have one Yules for his Timber. That's something. The damage is just kind of peaking right now for XG, so if they don't win this next Roche fight, they're going to be in a big downtime period where Falcons are continuing to scale with this Void and this Doom. Their supports are starting to pick up some of the extra damage and become those 4th and 5th cores. If you put an Aegis on one of these heroes, it might just be too much to punch through. So we come to the crucial part of the, the game that we talked about at the start, which was, is Extreme going to be able to keep the momentum and be the aggressors and take control of this game without relying on the fact that they just have better late game? This smoke and where it lands and who it lands on is crucial. And it's going to be on a sneaking. It doesn't immediately burst him. Ame connects, throw out a bushwhack. Nothing major lost for Falcons. But it does give a bit more control for Extreme if they want to go back and take this Roshan on Dire side. I mean, they have to threaten the Roshu. Snaking does have buyback. It's a hard contest, though. You're just going to buy and run there and, and hope you find the aggressive Chrono. It is up. Ame's going to take this. 
There's no way XG don't take the opportunity off that smoke. I think regardless of what they found, even if they found nothing, they might have just done this play regardless. Yeah. Second Yule's up for the Centaur. Again, trying to get to these Wind Wakers to help the front line. So they're so, doing Roshan. Falcons don't seem too concerned about it. They know what's happening. They just uh, are going to try and get as much farm off the map as possible, saying, hey, Extreme have to push into us. They're the ones who have to try and go high ground with this Aegis. When they do, we'll be ready with Chronosphere. This is the Aegis they give to Ame now. That, that focus has shifted a bit. He needs to be able to go in and create the chaotic situation where he's threatening the Void, threatening the Doom, can play with that second life. And XM, he's going to have to play a little bit behind that. He does have cheese on this Razor. He has his Refresher. He wants to get all this off the fight, but he cannot be the guy who gets doomed or chronoed first and removed. Alame has two lives. Because Alame's not going to get the job done on his own here. Yeah. Very Ra crucial Razor period definitely action. feels like the number one enemy for Falcons. If they ignore him for 100%. some reason, XM cleans up the fight. If they try and throw any damage at him when they don't have Doom on him, the cheese... It's just going to allow him to push through everything. All about the initiation. XXS trying to find an initiation, a pickoff on Amar. And little do they know, he's farming the easy camps, not the hard camps. Now, Falcons wanted to be in this position in a sense. They went back for the heavier scale. They went for the comfort late game heroes in the Void and the Doom that they knew if these games are dragging on and we feel pressured, we want to be the ones to put the pressure on XG. You find yourself in a pretty much an even game. Almost the 40 minute mark. So this is this is almost Falcon's game to lose from a certain standpoint in that like this is where they want it to be, right? Yeah. You want to be with the Doom with the Void in an even late game where you're heading towards that third Roche and the pressure's on XG to make something happen during this time period. I mean, you you got most of that. Maybe not as clean as you wanted, not as big a lead, but I mean, you're in the grand finals. You're playing against the best team, the best other team right now. Beggars can't be choosers. So this is it's time to show up here and get a good team fight. Get a good Doom, get a good Chrono. Go to a game five. And Extreme. Zame. It's their chance to be show that they are championship material to get first in tournaments and not just in groups that comes through this fight. Ame, the first one to be jumped on, trying to take away that Aegis without over committing, and they'll get it pretty easily. This Jumping is a from XXS. Bad be setup. Any punish here. XXS doesn't really find much out of this one. Just a lot, a lot of death. Chrono Spear put on Ame, got the BKB, and now the Stampede goes off. Can he get away from this situation? Ame now pops his Phantasm. A Static Storm immediately going up. Managed to get away from the Static Storm, but locked down He's by gone. more ensnares. There's just too much. They managed to kill Ame twice. It wasn't the Razor at all. That was the problem. They I mean, just he got doomed. Fixed it. Oh, XM's going back in. Going. He sees all of this has been used on Ame, and he thinks this is his time to be able to shine to carry this fight with his double ultimates, with the he's refresher. Stuck on the... He's trying to get over the ledge to get to Maureen. He'll finish off Maureen. Turns back. Goes for snaking, or no, they want a little bit something else here. They've got Skeeter, who's going to time walk into XM, get the bashes. They couldn't finish off Amara time, and Skeeter, he's the strongest man in the fight now. Everyone else from Extreme is not good enough now that Skeeter is beginning to come online. A game of inches and the question mark. <laughs> the question mark comes out against his own teammate. I guess. <laughs> Even Falcons are not immune to the Falcons trash talk, apparently. <laughs> as they do make a successful high ground hold. And I go back to how this all started, which is Ame giving up that Aegis basically for free. That is just not what you want to have happen. You got no value out of it. They yep. didn't commit the Chrono. Chrono comes out the second time. Sure, he lives, but the damage is already done. XM got doomed that entire sequence as Amar knew his mark, found him on the side with a really nice flank. And then we see the power of the Razor at the end. He, he cheesed up, goes back in, has the double link, has the double BKB. But at this point, two heroes are dead. You're fighting up against all five. There's buybacks available for Falcons regardless in this situation. This is just not a winning fight the way it's set up. So XG throw away a huge advantage. 8k Goldie now to Falcons. Potential little pick off here. Phantasm Skeeter jumping into them. Static Storm uh, BKB, but he can't live through this kind of physical burst. 
What? No protection there. Ame gonna reset a little bit. Let them play with these stuns. They have the disruptor to be able to pull back more heroes, so there's no need to overextend, not while XM is still dead. So they play it safe, make sure that they get out on their carry, and now they start collecting whatever heroes are still close by. Crit, he's going to try and hop himself over the side, but he won't make it, not with a glimpse there. So they get that core kill. Skeeter jumps into death, red death in the Chaos Knight, and get two more supports off of that kill. That was such a weird force. Like, why are you? Why is that the fight you're taking, right? When you're, you're chrono... You don't get a chrono off there. You don't. Your BKB void's kind of wasted. You're just trying to man fight a CK under Static Storm. It, a bizarre sequence, honestly. And now, I mean, high ground failed for XG, but they get a second try. Oh, Malreen! He goes for the quick kill onto the Dark Willow. Second Trockum comes out and cuts him down. Is he gonna pay a big for it? play if he can get it out, but he's being stuck. Gets off the BKB, Timber Chains away. He's good for now. So he does manage to get that kill, but it costs him something. In fact, XXS sees his opportunity with the BKB waning. You'll set up into the hoof stomp. Can they Other do enough rags. damage? XM, he's been doomed, and he's making a run for it. A second doom about to come out. Ame, he's not inside the Chronosphere. He's got a few more seconds. He can leave the damage onto Amar. He might be able to finish off Amar. Pulls him back in. Kills Ooh. him off. A Chronosphere that just killed Amar's chances. He had an opportunity there to be able to get the Doom onto Ame, but he gets frozen in his own teammate's Chrono. The void giveth and void taketh here. As Skeeter needs a pause. I mean, <laughs> XG, they, they just have these little openings, these little slip-ups by Falcons, and they are taking huge advantage of it. And you're right, this Chrono, it just does nothing here is... I mean, he got, he dies and has to buy back while the Chrono's out. Like, that is like worst case scenario. XM lives through all of it. This man is just way too tanky. The late game scaling a, continues for Extreme. They now have DY's Aghanim Scepter. That was a refresher forced out of Maureen just for the, the second defensive Ags pop as well. Mm -hmm. Not really what he wanted there. He does have his level 25. These these are big talents in this game too. Level 25 for the double shock room. Snake Skeeter is half a level off of backtrack. And they got the level 25 for the Razor, which is also big talent in this game. And XG are feeling it, man. They know there's no chrono here for 70. They just be damned. They're gonna put the front line up there. God damn, look at how bold they are. Just these two hitting the barracks while the other three are half a map away. They smoke I mean, up the three of them and get close. DY has ags. You hoof stomp somebody into Disruptor ags right now. Jump into the enemy. Not quite what he wanted. XM's first static link picks up a little damage from the Enchantress. A buyback available for Snake King. They turn that damage back around and take a second lane of barracks. There is still a tier two up. So they can't keep the momentum going just yet. They're going to have to back up, deal with that top lane. And in that time, Roshan will potentially spawn. So a reset for Extreme Gaming as they take a healthy lead in game four, right on the cusp of closing out a best of five finals against Falcons. Another smoke just to make sure they don't get jumped here. And I mean, the biggest factor now is maybe this Disruptor Ags because any sort of stun where you can drop that on top of a host stomp, on top of a Chaos Bolt, you, do, you put it on the Void, you put it on the Timber, the, the Doom, there is no save for it in this game. There is no Geomagnetic Grip. There is no Rubik Lift. There is no Disruption. I mean, you are basically just done for. This is a huge deal and a huge problem for Falcons in this team fight. They, Malring was pinging out DY. He knows this hero has to die. They have to find him at some point. I mean, <laughs> you get Static Storm. You get Bloodthorned by Ame, who now has a Wind Waker for himself. 4,800 HP, and he goes the extra mile for survivability and gets a Wind Waker for himself. That's a second Wind Waker. They now have one on Ame, one on XXS. Nullifier was XM's choice. XG are itemizing for what they need in this game. They are itemizing to beat that late game scaling power. And they're getting there. They're creating the solutions for what they're up against. And right now, it's looking hard for Skeeter to find this fight. However, Skeeter did hit level 25, and he has Refresher. Double Chrono coming out on top of that backtrack talent. That's a different story if he can land them. Crit breaks the smoke, gets a ward down. Two to Wind Wakers, two Chronospheres, 
two dooms. But Play and counterplane, Falcons and Extreme. Malreen putting himself forward on the front lines. Wants to be the one targeted. Extreme. Looking for an opening. Look at this Enchantry creep. Getting a little idea of where they're at. The smoke still holds for most of Extreme. So they don't see the important hero in DY. There are buybacks available here for most of Falcons, including Malreen, who's playing on that front line. They don't mind if he go necessarily goes down once. But it cannot be Skeeter getting jumped. He is all in on this double chrono. Snake oh, pushing forward. And a feint to jump forward onto the Enchantress. Bedlam thrown onto XXS. He's got heart, 6,000 HP and a BKB. That is not is the target you want. <laughs> he is that very is difficult to go on. Not the target you want here, and he knows Another it. Another jump. Another go on a seeking. They throw out the Bloodthorn just to see if they can kill him without it. The response to double Chakram and attempt at a bushwhack, but executes it away. They spotted Ame. They got him inside the Chronosphere. Is there anything to save him? Where's the Wind Waker to bail him out? He finally gets it off, but a second Chronosphere is coming in soon. Silence up. Skeeter, he's got the refresh. He's got another Chrono. He goes back in, but he's losing his mark. While well, Ame has gotten off the Phantasm for bushwhack, controlling up the illusions. Into the corner they go. A Terrorize gets thrown. No out. second Chrono! Silence onto Skeeter. Skeeter, Skeeter can't get off the Chrono. No second Chronosphere to win the fight. And that might have just killed extreme as quad smile a world of smileys from xm he has been smiled at so many times by maureen but he will turn it double fold as he knows this might have just been the end they don't have ame but falcons don't have skater just a sick silence on the void when he left in i believe it was the just the blood door from ame you just saw him leaping in caught him at the end you get stuck in that corner, there's Static Storm getting dropped, there's Terrorize getting dropped. It's an awful place to fight for Falcons. As XG just bait them deeper and deeper, the Dooms are unaffected, ineffective against XM. As he got the drain on the Void. He removed all his damage, even if that Chrono goes off, I don't think Skeeter's doing anything in it. And that yeah. is going to be an Ag Scepter to the Razor here, an Aegis for the Razor. And a cheese into Jin Q's pocket, who, guess what, finished up a third Wind Waker here. And they got the comes back on a Snake King to get the Roshan and get the pick off. Maybe. Maybe they don't have the damage, actually. XXS just like, I can only hoof stomp him and, and double edge him so many times here. They have more glimpses coming up, though. And this now is the for him. I don't, he's not too sad about this. It's now he has 8,000 HP. XG, they're going for the throat. No buyback on Skeeter. At a time for XM's revenge, focusing on Maureen, but taking a lot of damage in return. Has to be careful the shots coming in from Snaking. That pure damage builds up. BKB, they throw out the Doom, but he gets a Wind Waker over to the other side. He do manage to hit him with the Bushwhack, but the tree is cut down immediately. The BKB and the Wind Wakers allow them to reset from the Doom. While the Static Storm yeah. still goes to work onto Amar, pulling him back into Bramble after Bramble. He gets off his own BKB. XM can't finish him off a Bushwhack. It breaks the link and can't finish off the damage. And there goes his first life. Ami about to rejoin the fight though can he get he's here he actually got here on the outpost they have to get away though because skeeter is also coming alive i mean xg are trying to push that 4v4 they know the void is maybe the most important hero for falcons they wanted to get something there but they will have to settle for a snaking buyback as somehow falcons repel xg trying to push in with two lives on this razor And this will reset the cooldowns. All the refreshers are going to be back for Falcons. All the ultimates back up in 20 seconds here. And you gave up that Aegis for an Enchantress buyback. But damn if we aren't seeing the power of Wind Wakers in this game. Three up for XG now. And it is, it is causing Falcons problems. They don't have the dispels for them. There are no nullifiers on the side of Falcons. There are no heroes that can buy it easily. And the Dispels are here for XG. The saves are here for XG. That Timbersaw Ags is not as strong as it used to be. And you always have this Static Storm threat looming. These fights are so damn dangerous for Skeeter to play. I do not envy his position. It'll be a smoke from XG. Falcons being put to the test really for the first time this season. How are they going to be able to stand up to it? There have been a lot of teams who have come and gone, who've been dominant in various patches and tournaments. 
Got to be able to stand Maureen. tall here. Maureen caught inside the static storm. He's tanky, There's but they the got dispel. nullifier He's on gone. him. Even. So there goes Zag and himself. Their Skeeter tries to come in and take advantage of the situation with the Chronosphere on it, too. He's going to chain the Chronosphere. What does he have Where's the damage? The damage? He's controlling these heroes, but Ami is destroying the back line. He's not doing anything to these guys. He simply doesn't have it in him anymore. Ami is in trouble. Forward, going after Amar, ignoring him. Maureen refresh goes for the double chakrams again with a re BKB, but extreme gaming. Ooh, they got what that they out of him a glimpse back. XM sniped down by crit. The man has no buyback right now. Four minutes till that buyback. Two minutes on the board, but there are no chronos. So, yeah, XG, no, this is not a fight Falcons can take, even in the five on four. If he did not summon. get that snipe onto XM, that surely would have been extreme. Resetting and going for the end of the game. But without XM, they might feel like they don't want to do it. Or maybe Ame is going to lead the charge like XM did earlier. TPD the other side of the map, see if they Only can catch Amar. Idea. That'll make things a whole lot easier in their decision. If they can get a pick off here, they've got the scan on him. He doesn't have BKB, but he blinks away in time. A glimpse back. A glimpse on Skeeter. Gets him inside the it static storm. Can the heroes get here in time? Ame is closing in with the Bedlam on him. He pulls him back in into what his a catch. There's no way out of this way. DY has just found the opening for Extreme to close this series out. How did that clip him? He was right on the edge. That is an absolutely disgusting glimpse catch. That's going to open up this complete finished lead. with you, says XM from the grave as he watches his team finish what he put so much effort into starting double truck rooms on xs but again he's got the wind waker again they could just reset a shot almost Ooh. landing on jin q a pixel perfect wind waker from him dodges the damage while ame goes for the throw goes for amar he gets taken out so damn quickly and even if they could live could they do the damage to repel this beast of extreme that is inside of their base. Another buyback going out. Extreme. 15 seconds till XM is up. If he wants to be in the picture when the throne explodes. He has no gold for bots. He's gonna have to TP outpost. There's a little bit of a window here. You have the so he comes back you in don't down have the BKB. Storm. That's good. Another dieback. Another kill. Extreme taking their it's, time, it's picking up off. The GG is called. The pause is done, and the GG's easy. Question marks. Extreme. He who last, last, <laughs> laughs loudest, and Extreme are hollering through the screen right now. Humble in defeat. GG. Grad says Malreen. He knows he was tormenting Extreme. They were tormenting XM specifically but Extreme pulled through and they managed to take down Goliath. They have become the new Goliath. Extreme will win Elite League. I, what, what a series from them. What a day from them. Remember, they had to play a whole lower bracket match as well. Go up against an opponent no one's been able to beat for two months, get destroyed in that game one, and then somehow they just flip a switch. And like none of these games felt like they were getting outplayed. It felt like they were outplaying Falcons in all three of these games. From the small things to the lanes to these drafts getting progressively favorable for them. Just finding opportunities in the games where they had the scale, it felt very natural. In a game like this where we're unsure, they made those late game fights impossible for Skeeter. Triple Wind Waker here. Ag, Static, Storm, uh, XM with Refresher Nullifier to get rid of the Timbers off front line. I mean, the itemization was just on point here. A good itemization wins you tournaments and xg were just on a different level today i don't know something flipped the script for this team they just went into overdrive maybe it was the tips maybe it was one smiley too far <laughs> whatever it was <laughs> falcons met their match and i mean you can call them clowns you can call them gods you can call them anything in between but today they're champions mm -hmm. and they're gonna go home smiling all the way to the bank as an impressive run from this team an impressive end of this game. Not an easy late game to win. Into double Shiva's Doom, double Ags, double Chakram, Quad Chakram, double mm -hmm. Chrono, whatever the hell you want to call it. And then you have two supports who are scaling. You know, there's a Deso almost Dados on this Hoodwink. There's a Hurricane Pike on Snaking here. They just played those fights to perfection. Like the Wind Waker dodges, the disengage, re engages. Just beautiful, beautiful late game team fighting. And that catch from DY on Skeeter at the end.
I mean, five positions can win you games, ladies and gentlemen. That was a hell of a catch to end that BO5 before Falcons could regain any footing. Perfect way to close it out. The five position with the least net worth shines the most in the clutch moment to close out the game and get extreme over the board and into a 3-1 victory. When coming into this, it was a question of, is Falcons going to 3-0 whoever shows up, or will it be a 3-1 or a 3-2 victory for Falcons? No, not at all. Extreme come in. They win the series <laughs> over Falcons, a team that they were 0-7 against, and they managed to beat them 3-1, not even going the full distance of the series with a game to spare. Extreme managed to take Falcons down on a patch that people were saying this is this is like you know this part you know post ti post all this sort of thing this was falcons little ownership this is our little patch and people were saying well the new patch is going to come in that'll shake up the scene the sh scene gets shaken up before falcons even get to ex experience their heroes getting nerfed extreme comes in and beats them when falcons feel the strongest it is, it is an impressive victory it's been some time since i think we've seen such a dominant favorite just get turned this one-sidedly like a 3-1 victory for XG. I think there's still people out there that are thinking Falcons are going to win this series. <laughs> they're still sitting there like, well, they're going to win. The, they're going to win it 4-3. Let's play the BO7. You know, like, I think that's how favored they were. So for XG to come in here, and again, they won the 2-0 earlier today too. That is like a 5-1 for them on the day. Going against their mortal opponent, that is a big swing for this team and a lot of confidence for the rest of the year. You're looking... For Birmingham coming up soon, you're looking for more tournaments down the line. You want to go to Riyadh. You want to go to TI. Wins like this can make or break a team, right? And this yep. is going to go a huge way for that squad and their confidence in these big tournaments down the road, knowing that they can actually clinch it in the clutch. So congrats to them and impressive performance. But, I mean, damn, Falcons made them work for it. And even if maybe they weren't on 100% today, this is still an incredibly dominant team. And they cruise through a lot of this bracket. They are, they are very strong when they get what they want and... Kudos to them for making another grand finals appearance after winning, you know, three, three out of four tournaments. You can't complain about that. Like that is no, no certainly <laughs> not. Cannot complain. And they're going to be top contenders for the rest of the year, I'm sure. But here they fall short. Extreme Gaming had their moment in the sun and they get a 3-1 victory over Falcons. Against all odds, according to many, and this, I have to say, included... Uh, team Extreme Gaming take down Team Falcons 3-1. What an amazing, what a thrilling series that this has been and what a thrilling conclusion. This game, they were just relentless. They refused to lose. These three Wind Wakers guys, do we like that? I mean, I love it. I love what I saw this game. Really exciting stuff. We got to see a nice late game here. Tons of beautiful combinations going on. Extreme gaming with so smart itemization as well to solve the threats from Falcon. I think that was a big difference. Falcon, they didn't have anyone going for that nullifier to try and deal with all these Wind Wakers. And Faces Void, he just had a despair of a game. He was like bottom farm for almost the entire game out of the course. And a lot of this due to him just getting stuck in jungle. He couldn't really push lanes. Yeah, and here you can see when the game was looking kind of scary, though, because XG had this big lead, and it's like, oh, wow, they're going to do it. But then Falcons, they kept finding these pickoffs. And over and over, you're like, oh, okay, wait, hold on. Maybe there's a chance. But this push here, when the game had basically evened out, they, they go up and they lose this Aegis for nothing. This is where I was like, oh, it's over. Like, I thought this is going to be the bad times to start again here for XG. But if there's one thing they prove, it's they're really, really good at staying on their side of the map. And immediately after this, unfortunately, Falcons decide to cross the river. And good things did not happen to Falcons, I think, any time they crossed the river this game. Um, I, I thought XG were going to be the ones who need to be more aggressive in this one, but it felt like they were really comfortable just sitting back, and they caught so many of those aggressive moves here from Falcons that it almost felt like they, they kind of passed their own lead away. Yeah, discipline, discipline, discipline. This is what we've been harping about for the majority of this tournament, and Team Falcons had it in every single series so far even if they have an advantage of 20 30k they still go back they wait out uh, some respawns some big ulties and then they go in that river crossing that you just talked about was without the chrono right like they went in they lost that fight quite easily and they didn't even have the chrono if uh, if needed in in such a situation what happened do you guys think uh, cap and svg were hinting at it a little bit that these tips they went a little bit too far and bite them back in the end. 
I mean, it definitely looked satisfying from the point of view of extreme gaming here, throwing back a lot of uh, a lot of tips, and even with the GG oh, this chrono, towards dude. the end. Oh, this chrono was a really sad mistake. He kills his own teammate, stuck on the edge, CK Lucian's hitting him. There the were definitely a glimpse. lot of unfortunate moments for, for Skeeter on his void here. Oh, DY was so crazy, though. Man, like, I feel like he had such a good read on the BKBs. I don't know if he's just chucking them out there, but there were like three clutch, such important kills that he got when there's like four seconds left on the BKB and he's hitting these glimpses and getting them in that ag static storm. And it's just like, oh, well, I guess I'm just dead now. Yeah, and it was so difficult for these supports. Like, remember when we were in the draft, I asked, what are they going to do once BKBs are up? It wasn't really that simple for them. Even in the super late game, when you have refreshers, you have so many BKBs to worry about, and they still make it work. Just, I guess that's just a testament to their talent, once again. Staying cool in these kind of situations, even terrorizing as BKBs are running out. Just in the nick of time before Refresher is popped, BKB. Just insane. Like, you could see the old chat there in the end. Oh, man, it, it has to feel. pretty quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> the moment the GG comes out. Yeah, I mean, I think they played beautifully. And they also solved, you know, one of the strengths of, uh, of this hero faces. We're going back to it by having all three of their heroes, all three cores, becoming big, potent threats. You can try and chrono someone, but... Ultimately, there were too many things to deal with, and all of them were just, you know, playing beautifully. I think XM stands out probably the most for me uh, out of the core players on the side of Extreme. I think he played this game so well on the Razor, which is also kind of funny to do into Team Falcon, who definitely love Razor themselves. Yeah, I just masterfully done here throughout this draft. Like, a lot of questions had to do it. The Timber Sauce seems to have been the one they wanted to let through. Even though they ended up picking it late and it was a better game for it, they still played around it exceptionally well. And they grabbed themselves the Razor, a classic XM hero that he's willing to bring back. And even though the hero is quite a bit different than when he used to spam it all the time. So it, it, felt, it feels like someone finally figured it out. Everyone's been asking and asking, like, what do we do versus Falcons? You actually got them to a point where they looked at least a little bit uncomfortable with the draft. And uh, finally, uh, you know, the larger they are, the harder they fall. You got to give as much credit as possible to Falcons for how much they're willing to talk trash because, oh, man, it must <laughs> feel so good when they lose. I can't even imagine what the Twitch chat looked like. I forgot to open it up. But, you know, uh, I, it, we're all waiting for it, right? Everybody wants to see it. So, uh, yeah, I give them credit for being the heels that we need. Yeah, in one of these games, we had a lot of XDs in the chat as well. Some question marks, some smiley faces here and there. But uh, yeah, we talked a lot about Team Falcons. I honestly respect all the old chat, and I think it's good. Maybe not only when you're doing it uh, in a winning situation, but throughout the game, it makes it makes it more interesting. I think it makes the professional scene more interesting when you when you hate someone or when you like him. It's all the same. But these guys, they didn't only win the old chat game. They won the grand finals with it. They Got a nice chunk of uh, chunk of gold as well, chunk of money, three hundred thousand dollars going Ooh. to the winner of the tournament, of course. And to talk to us about what he might do with his winnings, who are we getting? We are getting an interview, of course. Winner's interview with Extreme Gaming, I believe, is in queue will be the one, and perhaps our boy KBBQ will lend us a helping hand to translate. Congratulations, in queue. Wait,喂,聽得見嗎?聽得見啊,就他說恭喜我嘛。他就是,對,他就說恭喜,有什麼感受,有什麼反應。就感覺很開心啊。He uh, he says he's very happy. Uh, of course he is. How does it feel winning a grand finals finally and specifically versus Team Falcons after all the old chatting that was going on? Uh, 这次夺冠就有什么特别的感受，特别是你们就是在公屏就一直在打赏啊、嘲讽啊，特别是呃面对Falcons的队伍，不仅是一直常在，而且在那个公屏里的这些互动，是不是有什么特别的感受？呃，
they had huge success versus you guys in the past and in this tournament as well. Can you tell me what was the key factor that contributed to your win in the Grand Finals? What changed today? Uh,那那这Falcons的队伍当然是之强队,他们之前和包括在这个精英联赛中就是打你们是有一些怎么说之前是挺成功的,那想问一下这次总决赛有什么关键点或者你们改变了什么才能这样打败他们? 因为我们现在今天比他们强啊,所以我们把他们打败了。We're uh, just better than them today, so we're just stronger than them today, so we beat them. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you just woke up on the right foot. Vaga, Trent, take it away. Yeah, uh, congrats on the win, first of all. Uh, I want to ask, uh, we always see you smiling so much when we see the player cameras in queue. Are you um, the one who's like bringing up the morale? Because we see you smiling even when you guys are struggling, when things are tough. And uh, if it's not you, who is it? And also, how important is that? How important is it to keep your morale up and like be able to laugh and be happy to play at your best? Uh 呃就百分比吗嗯我觉得就是就是在这个在队伍中肯定是很重要的因为大家我之前的比赛的经验告诉我如果在大家在打比赛的时候互动包括沟通的少的话那场比赛很有可能就输掉了所以我会尽量的想
final thoughts about the uh, about the grand finals? I think it was a super hype way that they turned it around. After their first loss, you know, they adapted and they really showed the most important thing in Dota is how well can you play together with your teammates to click your abilities in a good way. And that's really what they were shining the most at. We can talk about laning stage and talk about stuff all we want, but when it comes to team fights, damn, if Extreme Gaming doesn't know what they're doing, dude, they click good buttons. <laughs> Click the good buttons, have some solid strategies, and, and find a way to adapt, yeah, that, that everyone had failed to do. And, and most importantly, just improving um, just like consistently over a short period of time, which that's something that personally I really liked when I first started watching Dota. And what is how Dota existed for a very long time is that we tended to have these like blitz tournaments where it was like you went somewhere for the weekend, you played a group stage, you mm -hmm. played a bracket, and you either adapted or you lost. And that was it. And now for the past couple of years, we've been playing DPC style where it's like, really slow you have like one match a week and you have all this time to think about it and you know dota used to be an art of how fast can you adapt to multiple patches coming up rather quick and these like faster uh meta games appearing at a tournament so bringing that in here through an online format i thought was excellent you know you have to go through two group stages for some of the teams and then through a bracket as well and you're developing that skill again here that xg is showing and to me that's like the purest form of good dota Right? It's like trying to use all the tools that are available in this game, all of the heroes, all of the items, to try and find an answer to a team that's just been dominating everyone. So uh, for me, that's yeah. definitely the best part of this format and this, this tournament, 100%. To go more off on that even, like if you go further back, tournaments weren't only played, like not only were they played in two days, they were played almost without sleep. Like if you get in a bad bracket or in a couple of yeah. long games, like you literally, you, you're sleeping on a floor in some hotel, five of you guys are in the same room, you know, like sleeping for maybe three, four hours in the morning, you have to wake up, go to the nearest LAN cafe, play the tournament again. Of course, we're super far from those days, but it wasn't that easy for extreme gaming in any case, because they had a pretty long day themselves, right? Like because they had to go through that lower bracket and the lower bracket curse more or less is broken as they take uh, the grand finals. Now, Zinkyu, he did say that they won basically because they were better today. Do you guys have <laughs> any specific things that you might think he is hiding from us? I mean, stuff he's hiding, I, I'm sure they're hiding a lot, but you know, I, I do believe that what he said is, you know, very self confident and, and true ultimately. You know, it's good to have that confidence in your own team and to be able to say that, you know, today we were better, recognizing that earlier in the tournament they were a little bit weaker, but they came back, man. They found the solution. Uh, which is really impressive because they they were a long way away from this grand finals when they got knocked down in the lower bracket. Yeah, and you have this uh, constant vision of his face on the camera as in Q being so happy and keeping the mood up. <laughs> and that combination of good mood alongside no pressure. Like, the there's definitely pressure on Falcons. And they are increasing that pressure on themselves when they do all this trash talk in BM. And I'm sure they know that. But it's really hype for all of us. And th there's just, you know, they're playing pretty lax inside of Extreme. Obviously, they want to win, but... No one really expects them to. They, clearly, the Falcons are the favorite. And they, they kind of use that little bit of just relaxation mm -hmm. and taking it easy to, uh, to crush their way through. Yeah, we're having a little bit of a podcast here. I, I do believe that um, like Zinkyu and the questions that you guys asked him, if he's always smiling and why he's doing that, I think he's one of the main reasons why a team can defeat something that is mentally gruesome to play against like cold chats right like sometimes it, it gets to you it tilts you but He's if you can just take it as healing. a joke he exactly he heals you he brings you back into the spot must be uh must be extremely nice to have such a such a player in your team isn't it yeah i mean anyone knows if you ever played any game of dola you know there are some people who bring down your teammates and then there are those rare unicorns in the scene who can actually lift the spirits of everyone and uh i mean players like those it's very hard to find. Not every team has someone who can really pull up the spirits like that in tough times. And I think yeah, it's you a look unique at... trait. You can't really teach it. Mm, you look at Zinkyu, maybe someone like uh, GH, right? Like yeah, these kind yeah. of players. Jarax as well. Every single team that did well had someone like that. But this team that did well, well, that did great, that did the best in the Elite League, Extreme Gaming, they started off, of course, in Group B as an invitee finishing off second in round robin stage so not even topping that group probably saving themselves saving their strategies a little bit further uh for the playoffs in the playoffs as well 
in the upper bracket. Saving again. more. Saving strategies. <laughs> 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 well, in the upper bracket, at least they had to face t uh, Team Falcons. They didn't give anything away to them. Mm. Just um, gathered intel, in right? I see. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. I mean, yeah, in the lower nice brackets, they became the Reaper. You know, it's the knock knock on the door. It's, it's extreme gaming just showing up here, and every single team just got absolutely obliterated. I would say Liquid, they were close, but Extreme, they uh, they even grew during that series. Yeah, it's something that you two were actually talking about Extreme Gaming and their growth throughout the tournament. You were uh, pretty aware that. These could be our champions if they manage to win against the Zuri. That's what you guys stated as well. Like they have a much higher ceiling, or at least it looks that way. And it looked like they had the potential to win against Team Falcons, which they obviously have achieved in the end. Uh, we see our champions right here. Trent that's Vaga. Beautiful. Ah, that's that's a nice that's a nice uh, picture right there from from the team. That's yeah, we, we've done it. We, we made it all the way through Elite League. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess is this where we, we, we just hand them this the money? Is... Do you have the, the briefcase to pass over them, Lizard? Do they, do they give that to you? Or... I, I, have you the I, have, I have the bag. I have the bag. Yeah. Oh, okay. I oh, have the bag, the by now? the way. We... Oh, that, We're that's... releasing the patch a little bit later, as, as oh. soon as we oh, end the later. show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So we have okay. a little bit of time. But uh, we can bring this show to an, to an end, of course. It's been a thrilling two weeks of Dota here at the Elite League. Teams came as prepared, really, as they can be. Well, not all of them, but most of them. We've had some really good games, some really good series, a little bit of memes, of course, some circus here and there, some clowns <clears throat> that managed <laughs> oh, to, in the end, of course, yeah. take it all. And <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Trent. As I am frozen in a very Beautiful. perfect... Beautiful <laughs> my, my position to be frozen. Wow, it's like <laughs> your own clown portrait. Clown. <laughs> Fantastic. I think I'm. In my back, I'm. Ah, there he is. Here. And wow, the green screen. Sunbathing. Is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh... well, the, the, the camera has had enough of me, I think, for the last couple of weeks. But the grand prize of $960,000, of course, has been given out. $300,000 going away off Extreme Gaming and 150 to the second team, which will be Team Falcons. Trilling two weeks of Dota. Thank you very much to all of you, to first and foremost, Vaga and Trent, for joining me on the panel as my green screen is going absolutely mad. I want to th <laughs> thank all great. of you in the chat for wat watching, of course, and I want to extend my gratitude to ESB and the organizers of Elite League to even make, for even making this happen. I want to thank all the production. I want to th thank Ernesto for telling me when my camera is off or where I'm, when I am muted. Of course, Aries as well for co-casting with me in the group stages. And to everyone else that worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this happen. With that, finals are concluded. Thank you very much for joining and we'll see you some other time in some other ESB tournament.